So hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is a story about what if Anko awakens a monster inside of Naruto and fall in love with him. Part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And if you want to part 2. Comment down below. And let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So let's start the video. Chapter 1 Awake Some say my father was a hero. In the eyes of our people, he was nothing but. In the eyes of our enemy, he was a butcher. He cut down the strong, the weak, and everything in between in the name of peace. The line between life and death is more intimate than we humans realize. They both accrue every day, sometimes at the same time. Hundreds of people are brought into this world and hundreds more leave it, and it's impossible to completely manipulate such things that are the unknown. We humanity spend our whole lives trying to do just that, live. We cling to the idea that just existing is enough. Life and death, said to be polar opposites. I see them for what they are though. Mine. My father, Namek is Minato. Hero. Or monster. Sometimes, the world doesn't need another hero. Sometimes, what it needs, is a monster. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto, and I am a monster. The six-year-old Yuzumaki Naruto lay on his back in the cold dank alleyway that his attackers left him in not five minutes ago. He was beaten and broken, so much so that his body felt numb. Good. It was better if he couldn't feel the pain right now. He could somewhat hear the faint noises that the still-going celebration was making in the distance, mocking him with its cheery attitude, completely ignorant of his suffering. After a random man walked right into the young blonde, said man decided, after noticing who it was he bumped into, that he was going to relieve some pent-up stress on the village pariah. At some time during the beating others began to join in. Before it ended there seemed to be at least ten of them. One boy one child against ten adults, an entire village, an entire world. Yet, the small smile on his face never faded, even as the tears rolled down his cheeks to meet the damp ground. It had rained the day before, he had remembered. He wondered if, hadn't the member of the zoo not shown up, would they have stopped like they did? Would they have kept going until he no longer drew breath? He was curious, was all. He always could feel what others felt. He could feel the pain and rage they experienced when they caught sight of him. Just like how he knew they weren't angry at him, but at the thing inside of him. That never stopped them from projecting their anger on his young body though. Did they ever notice that he never resisted? He didn't understand what exactly he housed in his gut, but he was sure that it was the ire of the village. He'd heard the stories of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, the demon that attacked the village a few years ago. He put two and two together and figured the red-hot and oh-so-angry feeling in his gut was the supposed destruction incarnate. When he calmed his breathing and focused he could feel the massive aura that was the Kaiubi. He would search, search for something else, anything else within that storm of rage. He understood the feeling he found completely. Loneliness. Naruto had been all alone since he was born. No parents, no friends, nothing. It was a nightmare, except he couldn't wake up. He was stuck. It never kept him down though, because with his innate ability to feel those around him also came the ability to understand them completely. And when you can understand someone completely, you can't help but love them. And Naruto did, he loved his village, his people, with his entire being. He could connect to others on such a level that if someone paid even a sliver of attention to him, they would realize that the boy was capable of feats no other human was able to perform. He, in the simplest way to put it, was doing the impossible, the unthinkable, the amazing. To connect and understand another's feelings and intentions to such a degree that you could practically understand what the other was thinking was as scary as it was incredible. And that was only the beginning of what Naruto could do with his natural talents. Compared to his other skillset, the empathy was just a small drop in a very large ocean. He had never used his other ability on another living being before, but he knew the outcome would be terrifyingly effective. Sighing to himself, the little Yuzumaki finally stood, already healed of the beating he had received. If his pain caused others joy, even if only slightly, then he would take it. He was the only person who understood the pain of each individual as much as they themselves did, so it just stood to be true that he would be the only one who could handle their anger. He could and would take it all, the pain, like it was his life's mission. He would do that for his precious village. Dusting off the dirt that now occupied his clothes, Naruto began to walk, where to even he did not know. He felt. Drawn to something the moment he first stood. Like something, no, someone was calling out for help, calling out for him. They were scared, terrified, and helpless against whatever it was causing their intense fear. It was so strong that it hurt his heart, his soul and whole self. He needed to get to them quickly. He decided to try out an idea he had a few days ago. With the use of his other ability, he thought that it would be possible to run faster than he usually was capable of. Much faster. Pulling in that beautifully bright and unbelievably powerful essence that was all around him, always roaming the world or was it the world itself. He flooded his body with it to the spilling point. 
He was now brimming with the unnamed and unknown energy, and he began directing it to his legs. Just like he had thought, his speed doubled. Not enough. He wasn't fast enough, not yet. He forced even more of the energy into his legs, his speed tripling. More. He repeated the process again. His speed quadrupled. Not yet. His speed quintupled. He was so fast everything seemed to be in slow motion. He was no longer visible to the human eye, or any eye for that matter. He suddenly came to a complete halt, like he wasn't traveling fast enough to clear the whole village in seconds. He was directly in the path of someone he had never met or felt in his village before now. He was in a different uniform than the shinobi of his village, and his forehead protector was not of the leaf as well. But the foreign energy flowing through his body, Naruto could see perfectly in the dark. The man had white bandages wrapped around the top part of his head, his hit eye ate slanted on his face, completely covering his right eye from the world, with a black piece of string holding it all together. He had brown hair, if his brown facial hair was anything to go by. And he was tall, a lot taller than the blonde. Naruto immediately recognized a small form that was held in the man's left arm as the person he felt. He could still feel their fear even now. He wanted to change that immediately. The man looked down on the small boy in front of him and snarled, out of my where aunt. The head ninja of Kumo barked. Naruto was silent for a moment, too angry to even move his body. He had felt the unknown man when he arrived and he now knew his intentions. He was taking what was not his to take. He was condemning an innocent and what he now knew gentlest girl he'd ever felt to a life of servitude and abuse. He knew the man thought of her as nothing more than a pawn, a means of reproducing powerful and, if her eyes were anything to go by, special shinobi. Naruto truly despised this man, he was the scum of this earth. Something inside Naruto clicked. He knew what he had to do. He could now feel and understand himself. He knew what he was now. The dark-skinned shinobi vaulted over the child in front of him, knowing that time was against him. He had no time to deal with someone who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He kept running, making decent distance, until he was stopped once more. Again, the blonde-haired boy suddenly flashed in front of him, almost too fast for him to react to. In the back of his mind, he was worried just how strange it was for someone so young to be so fast. He snarled and went to grab a kunai from his pouch to dispense with the nuisance. That's when he felt it. Naruto's hand raised into the air, ignoring the man's attempt to bring out a weapon, and began to do the impossible. The world which was the only way he could describe it began to twist and turn, producing the same energy that was currently occupying his body. However, now it was different, more refined, sharper, and tangible. From the very air itself, bright gold in the same color as his eyes particles began to appear, floating in the sky above him. But the flick of his wrist, the particles stirred, slowly rotating, grinding itself in a circular motion, enthusiastically obeying its master's whims. The grizzled man's eyes widened, he didn't exactly know what was happening, but he was able to understand that it wasn't all that good for his health. It was supposed to be dark out, being well past sundown, but with the golden matter that was flying around, the sky was ablaze in a molten gold fury. It briefly passed through the head ninja's mind that, for a moment, it had looked like the heavens themselves opened up to bring forth their wrath on him. It was the most terrifyingly beautiful thing the seasoned jonin had ever seen. Naruto's hand shot open, spreading his fingers in the air. That's when the particles took form, mimicking his right arm, the spread fingers and all, just in a much larger proportion. It looked like it was the right hand of God more than a small child's anger. Naruto gave one more soul-piercing glare at the man, their eyes meeting for mere seconds. In those chaste moments, the head ninja had thought the boy could actually see his soul for what it was, tainted. He had never felt sheer terror like this before. So why was it so serene? For a moment, the Kumonin wondered why he wasn't moving, why he wasn't cutting the strange child's throat and vanishing into the night. And then he knew, with a strange detached realization that he couldn't. Whatever the thing in the sky was, it demanded all his attention. Not even the fear of being caught by the Kanoha shinobi could spur him. The Yuzumaki could feel the familiar presence of who he guessed was the girl's father. Familiar as in he had felt the man before, he had by now memorized all of Kanoha's citizens. He nodded at the man, and the older Hayuga wasted no time to leap forward and scoop his daughter in his arms. Once he leapt back out of the way, Naruto had no reason to wait anymore. In the back of his head he knew he was being watched, he could recognize Hokage Jiji's presence anywhere, and he was always with members of the zoo, so they too he was very familiar with. Especially the lazy feeling one, he was the blonde's favorite. That didn't matter now though. All that mattered at this very moment was to rid the world of this disgusting man. Like an enraged god bringing down his divine judgment, Naruto clenched his hand in a fist while slamming it down into the ground at his feet, cracking a large portion of it. He unleashed all his anger with a monstrous shout, something that sounded more animal than human. Aya. In a blink of an eye, the gold hand-like structure fell to the earth right above the would-be kidnapper from Kumo, with earth-shattering might. 
all the shinobi present actually had a hard time withstanding the blast, using a large amount of chakra just to stay in place and upright. The power behind the attack had to be equivalent to 20 or 30 explosive tags going off at once. It was a terrifying sight. When the incredible golden light finally faded away, all that was left was a deep scar in the earth. A very deep scar. Naruto stood from his prone form, letting his fist unclench as he did so. No one said a word, no one moved a muscle, and everyone tried to hold their breath. Silence reigned supreme in the now very large street as everyone just stared at the boy in disbelief. Not only did the demon child completely and utterly overpower and decimate the head ninja of Kumagakur no Sato, but he did it with ease, without the help of his charge, and for the sake of another Konoha citizen. It was incredible, it was amazing, and it was unbelievable. Everyone tensed as the village pariah moved forward towards the Hyuga clan head and heiress. When he was standing right next to the man, Naruto gave him a gentle and warm smile, already able to feel the man's gratitude and unafraid feelings. That made Naruto happy, someone appreciated him. Is she okay mister? Naruto asked softly, his gentle smile never leaving his face. Hyuga Hiashi gave a smile himself, something not many were privileged to see ever and nodded. It would seem so. I have you to thank for that, Naruto-san, the Hyuga man replied, still holding his firstborn. I am forever in your debt. Naruto shook his head. I'm just glad she's okay. The Ashi nodded. As am I. Saratobi Hirazan landed next to Naruto and gave the boy a questioning look. We need to talk, Naruto-kun, were the only words that left the aged Hokage's mouth before he shunshined, body flickered, away, taking the blonde with him. As Naruto sat in the chair across the Hokage in the man's office, he felt no fear. He already knew what the man was going to ask. And he was going to answer with a smile, because he knew he had done the right thing. He had saved an innocent and was proud of it. That made him a hero. He had taken another's life and enjoyed it. That made him a monster. Whatever others saw him as didn't matter now though. He had found a way to feel. He felt alive. He felt free. He was finally awake. Chapter 2 Welcome to the Zoo A deity is supposedly something divine and as such should be judged by their ability to create and heal. Yet, we mortals judge the potency of a god's strength by their power to destroy and end. But silly, really, if you think about it. The more a god is monster-like, the more people pay attention to it. Such absurdity is favorable to a person like me though. I don't yet have the power to heal or create, but something I do have is the power to destroy. The power to end anything as I see fit. The only difference between me and a deity is simple. I know what I am. I am a monster. So the zoo was nothing like what Naruto thought it would be. Most of the people were of the silent type, which was something he was okay with, having people ignore him for most of his life, which, in hindsight, was only six years, so he didn't really have all that much experience. After the little chat he and the Hokage had after he terminated the Kumo Shinobi, the old Saratobi had decided that it would be best if Naruto put his abilities to good use. That came in the form of joining the zoo, or what he now knew to be the Anbu Black Ops. They were the Ansatsu Senjutsu Takushu Butai. The Special Assassination and Tactical Squad. That night was the best thing that ever happened to the blonde. Until the last word spoken by his now senpai. Flashback, Naruto could feel what the Hokage was feeling, anxiety. He had seen a boy of only six years annihilate with extreme prejudice the head ninja of Kumo. The man was the ambassador of peace for the cloud and he was a strong jonin in his own right. The fact that Naruto had done away with him with what looked like ease made him very uneasy. Digi, I can feel what you're thinking, just ask. I'll tell you the truth, honest. Naruto finally broke the awkward silence in the Hokage's office. The poor man was pacing the very moment they appeared in the small room. I how can you feel what I'm thinking? Hiruzen asked, baffled that the boy was claiming to have the ability to read minds. Were his thoughts not safe now? When the Yuzumaki laughed, the Lord Third felt like he was the child. I can't exactly hear your thoughts, Jiji, that's impossible. Naruto admitted. It's kind of hard to explain. Hmm. The blonde trailed off, rubbing his chin with his right hand. It's like I'm connected to. Well, everything. That's the only way I can describe it. That is grandfather figure's confused expression, Naruto explained a little better. When people are upset, I can tell. Naruto elaborated. And not just tell, but tell why. He continued, trying his best to describe what he could do. And how long have you been able to do such a thing? And why did you say everything instead of just people? The Saratobi asked, wanting more. For how long, it's been since I could remember, he said, still rubbing his chin. For why I said what I did, that's because it's not just with people. Animals and plants, really anything as long as it's living. I guess I could say I'm connected with life. Here, Saratobi noticed Naruto's eyes widen. What, what is it Naruto-kun? His voice was riddled with fear. Naruto gave him a sheepish look. Ah, it's nothing Jiji, I've just never thought about it that way is all. Maybe that's the best way to describe it. His closed hand met his open palm. 
yeah, I'm connected with life, the Lord Third sighed. The boy was going to give him a heart attack. So how can you tell what others are feeling? Um, I'm not really sure, Naruto admitted, but I can do it. He finished with a wide smile. The Hokage nodded, trying to process what he was hearing. And the golden matter you used on the Kumonin. That was what Hiruzen wanted to know the most about. If he had to guess, that was an A-rank technique. Most grown adults didn't have the ability to even use such higher rank techniques, never mind create new ones. The last time an A-rank technique was developed it made its creator a legend. The copy nin was a man known far and wide. Yet, here he was, only six and already so far ahead of all those before him. It was unnerving to think that such raw talent and power was in the hands of such a young child. Oh, that, Naruto's smile grew, if that was even possible. I made it up. Hiruzen couldn't help but smile at Naruto's enthusiasm. What exactly was it? He needed to be the Hokage right now, not the boy's surrogate grandfather. Naruto chuckled awkwardly. I, ah, don't really know that either. Sarutobi sighed. Did the boy know anything about his own abilities? The way he could use them said he did, but that, surprisingly, was not the truth. Can you tell me anything about it? Anything at all? He asked, wanting needing. To know what the boy knew. Naruto nodded. Yeah, I can describe how I do it. When Hiruzen nodded the boy continued. There's this kind of feeling in the air, like a constant energy that's always around me. I don't know why others can't feel it and I can, but I do know that it's there. He can't mean natural energy. The Hokage thought to himself. There's no way someone could be born able to feel it. Right. When his Jiji didn't reply he continued. When I need it I can pull the energy into myself. When I do, a lot of stuff happens. He held up one finger. My body becomes tougher. Two fingers, I get a whole lot stronger. Like yesterday, I lifted an entire tree out of the ground. Three fingers, I get faster. I think I can outrun anyone in this whole village. Tsuritobi highly doubted that there were a lot of fast ninja in Konoha, but he didn't voice his thoughts. Four fingers. I can feel others more and farther away, too. Hiruzen's eyebrows climbed up into his hairline. This kept sounding more and more like natural energy by the minute. Five fingers. And I can control and shape the energy around me, that's the gold dust stuff you saw forming the arm. Now that did not sound like something any sage the Hokage ever heard of being able to do. Naruto-kun, I believe you were born with the amazing ability to use natural energy, something only a sage is capable of doing. Hiruzen informed with a smile on his face. There is only one other person in this world that can use the sage arts, and that's my pupil, Jiraiya. Naruto shot up out of his seat. You mean I can use the same power as one of your students? He half-asked half-yelled, excitement evident in his voice. Hiruzen nodded. It would seem so. But whereas he had to be taught the sage arts, you were born able to use them. Another smile ghosted the elderly man's lips. It's truly remarkable. Naruto nodded, a thousand-watt smile plastered to his face. So what now, Jiji? He asked, eager to learn more. Hiruzen thought on it for a moment. What was he going to do with the boy? He definitely needed to contact Jiraiya and have him come home. He needed to know of this mind-blowing discovery. He also wanted to train the boy, he knew he would become someone more powerful than even his father, having a hand in teaching such a person would be a gift in and of itself. Throwing him into the academy would be a shame, his talents would be wasted in that environment. What could he do? An idea began to form. With a snap of his fingers, a man dressed in black clothing, gray armor, and a white face mask a member of the zoo appeared from within the shadows. It wasn't a surprise to Naruto, having felt the man's presence the moment he arrived shortly after them. He knew the man as the lazy one his favorite zoo member. The shock of gravity-defying silver hair just confirmed this. Inu, do you think you have room in yourself for one more? It was worded as a question, but it wasn't intended as one. When the god of shinobi spoke, you listened, no matter what you were asked of. Discreetly of course, no one besides you will know his true identity, and only your team will know that he's even an Anbu. He added, never taking his eyes off of the Uzumaki. Naruto could feel the man's reluctance and was intrigued that it didn't come in his dislike of either his age nor his burden, but something else, something personal. Why did the lazy one care for him? After the split-second hesitation, the dog-styled mask nin saluted his Hokage, giving the aged warrior an affirmative, yes, sir, before turning his gaze to the blonde. It won't be easy. Inu began in a hard and firm voice. He then gave off the feeling of warmth and protectiveness, Kohai. Naruto gave a warm smile and nodded as fast as he could. I'll do my best, Inu Senpai. And with that said, Naruto could already feel the great things he was going to do with Inu. It will be tough Naruto-kun, but I believe you can do it. I think you will be able to protect Konoha better than anyone else. The Hokage said warmly, his smile showing his pride for his successor's child. This was it. Welcome to the Anbu Black Ops. He would finally be able to do what he wanted the most, protect Konoha. Nizumi Kohai. Wait. What? 
and flashback, apparently, Anbu operatives were given their codename by their captain, and Inu just happened to be Nar Nizumi's captain. Well, he was going to be Nizumi's captain once he received all of the required training. Couldn't have someone out in the field that didn't know what they were doing. When he asked why he was dubbed Nizumi, Kakashi replied with, because you're tiny. A tick mark appeared on the blonde's forehead, like a mouse. He added, and was met with silence, small. Nizumi sighed. That was okay with Nar Nizumi, he was only six, he had time. All he had to do now was survive Inu's health school, whatever that meant. It shouldn't be too hard. He was happy, and nothing could change that. Nizumi was miserable. If there was such a place as hell, Nizumi thought that it sounded like a nice place to vacation to. Hell school was painful and exhausting, physically, emotionally and spiritually. What the hell was wrong with his captain? Was he a sadist? That would actually explain a lot. Nizumi was currently sprawled out on his rock-hard bed, having moved into the Anbu headquarters the day after he talked to the Hokage and Inu senpai about joining the zoo, which just happened to coincide with his seventh birthday. It was required of all agents to live within the Black Ops building. At first, Nizumi wasn't all that thrilled about the idea, but now, after six months of the place, he didn't even notice anymore. He chalked it up as just another thing he had to do for his village. The day had been a particularly painful day. His ability to manipulate natural energy was incredibly advanced, and the only person that could help him further his prowess with that was still not available. The Toad Sage was the kind of person who was very hard to find if he didn't want to be found. Apparently he didn't want to be found at the moment. Month 1 and 2, his training consisted of the usual required Anbu material, which included a whole lot of studying. Anbu had to have a certain level of knowledge in both foreign and domestic affairs. Nizumi found that he wasn't the biggest fan of books. But he did as he was told nonetheless, accomplishing everything Inu through his way. The second month he had been personally trained by the Hokage in the ways of running a village. There was a lot of politics and other boring stuff involved, but Nizumi soaked it all up, he planned on becoming the greatest Hokage the likes of which Konoha has never seen. He really wanted to feel free and awake again. The only way he could do that was if he was protecting his village, his people. Month 3. Another huge section of his training consisted of learning other shinobi skills. Inu had told him that he needed to be more versatile. A one-trick pony whatever the hell that meant was something he didn't want to be. Inu, who was now more of his sensei than anything, first taught him how to climb trees. Without his hands. That was something he actually enjoyed doing. And it only took 10 minutes. Inu senpai after a long and detailed lesson on chakra and chakra control explained to him that it seemed that he had abnormally amazing chakra control. Such a level of precision was something apparently only Tsunade who happened to be another San and he shared something with could accomplish. Senju Tsunade was a the medical nin, and he was up to par with her when it came to control. He put that in the back of his head for later, versatility, versatility, versatility. After the tree walking exercise, Inu Senpai taught him to do the same thing, but on water. That too, was incredibly fun. It also only took 10 minutes. Deciding that he needed to throw more difficult things at the boy, he began teaching him the shunshin, body flicker, which took a little longer for the boy to learn. This time it took 15 minutes. This was starting to intrigue Inu. The boy had said that he could understand everything so long as it was alive. That made Inu start to question, were Jutsu alive? Because if so, Nizumi was capable of understanding any and all techniques, as long as they were performed within his sensory area. That was impossible though, the only technique he heard of that could understand Jutsu like that was implanted in his left eye, the Sharingan. If it was true. Just what were the boy's limits? Did he have any? The thought began to make more and more sense. Nizumi was incredibly mature, far, far from anything a now seven-year-old should be. He was able to speak like an adult, see things from an adult's point of view, and understand the adult world. So, how did he do it? Inu had never been one to believe that age brought wisdom. He had known a lot of unwise elderly people. He personally thought that experience brought wisdom, which was not the same thing. You could live your entire life ignorant if you were sheltered or reclusive. Obviously though, a seven-year-old, no matter how hard their life may be, did not have the required experience to be so wise in the ways of the world. Something else allowed him to be so mature. That something had to be his empathy ability. If he could truly understand others, then he had to have started understanding their feelings. Learning about love, hate, jealousy, greed, lust, joy, sorrow and everything in between must have been the strangest thing for someone so young. That was the only explanation Inu could come up with on how a mere child could comprehend the emotions that he was able to feel. It was impossible, but that just made it even more special. The rest of the month he had used to come up with a name for the tangible natural energy he used. Month 4, Izumi was then taught shuriken jutsu. That took up a lot of his time. It was hard for him to throw the kunai at first because his hands were so small. 
after Inu taught him a trick that he used to do when he was young, apparently he was a young prodigy as well, that involved his chakra he caught on fast enough. Month 5 The next thing Nizumi had to learn was stealth. He was a little nervous about it at first, but after a couple of weeks he got the hang of it. Then it was kenjutsu training. After the first day Inu thought he had finally found something the kid wasn't good at. He realized how wrong he was a week later. The cut on his back still stung from that. Month 6. As of late, Nizumi learned a lot of ninjutsu, finding it to be his favorite. With his perfect chakra control learning jinjutsu was too easy, and his tojutsu was still developing. With the natural energy flowing in his body, he didn't even need to actually land his strikes on his target. Ninjutsu, however, interested Nizumi the most. With his sage dust techniques which he now called the gold natural energy he could manipulate, he was already ahead of most jonin when it came to power. But he couldn't solely rely on it, one trick pony and everything. So the Hokage and Inu began to teach him elemental ninjutsu. The blonde's affinities were wind and fire, which also was special. He didn't have a Keke Genkai, bloodline limit, not really, so the fact that he already had two affinities, affinities that complemented each other, was amazing. That's why the Yuzumaki was so exhausted at the moment. Inu Senpai knew a lot of ninjutsu, as did the Lord Third, and they was making sure to drill as many into Nizumi as possible. His body was sore and limp, and he loved every moment of it. It reminded him that he was gaining the strength to do what was needed to be done. Things were going to change when he got out of these walls. Inoha's enemies would think twice before striking. Their people would know peace. Nizumi would be a hero. Even better, Nizumi would be a monster. It had been a whole year since he joined the zoo, and Nizumi had finally been cleared field ready. He was nearing eight now, and he was a certified member of the Anbu. He was nervous now though. Today was the day he met the rest of Captain Inustam. He understood Inu's words when he said it would take the team a while to warm up to him. He was the youngest Anbu agent the elemental nations had ever seen. The others just needed to be positive that they could rely on him to watch their backs. They could. Inu had been extremely happy that he and the blonde were the same, patriots to the core, but still cared about the lives of their fellow citizen above all else. When Kakashi told him that those who abandoned the mission were considered trash, but those who abandoned their friends were worse than trash, Nizumi loved the saying so much that he asked if he could live by it as well. Akashi, of course, said yes, he didn't even have to ask. The rate at which the blonde was able to learn and process, well, anything, was amazing. Inu didn't know of anything the boy couldn't do. He thought Nizumi was strong at first, but after Jiraiya had finally shown up. Inu prayed he never defected. Having to fight that would be bad for anyone's health. They'd die, plain and simple. He wasn't invincible though, and Inu was happy that the blonde realized that. Anyone could fall when arrogant or outnumbered. Nizumi took a deep breath. Here we go. He whispered, pushing through the double doors of Team Row's designated lounging area. He was immediately met with stairs. There was a small boy in a standard Anbu uniform, and they didn't like where this was going. The Yuzumaki agent took in his surroundings for a moment. The room was of medium size and spartan. All there was were grey walls and three very large black couches. The couches were set up so that they were connected, and a long glass table was centered in the middle of them. Ah, Nizumi Kohai, you made it. Inu called out over the palpable silence. Come here, I'll introduce you to everyone. Izumi gulped, but obeyed nonetheless. Yes sir. When the blonde made it to his captain, Inu put a hand on his shoulder. Everyone, I'd like you all to meet Nizumi. He's going to be assigned to Team Row for a while. No one said anything, but they didn't have to. Nizumi could feel what they thought of him. Great, we're stuck with some brat. What is the Hokage thinking? Hey. Isn't that? No, it couldn't be. That last one almost made Nizumi flinch, but he stayed compassed. I hope we can work well together. The blonde bowed. Inu cleared his throat. Right, well, let's report to Hokage-sama. I think it's about time for the newbie to take on his first mission. Nizumi gulped. Two months. It had been two months since he joined Team Row, and they still treated him like trash. He was officially the team sensor and not a frontliner, which is what he wanted to be, and the missions they carried out had little use for his abilities. He did spot an enemy ambush two weeks ago, but apparently that wasn't something that warranted much respect. He had been training for so long and he still couldn't wake up. It was somewhat annoying. Izumi was currently sprinting through the forests that occupied the border of Hai no Kuni and Tsuchi no Kuni with Tora and Yasagi, two of the people who disliked him the most. Inu Taicho said that if he worked with them more that they would have to warm up to him sooner or later. Nizumi highly doubted that but followed orders all the same. The three of them were doing a simple border patrol, making sure everyone stayed in their own countries. Simple enough, right? Nothing was ever simple. Izumi signaled to the two, stopping their fast-paced travel. What is it, kid? Tora asked, annoyed that the blonde was holding them up. Two people are headed right for us. He signed an Anbu code. They aren't friendly either. 
He took another second to analyze the incoming shinobi, trying to understand what it was he was feeling. His eyes widened. Shit. He whispered, causing his comrades to take defensive stances. What they heard in his voice made them wary. What was going on? They must have felt me as well. The blonde thought to himself. If Tor and Yasagi die because of me. Get out of here you two, Nizumi whispered. His tone was serious. The only female of the group, Yasagi, spoke up. Look kid, no matter how special you think you are, you can't just order your senpais around. She was giving off an annoyed emotion, Nizumi could tell. You're still just a brat. The blonde sighed. Were these people ever going to show him respect? So far Inu was the only person to welcome him into the fold. Isagi senpai, there are two Jinchuriki on their way from the direction of Tsuchi no Kuni. He informed them. They have probably felt my Bijuu's presence and decided to investigate. He could feel their fear. Don't worry, they're here for me, not you. He tried to calm them. Go. If I don't return, then Kanoha will know where they stand with Iwa. He felt their disbelieving minds. You're going to sacrifice yourself for us? Tora asked, astounded. It was no secret that both he and Yasagi hated Nizumi, so why the hell was he doing this? Why? The two Anbu's hearts almost broke when he took his mask off and smiled at them, of all things. Because we're comrades. You'd do the same for me if it was the other way around. Nizumi sometimes wished he couldn't feel people's hearts. No, we wouldn't. Nizumi steeled himself, Anbu didn't cry. Now go, he repeated, this is my fight. And with that, he turned around and took off in the direction of the fast approaching Iwanin. It was a warm and sunny day, the complete opposite of what it should have been. He was sacrificing himself for people who didn't even see him as a person. He just couldn't bring himself to care though. This was it. Time to wake up. It had taken hours to regroup with Inu Taicho and the rest of the squad, but when Yusagi and Tora explained what had transpired earlier in their border patrol, they regretted it. You're worse than trash now. Inu's cold voice hit Tora and Yusagi like an enraged Sanadi. How could you just leave him to die like that? The worst part about it was that he wasn't even yelling at them. He was speaking in a soft and very scary voice. But he. Yusagi tried to defend herself, but couldn't think of anything to say. They had abandoned someone who truly cared for them. They knew of his abilities to feel almost what others thought. He must have known what their response was to his attempt to establish a bond. The two Anbu's hearts almost broke when he took his mask off and smiled at them of all things. Because we're comrades, you'd do the same for me if it was the other way around. Izumi sometimes wished he couldn't feel people's hearts. No, we wouldn't. They didn't get the chance to speak again, Inu was gone, out to look for his wayward Kohai. Minutes after Yusagi and Tor left, Izumi, no, he was Naruto now he was awake was face to face with two S-class in Churiki. They had taken countless lives, Kanohan in included, and had years to tame the beasts within. Naruto was eight, and the only time he had interacted with his charge they didn't even speak. Unfortunately for them, that was enough. Flashback, when the old pervert finally made it to Konoha, Naruto was put to work right away, and not just in Senjutsu. Hiraya sensei had been adamant that Naruto try and establish a link between him and the Kaiubi. Naruto didn't mind so much as he just didn't know how. Just relax, the toad sage told him, calm yourself and visualize what you want. Naruto sighed, what exactly was it that he wanted? Jiraiya had said that he was Konoha's Jinchuriki, and even though he didn't like it personally, his fellow senin told him that he needed to learn how to harness the Biju's power. Of course Naruto wanted to protect Konoha, but he felt guilty just taking what was not his. Didn't he kill a Kumonin for that? So what did he want? Deciding to just wing it and come up with an answer later, Naruto dived into his own mind. It was a wet, dark, and broken place. So nothing unusual. A long corridor, what looked like an underground sewer of sorts, stretched out from both behind and in front of him. Water dripped from the ceiling, and the walls were cracked. But he mentioned that he was knee-high in something he hoped was water, because he was. He chose to walk forward might as well, and he began to regret his choice. It felt like hours had passed since he arrived and everything seemed to be the same, never-changing, dingy hallways. That's when he came upon the large room that doubled as a cell on the far side, a very, very large cell. The metal bars, adorning a large tag the red seal reached into the darkness that was above them, lost in the expanse that was his mind. For a long drawn-out moment, everything was still. He began to think nothing was beyond those figurative bars, until a single, red-slitted eye peered through the darkness, capturing the small boy in its gaze. Before, when Naruto tried to feel the mass in his gut, he only ever felt hatred or malice, and at times, loneliness. Now, standing so close to the famed monster, he seemed almost calm. Naruto smiled. Was his soothing natural energy relaxing the all-powerful Bijuu? Whatever the case may be, Naruto was certain that the Kaiubi could feel him as well, like he too had the ability to read emotions. Naruto never felt so close to another in all his life. They were the same, in more ways than one. They were both scored by the world. 
They were both the definition of strong. They were both forced upon each other. They were both too different than what people were comfortable with. And by far the most important and startling similarity was that they were both. Not monsters. Standing proud and tall, not against a misunderstood Bijuu, but beside him, was thrilling. There was no need for words. Everything was being said through their eyes. I'm sorry for what's happened to you. I know. I'm going to save you. I know. I'll need your help. The visage that was the Kaiubi morphed into the terrifyingly wicked grin that stalked the nightmares of so many. I know. And flashback, Naruto wasn't sure why Team Ro felt so awestruck when he returned to the village the next morning. He's in tattered and scorched rags, a sure sign of battle. Even Yasagi and Tora felt like they were relieved and happy. His face mask is nowhere to be seen, and he's covered head to toe in soot. That was strange, but Naruto was never one to look a gift horse in the mouth. What happened to you out there? Still he was disappointed in himself. One got away. Bakashi stored his observations away for after what was to come. Before he could think more on that line of thought, Tora and Yusagi approached Nar no, he wasn't awake anymore he was Nizumi now. The two approached Nizumi with a small bit of trepidation in their step. No, he didn't want them to fear him. That's when he realized it. We apologize for being worse than trash, Nizumi Kohai. They both shouted simultaneously, their heads lowered in a deep bow. They weren't afraid of him, they were upset with themselves for abandoning a teammate. They accepted him. Nizumi's heart jumped. Was it finally that time? Was he now noticed as important? If you have it in you to forgive us, we promise to treat you with the respect you deserve. Yusagi begged. I would be proud to work alongside such an amazing comrade. Tora added. That was it, the word he was waiting, craving to hear. It was that time after all. He was finally a part of Konoha, small as it may be. He was being recognized as a comrade and not someone not even worth the oxygen he consumed. Izumi chuckled. You guys look silly bowing your heads to an eight-year-old. Yusagi and Tor raised their heads. Of course I'd like to work with you, here he spread his arm out, motioning to the rest of the members, all of you, if that's okay. The smile on his soot-covered face was all the gathered members of Team Ro needed to break into cheers of approval. The kid was alright in their book. Naruto could feel it, all of the accepting hearts and minds of his team. It was almost too much to handle. Almost. Nizumi, you need to be debriefed. Inu Taicho spoke above the yelling. The Hokage needs to know what happened during the time you were MIA. The cheers died down, but the emotions still filled the air, and that was enough. Nodding to his captain, Nizumi headed for the exit, intent on following the silver-haired man. Before he could make it out of the door though, Yusagi called out his name, causing him to stop and turn to the woman. Yes, Yusagi-senpai. He asked, a gentle smile stuck to his face. Damn, he really needed to work on his poker face. I forgot to say this before, but... She paused, looking back at Tora who nodded at her. Thank you, and welcome to the Anbu. She crooked her mask to the side slightly, so that only he could see what lay underneath dark onyx eyes that complemented her long dark hair, a small nose, luscious lips, and an altogether pretty face, and planted a small kiss on his cheek. The room lit up a nose, and Nizumi's face went a deep scarlet. He was also pretty sure he had an incredibly stupid grin plastered to his face too, but he didn't care. That was awesome. He did it. He was now officially a member of the zoo. Having heard the happenings that his newest operative explained, in great detail, about the death match he had with two people he was unfortunately familiar with, had the Lord Third Hokage nervous. Seeing the subsequent head of Yoten no Rashi laid out on his desk, unsealed from the scroll, said operative put it in after he managed to defeat and kill the powerful man scared him further. What couldn't this boy accomplish? Gigi. About the Yanbi. The soot-covered blonde even looked nervous here, we. We need to talk. His eyes dragged over to where he could feel the ever-present Anbu watching their leader closely. In private, his voice was riddled with concern. Great, what now? Chapter 3 The Might of Kanoha. The Warzen is a place someone like me can thrive in. Opposing sides fight to the death to claim the victory. Everyone on the opposite side is fair game, all of them must die. Monsters like me are the star players in the game that is war. It's a place we can feel alive, free, awake. I never thought I would have the privilege to not only witness one of these ridiculous bouts, but help bring about the fall of the very person who started one. I'm elated that I was wrong. Greetings war torn Mizu no Kuni, a monster has arrived to set you free. Me. The shores that made up the coast of Mizu no Kuni were heavy with fog. The sun was nowhere in sight and the air was thick with moisture. It felt like it could rain any minute now. The small fishing village the four-man cell arrived at was said to belong to the resistance. The war between them and the Lord Fourth Mizukage was heavily reliant on territorial dominance. Mizu no Kuni was made up of several islands, all centering the country's hidden village, Kuridakur no Sado, which was currently in the hands of the tyrant known as Ugura. The man was leading a crusade to purge the bloodline users from Mizu. 
it was said that he thought them to be too dangerous to let live, so decided to kill his own people out of fear. Hundreds of thousands had already been slaughtered, and many more still lived in fear of his genocide. The other nations all decided to stay out of Mizu's business, letting them handle their own domestic affairs. A bloody and crippling civil war finally reached the land of fire's citizens, in a way. A small scientific expedition into the waters that bordered Hai no Kuni and Mizu no Kuni turned into a massacre. The group of six civilian scientists not a shinobi in sight was captured by the Mizukage's forces and executed on the false charges of espionage. The Noha received their heads a week later, courtesy of the Mizukage himself. Igura was a fool because now Kanoha had him in her sights. She cried for his blood and his blood she shall be given. The Mizukage was playing a dangerous game by poking the sleeping dragon that was the god of shinobi's wrath. That's why the Lord Third ordered a small contingent of Rohan to join the resistance and strike at Yagura directly. Taking a deep breath of the cold, salt air riddled afternoon air of the shoreline, Nazumi glanced at the captain of their newest assignment, Niko Senpai. The woman had long beautiful purple hair, and that was all that Nazumi knew about the cat mask operative. She was an Anbu through and through, she never took her mask off, at least since he joined the court two and a half years ago. Izumi knew better though, she was a warm person and thought the same as he and Inu Taicho, the team was just as important as the mission. That made it easier for him to suddenly be under her command. To his left was the official youngest Anbu agent in Kanoha, Karasu, his best friend. The crow masked operative joined the fold half a year after the little incident that caused Team Ro to finally accept him. It came to no surprise to Nazumi that Karasu entered the Black Ops, the things the blonde felt coming from the young Ichiha amazed even him. He was strong, obviously, but his mind and heart made Nazumi instantly want to befriend him the moment he walked into Rohan's changing room. Being the closest to him in age was a factor too. After a few missions together, the two became quick friends and were usually paired together. Team Ro had been a little more accepting when the 10-year-old joined, after working with an 8-year-old juggernaut, made sure they'd never judge someone by their age again. Crouching next to Karasu was the newest member of Rohan, Seru. It was strange, first Karasu, and now Seru called him Nazumi Senpai. He was too embarrassed to refer to them as Kohai though, he was only 10 now. They were both at the very least two years older than him. Seru had shown a lot of respect to Nazumi right away, and that confused him greatly. The monkey masked man had explained that he was somewhat of a celebrity among the younger operatives at HQ, even if it was just a rumor. The child with the strength of an entire army was what they described him as, and some even said that he was invincible. Nazumi was less than pleased about the rumors. His status as an operative was top secret, he was the Hokage's personal shadow, a silent defender. He didn't mind fame, but his Hokage had wanted him to be a whisper, not a poster boy for the village. They had Itachi for that. Of course, Seru was in his mid-twenties, but that was apparently young enough to look up to the legend that was slowly coming forth. His thoughts were interrupted. Nazumi, find the resistance, we need to meet up with them and explain Hokage-sama's orders. Niko spoke, giving her first order as a captain. Nazumi nodded, already doing what he was told. The village was small and not a lot of people resided in it. That made it incredibly easy to lock onto the strong chakra signatures that he was sure belonged to the resistance. Done. They're not far from here, just northeast of this position, 10 minutes I'd say. Nazumi replied, waiting for the next orders to be given. Lead the way. She said, confident in his abilities. Having worked with the young blonde for the better part of two years made her a firm believer that he was in a league far out of her reach. She was just glad that he was letting her run the show, someone else that knew that they were the greater would have given her trouble during the entire assignment. That's why she respected Nazumi, he was far from arrogant and loved to cooperate with his team, always listening to orders and offering help whenever it was needed. Yes, Captain. And with that, he took off in the direction of the higher than average chakra signatures, leading the cell for the short duration. He took in the sights of the village as he raced across it. There were a lot of shops, and the ground of the shopping district was made of cobblestone, different. The people here looked so sad, and the young Anbu operative could feel their suffering. Good. Now he had more of a reason to fulfill his Hokage's orders. Yugura had to die. Like he said, it only took 10 minutes before they reached a seemingly random hut at the edge of a dock. Nazumi knew better, he could feel the shinobi below them. No one could escape his sensing capabilities, he was the greatest sensor in the village after all, able to feel the emotions and intentions of anyone in his range, which was incredibly large. Nodding to Nico, the mouse mask boy fell back, allowing the woman to take the lead again. Stretching her arm out to rasp against a wooden door, she was cut off by a burly man with long black hair. State your business, Kanohanin. I've done nothing wrong, and you have no jurisdiction in this part of the world. His voice was gruff, matching his appearance perfectly. The scar that ran across the bridge of his nose reminded Nazumi of a chunin he knew to work at the academy. 
He didn't know the man's name, but he knew that if he went to the academy, he would want that man to be his instructor. He had a good heart. Nico chose her words carefully. We've come on the behalf of the Lord Hokage. We have jurisdiction anywhere we so please. She gave the man a respectful nod of her head. Kanoha wishes to help wash away the red from the waters. We're here to clean house. There it was. The code the resistance used to identify friendlies. That little piece of information was invaluable to them. Without it, the resistance wouldn't have let them anywhere near their plans. What they say about Ureya must be true, the man was a master spy. Wait here for a moment, was the man's reply, disappearing from the door to enter the small shack. Five minutes later, the man returned and ushered them into the hut, which would have looked strange to onlookers. The hut looked like it could only fit two of them in at the same time. The hut itself was just a ploy, what lay underneath it was the true hideout. The underground tunnel was very large, an experienced Doton user must have had a hand in creating it. The tunnel stretched out for a small distance, which led out in an even larger room. There were people scurrying about like worker bees. Nizumi chuckled, it was like a hive. So that must mean the absolutely beautiful woman with long, auburn hair sitting at the very large table in the center, giving him a predatory glare like he was her prey was the queen. This should be fun. He thought to himself before joining Nico and the rest of the team and making their way to the obvious leader. The smirk on her face kind of excited Nizumi. So, Kanoha finally decides to send assistance, and all we get are three Anbu. She shook her head in mock hurt. I'm disappointed. For, Nico spoke, you've been given four Anbu to your cause. Ah, but you're wrong, sweetheart. She retorted. The children only count as half an Anbu. Her smile was still as sweet as it had first been. So I've been given three, such a shame too, I really could have used the help. Saru decided to speak on behalf of Karasu and Nizumi. You're going to eat those words later on, beautiful. Nizumi sighed, Saru was always hitting on women. Even now, in a foreign country and in the presence of what the blonde could feel to be a powerful Kinoichi. The woman's predatory smirk intensified. Yup, Nizumi definitely liked this one. Oh. Now I just can't wait to see what the youth of Kanoha is capable of. She almost sounded genuine, but she couldn't escape Nizumi's abilities. No matter how good of a liar she was. Our Hokage has given us orders to shadow the resistance and assist in any and every way possible. Our goal is to get you girl alone with Nizumi here. She informed the woman, gesturing to the smallest member of the cell. The delicate eyebrow rose on the beautiful woman's face. And why would your Hokage wish to have a child confront a cage-level Jinchuriki? Nizumi was glad that he had his mask on, because if he didn't, everyone would have seen the absolutely terrifying smile on his face. The Lord Hokage wishes to end the life of the Yande Mizukage. The easiest way for that to happen is if we wake our sleeping comrade. The blonde really loved how his team understood him so. He would have started laughing if he hadn't trained so hard to be capable of keeping his emotions in check. The woman was now really confused. He guessed that she'd never met a monster before. Black Harbor, Turumi made began, as a loyalist-controlled prison. It houses a good portion of our people. Here, an angry expression flashed across the woman's face. The ones the bastard keeps alive. It had only been a few hours since the Team Row contingent met with the resistance, and they were already being put to work. Karasu was indifferent. Sarah was annoyed. Nico was ready to serve. And Nizumi was excited. If they could help win the war for the resistance, Kiri, with whoever became the Mizukage Nizumi thought it would most likely be Mei would be indebted to Kanoha. He was going to have a hand in creating a peaceful alliance for his home and Kiri. He would save so many lives. And take so many more. It was a win-win situation. You want my team to, what, pull off a prison break? Nico asked. She didn't see how this would help them any. Yes, that is exactly what I want of you and your little team. Nizumi could feel that Nico didn't like Mei too much. My top general went in to find information on the whereabouts of Yugura's top weapons manufacturing buildings. The green-eyed woman brushed a stray hair back into one of the four bangs that framed her face. I was planning on sending three of my teams in, but if what you say about the two kitties is true, then I haven't the need to, now do I? Izumi could understand why she wasn't Mei's biggest fan. She kind of came off as arrogant, but maybe that was just because she didn't know them all that well. Izumi wanted to chuckle again, he could play that game if that's what she wanted. No. The smallest out of the Kanoha Anbu said, looking at Nico. Let me go in alone, Captain. Ah, there it was. The emotion he was looking for from the auburn-haired woman, incredulous. This doesn't call for the four of us. He turned his masked face towards Mei. I should be more than enough. Any more would be overkill. Baltarumi was shocked into silence, Nico was mulling it over in her head. Nizumi usually never outright asked for a solo assignment, he was just given them because he was the only person strong enough to take them on. So why was he doing so now? That's when she realized what he was thinking. The resistance didn't trust them, and worse, they thought they were incapable. That little genius. 
he had worded it as a suggestion, giving her the authority to make the decision. He knew she was worried that he would try and take over, and to squash those thoughts, he showed she had seniority in front of the others. He also knew that the only way for the resistance to realize just how valuable the team was, they needed to be shown that they were more than capable of fighting the good fight. If the youngest of the group could take down an entire prison filled with enemy combatants, not only would the cell be shown respect, but he'd be showing them Kanoha's might. It did everything that both they and Kanoha needed all in one go. It still astounded her how the boy was able to think and strategize to win the game with only one move. He truly was the monster he claimed to be. It just took her a while to fully understand what that meant. Permission granted. Nico nodded her head, both in confirmation and thanks. She was sure he could feel her gratitude. Do as you see fit to complete the mission. Izumi got the message. I agree, and thank you. Yes, Captain. Wait a minute here. Mei finally spoke up. You're really going to just send the one kid. She couldn't believe the boy was as strong as they were implying him to be, she just couldn't. She knew that Kanoha was the greatest of the five and that they produced child prodigies in bulk, but this was just ridiculous. What the hell did they feed their children in that village? Yes. Nizumi is very special and more than capable of accomplishing the required task. Nika replied. Don't be so quick to underestimate the ninja of our village. It's fell mightier shinobi than you. Nizumi wished he could laugh, that was a good one. And it was the truth which made it even better. Mei was silent for a moment, her narrowed eyes on the blonde boy. Then she relented. Fine, but if he gets my people killed it's on your heads. Izumi cocked his head to the right. His suspicions were correct, she was beautiful at every angle. Saratobi Hirazin sat at his desk in his office, once again stuck doing paperwork. It really became overwhelming at times if he didn't take much needed breaks. Speaking of much needed breaks, Jureya Kun, it's good to see you again. He said to seemingly no one. That's when the aforementioned Sanin seemed to melt out of the wall, his camouflage technique deactivating. Damn, Sensei, you're almost as good as the Gaki. Student spoke to teacher, his ever-present smug smirk on his face. You can't fool me yet, Jureya, I taught you everything you know after all. The Sandane made a pouting face. Besides Sinjutsu. The Senin roared with laughter. That expression you made doesn't belong on the face of the Hokage, old man. Hirazin Mok glared at his pupil. Careful, Jureya Kun, you're getting pretty old yourself. The sage's laughter immediately stopped. Great, was he really a geezer now? Whatever. Jureya mumbled. Where's the gaki? I've got some time before I need to head back out. The white-headed man leaned against the Hokage's desk. Thought I'd get a little training in with him before I leave. Hirazin shook his head. Naruto-kun is out on a mission, he won't be back for some time. He informed his former student. Jureya sighed. Another one? He asked. Do you ever give the kid a break? It was true, Naruto was always out in the field, probably more so than he was in Konoha. His mission count was off the charts, and he hadn't failed a single one yet. He'd been virtually everywhere the elemental nations had to offer, and that was a year ago. His success rate was 100%, something no other before him had accomplished. Jiraiya didn't know if he should be proud or nervous that Minato's son was already able to whip his ass in a spar. Naruto was a true prodigy, a genius among geniuses. He had surpassed many of the world's most powerful men and women by now, and he was only 10, nearing his 11th birthday. He shared the Sandame's worries of what the young Uzumaki would become in the near future. Hopefully he would stay the same, a loyal Kanoha patriot. He enjoys what he does Jiraiya. The Sandame said, rubbing his temples with his thumbs. He gets restless if he doesn't serve. He finished. I guess. The Toad Sage mumbled. So, what are you having him do this time? He asked, curious of what the blonde was up to. The tales that he would hear from the Jinchuriki were the stuff you tell your children at night. Night saving princesses, heroes slaying terrible beasts, and his personal favorite when the boy got the girl. That was a toned down version of course. You couldn't tell your child someone their age was killing and slaughtering his enemies in mass, or how that same child was performing things that could make even grown men sick. And he never really got the girl, he'd just sometimes receive a thankful peck on the cheek or forehead. But Jiraiya digressed. I sent him to Mizu no Kuni. Hirazin replied. I'm having him deal with a little problem over there. And by little problem you mean the civil war, don't you? Jiraiya asked. So nothing too different then, save a country and kill off a repressive tyrant that's gone mad with power. His deadpan was barely concealed. That sounds just peachy. Hirazin nodded. Indeed. I'm glad you understand. Jiraiya sighed. He really missed his godson. Izumi now understood why the prison was called Black Harbor. The walls that encased the prison were made of some sort of black material that could withstand several high-ranking ninjutsu, or so Mei would have him believe. Yagura made sure that his prisoners of war had no hope of escape. Take away a person's hope and they might as well be dead. Walking husks of the people they used to be was not a life worth living. 
the black material was the reason why the prison was so hard to break into. And this so-called impossible feat was what Nozomi was tasked with completing. He first needed to break down the almost unbreakable walls, storm the prison, free the prisoners, and then find and escort the Sao San back to the base. It was either that or sneak in and do everything covertly, but Nozomi decided to send a message to the Mizukage. We're coming for you. Signed, your friendly Kanoha 10-year-old. Taking a moment to pull in the natural energy around him, the change of his eyes from blue to gold marked his entering sage mode. At first, Iro Senen was astounded that he could enter the enhanced state so quickly, it only took him 10 seconds now. Ireya had explained what it was like for him to draw in the world's power. For him, it was like he had to open a door and then actively pull the chakra in. Nizumi then explained that it felt somewhat similar for him. It was like he had to open the door, but instead of having to consciously pull the energy in, it would instead feel like the natural energy rushed through the door, excited to be reunited with him again. He inspected the structure for a moment and then decided to just hit it with one of his more powerful techniques and hope for the best. He was almost positive the walls would fall, nothing should be able to withstand his sage dust techniques. Raising both of his hands into the air, he began to shape natural energy into a tangible form. He was sure that the prison guards knew he was there now if the high-pitched alarms that started going off were anything to go by. It mattered not, he was going to complete his mission. The energy took the shape of a giant golden-shaped warrior that formed around the blonde. He didn't know it at the time, but he was in a way recreating a very rare and powerful Ichiha technique. However, instead of invoking the fabled Susanu, he called forth something much more befitting a person of his. Minsid. Ishiman. Nizumi whispered, his voice only heard by the wind. Come forth so that I may bring about justice to those who would deny the laws of our freedom. With those words said, the spectral, molten gold warrior fully materialized, his full body armor and famed spear present, depicting a much more savage and terrifying visage of the god of war and justice. The spear was held in its left hand, Nizumi needed his right for what he was about to do. Bishaman was topped off with a fiery gold halo, which oddly enough only appeared every other time he summoned the guardian. It briefly passed through his head that he was waking up now. Naruto was who he was at this moment, so he took his mask off, even though both Inu Taicho and Hokage Jiji kept telling him to stop that bad habit and gave the world a smile and greeting. Yuzumaki Naruto, the monster, was awake. He let his arms fall to his sides, he didn't need them anymore, Bishaman did what his mind commanded. He took another second to take in a deep breath, basking in the salt-smelling air. Then, he released his might upon Black Harbor. Senpo. Kami no Migiti, Sage Art. The right hand of God. He shouted, and within the span of five seconds, he rushed the prison walls, let loose the devastating technique, and the black barrier came crumbling down like it was a house of cards. The image of Bishaman smashing his right fist into anything brought a happy smile to Naruto's face, which in this case didn't matter, because he was already smiling at the world. He could hear the terrifying screams of disbelief within his target and they only excited him more. Dropping the golden warrior, Naruto became incredibly faster, nothing but a yellow and grey blur to the men and women that made up the prison detail. His kunai met many throats in one go, and he was happy that there was so much more left. He unsheathed his tanto, intent on cutting down the three men who were preparing a suit and technique. Before they could reach the last hand seal, he was at their backs, the thin blade piercing flesh. With a single slash, all three men fell, gone from this world. While in sage mode, his awareness was heightened to such a degree, he practically had eyes in the back of his head. This awareness was to thank when he dove to his right, an absolutely enormous fireball smashing down on his previous location soon after. He took a look at the woman who had tried to turn him into ash and smiled. So she wanted to play with fire did she? He sheathed the tanto he wore on his back and held his hands in the tiger sign. He was going to fight fire with fire then. Katen. Goryuka no Jutsu, Fire Release. Great Dragon Fire Technique. He bellowed and brought forth a giant dragon-headed fireball that raced at the woman with intent to kill. Her screams were all the confirmation he needed. He repeated the fury with his kunai, ending the lives of ten more guards, their crimson blood staining his bare face with its warm feeling. He didn't quite like the feeling so much as it was just a reminder that he was doing what he was born to do. He stopped, already done with the set of seals required for the technique he had in mind, for the seven shinobi blocking his path into the prison itself. Futen. Datapa, Wind Release. Great Breakthrough. This particular jutsu was only a C-rank, but with the amount of chakra that Naruto pumped through it, it could easily be an A-rank. As proven when the seven shinobi stupid enough to block his entrance were cut down with the hurricane force winds that were forced upon them. He was now inside the bleak prison, time to find the control room. Four minutes and several well-timed Rasengan later he really needed to thank Jiraiya Sensei for teaching him the Lord Force personal jutsu again, it was one of his favorites now, and he made it to the room he could free the prisoners from. He was disappointed. 
the enemy was far from satisfying. Ao was spending his time like all the other prisoners at Black Harbor did, miserably. The staff didn't allow them any pleasantries, they had to sit in their cells and rot. The ex-hunter Nin was surprised that they remembered to feed them. That in and of itself was a small miracle with the amount of attention they paid them. He had been stuck in this hellhole called a prison for far too long. He hated himself now for volunteering for this stupid mission. He was just terrified when Mei Sama would mishear him and threaten to take his life. That had been why he volunteered. He had commented on how young the shinobi of Kiri were looking nowadays and how he remembered back in his day, when he was young and not so old looking, that you'd rarely see someone so young make it into the ranks of the village. That, somehow, translated into him calling the powerful Kinoichi old and therefore unable to make a man fall in love with her age-riddled body. Ao had no idea where she got that from his little side remark, but the woman had promptly threatened to kill him, and that's how he ended up stuck in here, on his own accord no less. The things he did for his country. That's why, when he heard the alarm bells going off, he had shouted for joy, which was not the fitting of a strong man at all. He was just so tired of the nothingness that made up his days for the last two months. At least he got the information he came in here for, so that made it, at the very least, worth it. That thrice damned Yuguru was an evil genius. He had constructed a weapons factory underneath the village of Shio, which resided on the farthest of the southern islands. It was going to be a pain in the backside for the resistance to get to, it being so deep in Yugura's territory and all. They'd need the backing of several powerful shinobi, which they possessed, but the casualties would almost make it not worth the trouble. Unless they somehow convinced another village to assist them, Ao was thinking that the weapons factory would remain untouched for a good while now. Not long after the alarm was raised did his cell door open, the resistance did an excellent job with this one. He thought Mei Sama would send three, maybe four, teams to extract him, but the speed at which he was released from his cell would make him believe she'd sent six or seven. Did he really mean that much to her? His delusions were severed when he heard the young male voice call his name. Ao San. The blue, moosed up haired man turned to where he could hear the voice. I'm looking for an Ao San. Does anyone know where Ao of the Resistance is? Why was there a child calling his name? You there, boy. Ao called out, wanting to know what was going on. Where were the teams that broke him out? I am Ao of the Resistance, what is it that you need? He emitted an annoyed feeling, why was there a boy looking for him? Ah, so you're Ao San. Good. Mei San has sent me here to retrieve you. He sighed. But I guess we don't have very far to go though. Ao raised an eyebrow. Why would Mei Sama, he put extra emphasis on the proper way to address the powerful woman, send a child, to Black Harbor of all places, with the retrieval team. He asked, confusion lacing his words. The boy scratched the back of his head. I am the retrieval team. He laughed somewhat sheepishly. It's just me. Ao was silent for a long moment, an owlish look on his face. Did he just hear that correctly? Did this young blonde boy just claim to do what he thought seven teams had done? Was he claiming to have broken into Black Harbor, taken out all of the guards, and then set him, along with everyone else being held captive, free by his lonesome? He was so shocked that he missed the boy slightly chuckle. He didn't know it yet, but Naruto could feel how astonished and disbelieving the Kirin Inn was. Hum, your commander is closer than she should be. It was Naruto's time to be annoyed. Did the woman truly underestimate Konoha? They were the strongest military force in the elemental nations for a reason. Ao nodded dumbly and followed the boy he just realized was a Konoha Anbu of all things. Was the leaf really so far ahead of Kiri that their children outstripped experienced Jonan? When the boy identified as Nazumi left with the guide who was to escort him to Black Harbor, Mei had followed shortly after. She had taken a small team with her too, so when the boy realized that he wasn't as strong as he thought he was, she could step in and do what needed to be done. What she had witnessed truly opened her eyes to how outclassed they were compared to Konoha. The blonde had first whispered something that no one present could hear, and that's when that thing showed up. She wasn't a very religious person, but even she knew of the god of war and justice, and when she saw the child if he could still even be called one not only summon him, but command him, she had been terrified. One strike from the golden god collapsed the unbreakable walls, and that's when the boy began his massacre. The first batch of shinobi that he encountered was run through like butter with a simple kunai. He had no trouble at all, it seemed, with nothing more than that. Then he had used the tanto strapped to his back to cut down three guards so quickly even she couldn't make it out. When she saw the giant fireball crashing down on him from his blind spot, she had thought it was over. That's when the boy dove out of the way, apparently, he didn't have such a thing as a blind spot. The dragon-like head he spit at the woman responsible for the flames that almost toasted him was all it took to end her life. Mei couldn't believe that a child was so good at killing. And the smile on his face while he did these things unnerved her. He then went back to a simple kunai to the throat method, taking out at least 10 more enemies. After he was blocked by what looked like to be seven shinobi, he unleashed an absolutely ridiculous amount of force in the form of a futon jutsu. 
when he had entered the prison, all she could hear were the screams of the men and women that made up the prison guard in small explosions. She saw all of the prisoners some she recognized, some she did not fleeing the carcass-covered grounds of the confines. Shortly after, the blonde, alongside Ao, made their way right for her. She wasn't surprised he knew she wouldn't doubt the boy ever again. Team Ro had earned her absolute respect. Before the two could make it to her and the few shinobi she took with her, the boy stopped and turned, telling Ao something she couldn't hear. When her general nodded a bit confusedly, she didn't know what to expect next. Ao made it to her and saw her confused expression. He said he didn't like the prison. Ao whispered. So he's going to raise it to the ground. He finished, somewhat hesitant of his own words. At that moment, the whisker-faced boy which she now found to be both adorable and frightening at the same time, brought his arms into the air once again. The gold substance that his last attack was made of formed again, and with a shout of, Ten May, Heaven's Decree. Black Harbor was flattened out of existence by a huge beam of golden light from the sky. Harumi May had just witnessed the most terrifying thing in her still young life. She had seen a child of Konoha, no older than ten she guessed, completely decimate an enemy stronghold by himself. She'd remember that day for the rest of her life. That day, she had witnessed it. The might of Konoha. Chapter 4 Hell Hath No Fury I sometimes wonder if my talents are nothing more than a curse. Why was I, someone so young, given the ability to understand things with such clarity? Time and time again, I find myself regretting the power I was given. Why me? The need to be a monster grows more and more with each passing day. The more I try, the more I find ways that I am what I claim to be. Be it mentally, physically, or spiritually. So why is it that I usually end up a hero? At the end of the day, I ask myself these very questions and reply with the very same answer. Who cares? I am a monster, be it Nizumi or Naruto. And every day, I become more and more okay with it. When Mei returned to where Nico and her team were on standby, the young blonde that accompanied her was now Nizumi. He'd had his fun. It was time to put the mask back on and act like he wasn't a monster. Nico smirked under her porcelain mask, the way the leader of the resistance kept glancing at her kohai told her all she needed to know. The woman had witnessed, with her own two eyes, the power Kanoha had at its beck and call. Good. Now they'd pay attention to what her and her team said. Ah, the benefits of knowing a monster. I take it Nizumi was more than efficient in proving that you have been given four operatives who are more than capable of fighting the Mizukage's forces. Nico said somewhat smugly. Having May actually say that her kohais were only worth half an agent really bothered her, and to see how the woman reacted to Nizumi's actions made her feel more than a little smug. Nizumi knew as much, even without his abilities to feel others. Her tone said it all. Ah, the benefits of being a monster. Indeed. May finally said reluctantly. I'll make sure not to underestimate you or your team again. She bit out. You have my word. I'm, the woman actually looked to be in pain, sorry. There. She said it, now it was time to move on and forget it. She would be hard pressed to admit that she was wrong and apologize to a Konohanin again. She loathed having to do it a first time. Apology accepted, Mei San. Karasu replied with a respectable nod of his head. You didn't know if you could put your faith in us. Wow, this was the most the auburn haired woman had heard the black haired boy speak the whole time he'd been with the resistance. Now you know you can. Mei nodded slowly. Having children talking to you like they were adults would take some getting used to if she could ever get used to it. Really, what was that village feeding its youth? Did your general get the information he was tasked with recovering? Nico asked, wanting to know if Nizumi had been used for nothing or not. For the purple-haired woman, breaking people out who were already defeated and imprisoned wasn't the best way to spend their time. She hadn't planned to spend too horribly long in this war-torn country. She had a special someone waiting for her at home after all. Yes. A blue-haired man finally spoke up. The factory is underneath Shio. Ao revealed. That bastard stuck it somewhere impossible for us to get to without losing too many of our own. Bay's fist hit the earth made wall. Damn it. She all but snarled. He really doesn't want to lose that damn place. She ran a hand through her long hair and sighed. We really needed to hit that base. It's our greatest way to cripple his armies. Nico thought it was a smart idea. Taking out the man's weapons factory would slowly make his men's supply dwindle down, causing more of them to lose battles with the resistance, not having the equipment to properly fight back. More deaths would lessen moral, which would then cause even more deaths. It was slow and subtle, but it was a smart move. The smallest of bug bites could fall a giant, and Team Ro knew it. Nizumi was practically the epitome of that very saying. Very small. And very deadly. Very. Sarah looked at Nico, a silent request to speak. He was given it in the form of a nod. May san if I may, I have a proposal you should consider. Nizumi smirked. Sarah might not be very lazy or constantly spam the word troublesome like the rest of his clan, but the pineapple-shaped hair was a dead giveaway. The man was Anara, through and through. 
and no other clan in the world could claim to be more tactically and strategically proficient than the deer herding clan of Kanoha. Izumi turned his gaze to Mei and smirked under his mask when he felt her nervousness. Mei sand, he began, Seru is our team's greatest strategist. You should take whatever he says serious. He felt Seru's gratitude at the kind words. It could help liberate your country. Mei nodded, not wanting to argue with the boy's words. She had underestimated the small cell from Kanoha once already, and that had proven to be a bad idea. What is it you wish to suggest? She asked him genuinely. She wanted her home out from underneath Igura's cruel reign more than anything. If she had to play nice with the leaf then she would. Her ego meant little if her people continued to stain the shores red. Mizu was more than ready to leave war behind and enter the nice long vacation that was peace. Too many innocents had died already. Saru once again glanced at Nico for approval. After seeing Nizumi show her so much respect, he would be damned before he showed her anything but the same. His age didn't matter, the blonde boy was Saru's hero. After receiving another movement of his captain's head to continue, the Nara Anbu operative began to explain the plans he had created in the seconds he had heard them bring up the problem they were facing. He knew it was a good idea to familiarize himself with the geography of Mizu no Kuni before leaving for the mission. That, added to his already brilliant mind, was truly nothing to laugh at. He wondered if this made him what Nizumi called a monster. He sure hoped so. After his explanation was finished, Nico and Mei were confused when they saw Seru staring at the base's ceiling, obviously lost in his own thought, and Izumi nodding slowly at said monkey-faced man in an approving manner. Why did the blonde have both of his thumbs up? Did they miss something? Harasu, like always, was watching the happenings with indifference. Izumi sighed in content when he fell down on the bed Mei had said he was free to use, both mask and shirt forgotten on the floor. It was the most comfortable thing the young agent had felt in a long time. The Anbu's commendations were meant to be functional and nothing more. Comforting things apparently dulled the senses. Nizumi thought it was such a load of bull. He loved Hokage Jiji, he did, but the man was such a cheapskate. Another sigh left his small lips, the bed really was comfortable. He had a whole 10 hours to rest his body for tomorrow's assignment, which relied heavily on him and Karasu. The rest was very welcome. The young blonde was a juggernaut in many cases, stamina being one of them, but even he got tired. The small team had only stopped twice in the three-day trip to Mizu no Kuni. They didn't even take a boat, Nico had the team run the entire ocean that lay in between water country and high no Kuni. Afterwards, he had been sent to single-handedly take out an entire prison. Yes, he had volunteered to do so, but that was a moot point. The resistance needed to be shown what they were given. He was the only one who could show them properly. So when the beautiful woman had accepted Sarah's plans and shown them to where they would be sleeping for the majority of the time they were in Mizu, after the small tour of the subterranean base the blonde had been more than thrilled. When she revealed that they had separate rooms, he had been surprised. The woman must have been really impressed by his actions, because now she was treating them almost like royalty. He may have been over-exaggerating though, because even lower-class citizens had their own rooms and beds. But it had been years since he moved into Anbu HQ, and the small closet that was considered a room, and the paper-thin mat he slept on was beginning to get old. He willed his eyes open, his Anbu training not letting him fall asleep until he inspected the room he was in. Even though he knew they wouldn't turn against them, the years of training had drilled into his brain that non-Kanoha shinobi were always the enemy. He was in an average-sized room, the same color as the earth it was made from. The bed took up a lot of the space, being four times the size of his mat back home. Now that he thought about it, it was a bit strange. Why did he have a king-sized bed? There were two medium-sized nightstands on each side of him, both having random things thrown on them like someone used them regularly, also confusing. The right side of the room had what Nizumi thought to be a walk-in closet. He couldn't tell from his position propped up on his elbows, but he would wager that it was full with someone's clothing. He didn't know why, but it seemed like he was given someone else's room. It could have been an accident, or maybe the person was gone for the night or was no longer with the resistance. Whatever the reason may be, he didn't really care at the moment. He was exhausted and ready to drift off into slumber for the remaining time he had left for relaxation. In his tired state, he had forgotten to check on his team's position, like he always did when he was out of the village with comrades. Not five minutes after he had closed his eyes to try and relax, did the door to his temporary room slide open. His eyes opened and he went upright. Of course he had to accidentally be given someone else's room, nothing could just be easy, could it? Before he could sit up completely, he was gently pushed back down into the soft sheets of the bed covers. Where do you think you're going, cutie? A female voice purred in his ear. He immediately recognized the voice as Tarumi Mei, the leader of the resistance. If he couldn't feel the emotions of the woman he would already have killed her three times over by now. He'd never been so grateful of his abilities. I was going to go find myself a new room to sleep in. He replied with a perfect poker face. He couldn't afford to show emotion and give her the wrong idea. 
this one obviously belongs to you. May tightened her grip on the boy's shoulder. Ah, ah, don't be so quick to leave a woman when she hasn't said what she wants to say. She purred in his ear again. He wondered if she actually thought she trapped him. She had to know by now that he was stronger than her, in every way possible. It's just rude. She added after he was silent. Her body and warmth did feel good. He may only be 10, but he was still able to admire the female body. It is a wonderful thing after all. And what is it you wish to discuss, May san He asked politely. He knew how to keep calm and collected, even in a situation like this one. He tried his best to ignore when she pressed her substantial bust against his chest sensually, their faces so close he could feel her breath hit his warm flesh. You seem to be a very mature young man, Nazumi-san. She replied, adding the respectable honorific to his codename for the first time since his arrival. You must have been with a woman by now, even if you are so young. She continued, now rubbing her chest against his. Am I correct? She asked, giving off the feeling that she thought she was right. You would be wrong, Mei-san. He eventually said. I am still very much a virgin. He added clinically, talking like he was speaking about the weather or something else just as unimportant. The woman's purr was absolutely sensational. Ah, so I'd be the first to taste this incredibly yummy looking flesh then. She licked the boy's bare neck. Good. Naruto sighed, he really hated to have to do this. He took her wrist into his hand, gently guiding it away from his body. I'm sorry Mei-san, but I cannot sleep with you. He sighed again. He really hated his ability sometimes. I feel I am too young at this time to have sex. He pulled her other hand off his body. I hope you can understand. He finished, sighing once more. May pouted. Don't be like that, cutie, it's normal for shinobi to have sex at young ages. Our lives aren't very long. She tried to reason with the boy. It was true, too, shinobi weren't guaranteed to live long in their line of work, and so releasing some of their tension through sex was a common occurrence. Still, Nizumi was 10, and most 10-year-olds didn't even know what sex was, never mind be interested in it. The Yuzumaki really hated that he wasn't like most 10-year-olds at times. Right now being the case in point. It wasn't that he didn't want to sleep with her, because he did, he really did. It wasn't even because he was embarrassed about the size of his equipment, because he wasn't, he really wasn't. If anything, he was proud of his size actually. For a 10-year-old, for any age actually, he was more than adequate. He didn't know that he had his Yuzumaki blood to thank for that not-so-small gift from God. It really only came down to two things, one being the main reason for his refusal of sleeping with a beautiful woman. The first and less important reason was that she was still a Kirinin, even if she was trying to bring the current Mizukage down. That didn't really count though, Yagura was an ass who needed to die. The second and most prominent reason was the obvious one, his age. He had no childish thoughts about the act, he knew exactly what it was and was curious about it ever since he first understood what it was many years ago, which is why he was hating his abilities at the moment. He just didn't really want to lose his virginity at 10. It was just a personal preference, was all. I know exactly what you mean May. He left the sand part out of her name. They seemed to be very personal at the moment and weren't in the presence of others. If I was a little older then I would have happily taken you up on your offer. He tried to reassure her. He could feel her disappointment. If it's about your size then worry not. May started, reaching under the covers and his pants at the waistline. There are plenty of other ways to pleasure someone, size doesn't matter all that much to me. She was telling the truth, Nizumi could tell. I won't tease you, I. Anything she was about to say was cut off when she had the surprisingly large manhood that belonged to the boy grasped in her hand. Okay, that's just not fair. The auburn-haired woman thought when she recovered from her shock. Nizumi did chuckle this time. Yup, he really was a monster, through and through. He again grabbed her arm, taking her hand out of his pants and releasing her grip on his member. That's not what I'm worried about. He said rather smugly. The look and feeling of shock and disbelief on her face was completely worth letting her grab a handful of what was between his legs. I honestly think that I am too young for sex. When he felt that she finally believed him he was relieved. He didn't want to offend her. She wasn't the reason he didn't want to have sex. He just wanted to wait before he started that chapter in his life. Her next pout was genuine, after knowing what the boy was packing, he couldn't really blame her. Such a shame. She sighed, getting out of the bed and walking into the closet for a moment. I really was looking forward to getting to know you better. She called out from the closet. She walked out a short moment later in a rather revealing nightgown. Oh well, I guess you can't have everything you want. She said softly, slipping into the covers next to him. Before he could get out from underneath the covers to leave the room and look for another place to lay his head, slim arms wrapped around his torso, pulling him into their owner's embrace. Um, May. He began, slightly confused when the woman's legs wrapped around his own. She was successfully spooning him now. What are you doing? He didn't mind it too much, he just didn't appreciate being the little spoon. 
You said you didn't want to have sex with me. She began. And I respect that, I do. She continued. But if you think I'm going to spend the rest of the night alone after feeling your warmth, you're sadly mistaken. She finished with a happy smile. Izumi had the same smile on his face. He would be okay with that. Having someone to sleep with, actually sleep, was always the best way to do it. The warmth was a constant reminder that you weren't alone. The blonde had only shared a bed once before with a client he spent the night with in a cave three months ago. They had been forced to take shelter for the night and the teenage girl had asked him if she could share a bedroll with him. He could feel that she was scared and was only seeking warmth and company, so he had given the girl what she wanted. He found he rather enjoyed it. And in case you decide you want to take my body in the night, feel free to do so. She purred into the back of his neck. Please. She added in a sensual manner, causing the boy to shiver. Damn, she found a way to get at him. He needed to find a way at her now. He smirked, she really didn't know what she was getting into. He was a monster, but he was a pranking god as well, and he knew a challenge when he saw one. Let the games begin. When Nico had woke up next to both Karasu and Seru in the small room the resistance gave them for their stay in Mizu no Kuni, she had been slightly sore. The room was very small, just barely able to fit the three of them. She didn't know where Nizumi had spent the night, but she wasn't too worried, the boy could take care of himself. Her only real problem was when Seru's hand not so accidentally landed on her body during the night, near her chest region. That pervert. She didn't mind sleeping next to Karasu, the young boy she knew to be an Achiha everyone knew who he was was a perfect gentleman, allowing her to take the bedding with the most padding. Seru, however, was a different story altogether. She didn't like sharing a sleeping area with him at all. She didn't need to be up so early, she had another hour before she needed to get up, but she was always an early bird. She liked to get up and train a little in Kenjutsu, just like Hei Kun had told her she should, even if she was in another country. When she made it to the training grounds Mei had shown her and the team the previous night, she wasn't at all surprised to see Nizumi now clad in full Anbu gear there before her. What did surprise her was that he wasn't alone. One Tarumi Mei was currently sparring with her youngest comrade. From what she could tell, it was Tajutsu only, but like everything else the boy did, he was the dominant one. To the auburn-haired woman's credit, she was holding her own pretty well. She was keeping up at the very least. That just showed that the woman was as powerful as they said she was. She went blow for blow with a blonde, but Nico could tell that he was holding back quite a lot, too. May obviously wasn't going all out either, but she was trying harder than the boy just to keep up. She could see the woman's playful smirk, she was enjoying the spar a little too much. What exactly happened while her kohai was gone during the night? She had the feeling that if he didn't have his mask on, she'd see the same playful look on Izumi's face. Why were the two so chummy? The right jab from May was blocked and then used against her to throw the woman to the ground. It was a clean and precise move, executed perfectly. What came after it was not so professional. The boy actually straddled the powerful Kinoichi and bent down so that his mask was dangerously close to her face. Words that Nico couldn't hear were passed between the two, causing the woman to actually blush and then squirm out of his grasp. It was for naught though, his physical strength far surpassed hers and she was firmly stuck. The temporary Rohan captain could hear the boy laugh before he let her out of his intimate hold. She coughed to announce her presence, which she knew was not necessary, with the boy's sensory capabilities he knew where everyone in the whole base was, but she did it anyways. She knew he could feel her uncomfortableness with the whole extremely close contact that he was sharing with the leader of the resistance, but she still thought it best to voice her opinion. He was ten for crying out loud. Before she could open her mouth to say anything however, he glanced over his shoulder at her, giving her a silent warning that he knew she would receive. I'll follow your orders, but do not forget who I am. Message received. Nico's mouth firmly shut, not wanting to risk her command for something she really had no say in. Nico Taicho, Nizumi Senpai. She heard Seru greet them as he walked into the training room. She had never been so grateful to see the perverted Nara in her life. Looks like we all got up a little early then. He said, Karasu walking in shortly after the words left the monkey's mouth, giving everyone present a respectful nod of his head in greeting. Nizumi gave Karasu a nod in greeting of his own. It would seem so. The blonde replied, now standing at a proper distance from May. He had let Nico see their close and friendlier relationship, only so that the team's captain knew everything that she needed to know. He wasn't going to give her any details, not only because there wasn't really anything to give, but even if there was, it was none of her business. What he did in his private time was his and his alone to know. His age aside, he was considered an adult by shinobi standards, having become one the moment he was assigned to the Anbu. He didn't really want the others to know though. Garasu would most likely not care, but that was beside the point. He and the Achiha liked to keep their private lives private. Seru was the one he didn't want to find out. 
the man would never let him live it down, and he was positive the rest of Team Roe would know of his conquest which wasn't the truth shortly after the Nara caught wind of it. He had no delusions that his team wouldn't believe he turned down someone like May, so he decided to keep it quiet. Well. May spoke up, picking up a towel and handing it to Nizumi. I'm going to go wash off. She then took her own towel and wiped off the sweat from her brow. She bent down and whispered into the blonde's ear so that only he could hear her. If you'd like to join me, you know where my room is. The woman was trying to mess with him again. Izumi smirked under his mask. Sounds wonderful. He whispered back, enjoying her surprised pause. I'll meet you there in a few minutes. He added, feeling both her shock and excitement. He was looking right at her, but his face mask was blocking his mischievous smirk. It took her a few moments, but she finally realized that he wasn't being serious. Damn, he had gotten her good that time. He was obviously more skilled in the art of subtle, or maybe not so subtle, teasing. It was a good thing she liked the boy. If any other man tried to speak to her the way he now did she would have melted his face off with her Jotun. Or so she told herself. Denial was something she didn't have much experience with. She, deep down, knew that she could never harm the boy, even if she wanted to. He was on a different level than anyone she had ever seen before. May gave the blonde a look that said he won this round and walked away, making sure to sway her hips more than necessary, which both Nizumi and Nico didn't miss. That woman is hot with a capital H apparently Sarah didn't miss it either. Harasu chuckled lightly. The Achiha knew who that little display of provocative walking was for. It didn't surprise him either, Nizumi was just the kind of person that people of all ages liked, in more ways than one. Let us spar for the remaining time we have. Nico said, getting the attention of the three males she had under her command at the moment. We don't want to dull our senses. That little remark forced Nizumi to remember May's offer last night. He really wished he was older and more prepared. Ah well, there would always be plenty fish in the sea later. And who knows, when he did age a little more, he might just get the offer for sex from the auburn-haired woman again. A monster could dream, despite popular beliefs. After the hour of training, the Kanoha Anbu team found themselves in the large room they first entered upon their arrival to Mizu no Kuni. Sitting on one side of the large meeting table was Turumi Mei and Ao, on the other was Niko and Nizumi. Both Karasu and Sarah were standing, letting their senpais sit as a sign of their seniority. It was strange to most of the resistance, they all knew that Nizumi was the youngest, yet the boy had seniority over two older operatives. Word had already spread around the resistance in the short time Nizumi had returned from Black Harbor of his actions. A lone boy had crushed the Kiri prison with ease, and that very boy was a Kanohanin sent with three others to assist them with their cause. The people finally had another hero may being their first to look up to. Hope was slowly returning to the hearts of the resistance, and it had been no more than 16 hours since the Anbu arrived. After May had seriously considered Sarah's plan, she had concluded that it was brilliant and simple. It wouldn't have worked however if everything he said that needed to fall in place didn't happen or the super-powerful blonde wasn't with them. Fortunately, and rather amazingly, everything that the monkey mask agent had said was necessary did in fact occur. May was beginning to believe that all of Kanoha's shinobi were in some way terrifying. The strategic thought process of the operative who came off as a pervert was absolutely mind-blowing. The fact that his plan was incredibly simple and completely ingenious at the same time made the woman's head hurt. The plan was as follows. Have Nizumi and Karasu attack several of Yugura's bases on every island physically possible in the span of a week. And, like Sarah knew his senpai would do at Black Harbor, allow three or four Kiri loyalists return to the Mizukage to report what was happening. Once word had reached Kiri and its forces that children were responsible for the fall of so many outposts, not only would it lower morale, it would get the attention of the man they were sent to kill. Once Yugura was given so many reports of mere children destroying his forces slowly, he would be forced to intervene personally, falling right into the trap that was laid out for him. Once he was in Nizumi's sight, he would soon be gone from this world. It was simple. It was elementary. It was, in Sarah's words, untroublesome. Izumi said he didn't spam the word, not that it was banned from his vocabulary. It would also allow the resistance ample time to prepare for what was to come after the week-long havoc spree. The destruction of the weapons factory would commence a few days afterward, and with that, added to all of the other chaos caused by the young Anbu agents, the resistance would take their first real step in winning the war. Mei was overjoyed. Mizu no Kuni was so close to freedom and equality for all her people she could practically taste it. It was only a matter of time now, and not much of it. She really needed to find a proper way of thanking Kanoha for sending her the knight in shining armor that went by the codename Nizumi. So, we all know what our assignments are, right? May asked, getting nods from all present. Good. Her voice was low, but everyone could hear her with clarity. Let's send our enemies straight to hell. She finished with a smirk that Nizumi knew all too well. She had found her inner monster. The following week had gone off without a hitch. 
Nizumi and Karasu had been going from base to base, raising them all to the ground like it was a holy crusade. They were alone, the rest of the Rohan contingent staying with the resistance, helping to prepare for the raid that was to come. It never ceased to amaze Nizumi how efficient Karasu was when in battle. The Achiha was only 13, and he was the closest to Nizumi out of the four that were with him in strength. The blonde realized that he couldn't really say anything when it came to someone's age, him being 10 and all, but he was a special case. He was born with a power no one before him possessed. Yes, there were other senin, but none of them were born so closely intertwined with natural energy like he was. So, for Karasu to show such prowess, with only the Sharingan to aid him, was no small feat. Izumi could feel his closest friend's heart, the boy was a pacifist only taking lives so that he could protect his village. In a way, they were alike. Nizumi only enjoyed being a monster to protect his village. He didn't like to cause the innocent suffering. He was in a country torn by war to stop that very thing right now. He didn't like to hurt the weak or helpless either. He only enjoyed killing when the men and women he killed deserved it. People like Yagura, whom he was planning on adding to his already large and still growing body count. Where they differed though, was that Karasu never enjoyed killing ever. He only did so as a means to an end. He knew the act of killing was an important factor in a shinobi's life, and he dealt with it instead of complaining. There were only a handful of shinobi that the Hokage could trust completely to do anything he ordered unconditionally, and Karasu was one of them. So they traversed the islands that made up Mizu no Kuni, bringing down to the ground any Kiri bases they could find. With Nizumi's extremely large sensory field, it was uncomplicated. Actually taking out the bases was like child's play. Without Karasu, Nizumi could have brought them down almost effortlessly. With him, the blonde almost felt depressed at the ease they were able to finish their task. Mei was telling the truth when she described the Mizukage's plan for overwhelming the resistance. Dean Ro had been told that much of Yugura's armies were made up of very, very green genin. The man with questionable sanity had been promoting unready aspiring shinobi, the kind of people no sane cage would ever let into their ranks, to genin, so that he could fill the empty spots the resistance made in his forces. He was giving weapons to men and women, boys and girls, who had no business being a shinobi in the first place. They couldn't even use them properly for God's sake. It was sad, and it angered Nizumi to no end. The kind of person it took to send his people in the slaughterhouse like cattle was the kind of person that the young Anbu agent liked, loved, to kill. His Hokage knew of this as well, and the wrath that was the god of shinobi was already in Mizu no Kuni in the form of one Nizumi mask Anbu operative. The man never should have touched a high no Kuni citizen. He would die for that now. Kanoha would have her vengeance. Nizumi. Karasu suddenly spoke. This will be our last target before we have to return. He finished, his voice only audible to the blonde. Even though they were friends, the two hardly ever shared words. It was like a silent friendship, each knowing what the other thought of them. In Nizumi's case, he actually did know what the Achiha felt. HN. Nizumi replied. He already knew as much. The week had been a slow one, and the blonde couldn't wait to return to the resistance. May had told him that when he returned, he was welcome to sleep in her bed with her again. She had enjoyed his company, too. Nizumi couldn't wait. They could see their target in the distance. Karasu activated his Sharingan. The walls were a light shade of gray. The exterior was reinforced with metals, three different kinds. The guard's tower had two men inside it. Both were of short stature, no older than 20 if their complexion was anything to go by. 15 traps said they were getting nervous. Good. Inside the fortress, the walls were made up of some kind of hardened clay and wood. Flammable. The ground was nothing but earth. Good. The cobblestone they saw in the markets would have been inconvenient. Conclusion, it's going to be just as easy as the other 80. All of this happened in the time span of three seconds. Itachi had mastery over the Sharingan most adult Achiha couldn't hope to accomplish. Time to work. Karasu could see Nizumi take off his mask and his peripherals. The vicious smirk on his face told him all he needed to know. Naruto was awake. The monster was off its leash. Time to play. You two were able to take out 81 bases in a week, Ao sputtered unintelligently. He was stricken with shock and awe. That many bases would have taken the resistance months to complete. These Konoha Anbu were terrifyingly effective. Correct, Ao-san. Karasu replied. 81 Kiri-controlled outposts are no more. He clarified, the man's facial expression slightly amusing him. Nico gave a short nod. Good. Now that we're so close to being ready to hit the factory in Shio, all of this should be finished up within the next week. It couldn't happen too soon either. She really missed her boyfriend. Yes. Mei sighed contently. And Mizu no Kuni will no war no more. The huge heartwarming smile on the woman's face even made Mizumi smile. He was glad that he could help these people out in their time of suffering, they deserved it. When the blonde thought about it, he realized how absurd it all was. A monster was the hero, setting a land free and saving its people. 
Ah well, nothing about him was normal, might as well live in irony. Mei-sama. A woman Nozumi didn't recognize appeared from the entrance of the hideout. A man is here claiming to be Jiraiya of the Sanin. The woman reported. He's here to speak with the Kanoha Anbu. She finished, giving Mei a deep bow before vanishing again. Mei raised an eyebrow. Did Kanoha send a Sanin to help me as well? She asked Niko with an incredulous expression. Izumi thought he felt his fellow sage. It would seem so. The blonde replied for his captain, already making his way to the entrance. He hadn't seen his sensei in a long time now. Are you sure it's him? Niko asked, also confused as to why the Hokage would send someone as renowned as the legendary Toad Sage to a place such as this. The man may be the most perverted human being alive, but he was still shown the highest form of respect, even from women at times. He was a hero, an extremely powerful and, at times, wise man who helped in the last two great shinobi world wars. It's him. Nizumi said excitedly. I'd recognize my old hero Senin anywhere. Mei giggled. This was the first time she'd seen Nizumi act, even if only a little, childish. It was a welcome sight, it reminded her that he was still human, capable of things besides death and destruction. The blonde disappeared into the small tunnel that led to the hut above, and when he returned, sure enough, the aforementioned Sanin was with him. Niko, Karasu, and Seru all immediately bowed their heads. Lord Jiraiya. Niko greeted. She was in the presence of a living legend. The man gave them a nod, allowing them to rise. So. The Sanin said, taking a moment to look around the underground base. What are you up to now, kid? Ah, you know, just a little mission Jiji wants done. What about you? Everyone present sweat dropped. He was speaking so casually about something so important to someone so legendary like it was the most natural thing in the world, not to mention his completely disrespectful way of addressing the leader of Kanoha. You better not be here for your research hero Senin. In case you haven't noticed, we're kind of busy with a war right now. He added, narrowing his eyes at the older man underneath his mask. Gureya waved his hand in a dismissive manner. Nothing like that, kid. He replied, smiling at his godson. I just thought I'd come and see how you were doing. I haven't seen you in a while you know. He finished, using his large hand to mess up the boy's hair. Izumi swatted the hand that was attacking his already messy hair away, mumbling something about old perverts. Well, since you're here you can help us on our next assignment. The blonde said with a smirk. You can have a hand in freeing Mizu. Mei took this as a way to enter the conversation. That would be wonderful, Jiraiya-sama. That was her first mistake. With the help of both Nizumi and yourself, the resistance is sure to win. Because now the pervert saw what a beauty she was. Oh ho. Jiraiya shouted, steam seeming to rush out of his nose. And what do we have here? His voice was now annoying Nizumi. Such a beautiful woman as you should be sitting on a throne with a crown on her head, not in a place like this. He used his hands to gesture to the earth-made base. That was his first mistake. Nizumi was about to say something about him leaving her alone when the auburn-haired woman seemed to glide towards him. I made this comfortable base, Jiraiya-san. She said in a sickly sweet voice, causing the Senin to shiver. Are you trying to say that I am not proficient with Doton? Jiraiya gulped. Izumi chuckled before he rescued his terrified sensei. Mei-san, we need him alive so that he can help us when it's time for the raid. Mei sighed, but relented. Thanks, kid. One Senin whispered to another. Izumi shook his head. When was his sensei ever going to learn? So, the crazy bastard sent their heads to sensei then. Jiraiya repeated with his voice now serious. When he became like this, like the respectable veteran shinobi that he was, everyone paid attention to him. That sounds like something sensei would send someone like you to retaliate for. Naruto his mask was off and he was able to truly be himself in front of the man who had familial feelings for him nodded his head in agreement. He knew he was the Sandame's top operative by now, up there with Inutaicho and Karasu. Whenever there was an important issue that needed to be handled, with a 100% guarantee of success, Naruto was the person to be sent, especially when it came to missions that involved a lot of destruction and mayhem. Igura tried to play games with Jiji, which was not something he should have done. Naruto replied, rubbing the back of his head absentmindedly. He'll soon know the consequences of his foolish actions. He finished, stretching his back with a resounding pop. Death to those who purposely try to harm Kanoha or her citizens. Jiraiya finished what his godson was implying. Naruto nodded, making his way to the door where he paused and looked back at the white-haired man. Hell hath no fury. He whispered before leaving Jiraiya's personal room. He was tired and he couldn't wait, so share a bed with a beautiful Kinoichi named Turumi Mei again. The blonde's unfinished sentence was left to the breeze inside the base. Like a woman scorned. Kanoha being the now bloodthirsty woman. Chapter 5 Achievement When I play, I play to win. Whatever it takes. Nothing is too over the top. Such is the way a monster should be. I have many achievements and conquests, some big and some small. The size doesn't matter though, all that counts is that I take the victory.
The day I stop winning is the day I stop being me. I am a monster, we don't lose. I'm the best at what I do, no matter what it is I'm doing. That is how it has always been, and that is how it always will be. I'm a monster. We don't know how to hold back. Just the way it should be. Igura or Ichihabito was frustrated. For the past two weeks he'd been receiving constant reports of how there were two children destroying his bases around Mizu no Kuni. They couldn't tell for sure, but they were almost positive that they belonged to the resistance. It annoyed him that the outlaws had acquired two powerful allies. They were more trouble than the entire resistance combined. He had been fighting the bloodline lovers for years now, and never before had they gained such strength. He didn't really care about the stupid country at all, but the fact that he was being toyed with by two kids made him a little bitter. Who were these demons of the resistance, and why did they show up now, out of the blue? It wasn't that he cared what they did to Kiri, but if they were good enough to mess him up here, they may prove to be a threat to his real goal. The Akatsuki was still in its recruiting stage, and they were not ready if they needed to start this soon with the Biju hunt. They had a few incredibly powerful members, but not enough to ensure they could take on every village if they needed to. Madara had drilled the idea that being too careful didn't exist. You could never be too prepared, and if he let these two children live, they could grow into something too powerful for their exclusive organization to handle. He wanted to stay in Kiri to handle the problem himself, but he was needed in aim. He'd have to program Yugura to kill the threats himself if the opportunity presented itself. If he knew where even one of them was, he'd swarm them faster than bees to honey. He really wanted those two dead. Having his men tell him that they were being slaughtered by adolescents was beginning to annoy him. It was time to end this little problem. A swirl in the air around him heralded his leaving Kiri. It was time to check on the God of Rain. The first thing he noticed was the warmth. Not the unpleasant hot summer day warm. No, it was far from that. The warmth he was experiencing was the kind only another body could produce. The kind only someone you trusted could give you. It was intimate and innocent all at once, and welcoming, very welcoming. The gentle rise and fall of his warmth's chest against his back was the second thing he noticed. It captivated him, the pressure applied to him every time she took in another breath. The feeling was both firm and soft. Such softness shouldn't exist in this world. It calmed him, like it was his own personal paradise. He wondered if many others had felt this very same slice of heaven. It was his favorite spot as of this moment. How his body was tangled with his warmth was the next thing his mind picked up. Their legs were touching, smooth, creamy flesh meeting his own tanner shade. Her legs were longer than his, but they were still able to intertwine them together. Hers were as soft and smooth as her chest, if that was even possible. Auburn hair lay sprawled out on the bed, brushing his shirtless back. His warmth's arms were completely wrapped around him, locking together in a safe embrace. He could feel her warm breath on his neck every time she exhaled, reminding him just how warm she was. If he could, he'd stay like this forever, but that wasn't something either of them could do. Both of their tasks were much too important. Their countries needed them. He gently broke the lock of her arms and untwined their legs, earning a groan of displeasure. He chuckled, she obviously liked their close lumber as well. Just a while longer, Naruto-kun. The sleepy Kinoichi mumbled, wanting to stay in her comfortable spot for as long as possible. After his little chat with Yureya last week, Naruto had told Mei his real name. He knew she was someone he could trust with that little secret. He could feel and understand anyone he wished just as much as they understood themselves. He knew that Mei actually cared for him, even if she wanted to care for him on a more romantic level. She had respected his decision of not wanting to have sexual relations with her, which relieved the blonde greatly, and agreed to having just a closer-than-most friendship, which included, but was not limited to, sharing a bed. He was happy that she wasn't offended that he didn't want to have sex with her, and that she was okay with their relationship as it was. The last four days had the resistance and Rohan waiting for the right moment to strike the weapons factory. They knew that there was a monthly shipment plan where the factory would send the newly created kunai and shuriken to Kiri, which was the perfect opportunity. Shio was a larger village than most, and timing was crucial if they intended to pull off a clean hit and run operation. In the small time they had to relax, Naruto had spent the majority of it with Mei. They spoke a lot about what would happen with Kiri and all of Mizu no Kuni after Yugura was dead. The woman had many ideas for her country, which included peace treaties with the other nations. She had no wish to ever have to plunge her birthplace into war again. They had suffered the effects of war for too long already. Another topic they discussed was Naruto's incredible power, or as much as he was allowed to tell her, which wasn't much. He had explained that like Jiraiya, he was a sage, just on a more potent level. He told her that he was born with his abilities and had joined the Anbu when he was six, which shocked the woman greatly. He was the youngest assassin she ever heard of. It was incredible and so sad at the same time. We have to get up now. He said softly, resisting her cute pout. Or do you want everyone to find out that we sleep together? He frowned. With Seru and Irosenin, we'd never hear the end of it. 
that wasn't something he was looking forward to. He wanted to keep whatever intimacy he had with anyone as far away from his fellow Senan as possible or have his private life become the man's newest porn book plot. That wasn't something the blonde would appreciate. May sighed in defeat. She knew they needed to get up before everyone or they would find out their innocent enough secret. They weren't doing anything in her room, just friendly spooning, but neither of them were delusional, no one would believe them. She had no problem sleeping with Naruto, sexually or just for the warmth and company, but she didn't want everyone knowing it. She wasn't ashamed, she just needed her private life to stay private. She was the leader of the resistance after all, and she needed to keep her powerful and deadly Kanoichi reputation. I really wish you were older. She sighed. If you were, we wouldn't need to hide, she paused, whatever this is. She really wished they were closer in age, or at least that he was a little older, so that they could have some fun together. Naruto returned the sigh. Sorry. He chuckled. I didn't have any control over my conception. He gave another chuckle, this one dry and humorous. I don't even know who my parents were. May gave the blonde a sad smile. That was another topic they talked about. Neither of them knew their parents. In Naruto's case, he wasn't even allowed to know who they were. May's father had died at the beginning of the Third Shinobi World War, right after May was born. Her mother had died a year later, leaving the woman all alone in the world. Well, I guess I can forgive you then. She replied, stretching herself against a large comfortable bed. Ever since Naruto had joined her in sleeping, she had been able to sleep better than ever. It saddened her that he would have to leave, she would miss his presence and warmth in her bed, which was much too big for only her. Good. Naruto smiled. I wouldn't want you to be mad at me for the rest of the time I'm here. He said, also stretching. After the two got dressed and left one at a time, they returned to their places among the others. Saru was oblivious, as was Jiraiya, but only because he kept undressing the females of the resistance with his eyes. Damn perv. Nico, however, knew that something was going on between the two. What it was, she had no idea, but something was definitely happening. She held her tongue, though, knowing that she could risk her command. She didn't want the most powerful operative in her squad, in her village, to see her as nothing more than an annoyance. Karasu knew as well, it was obvious to him. They went off to sleep at the same time, and Nizumi never slept with them. How everyone else hadn't figured it out confused him, but like everything else, he stayed quiet. He didn't like to pry into anyone's private life. That sounds like overkill to me, kid. Jiraiya said uncertainly after his godson had explained the new plan to hit the factory under Shio. We need to send the Mizukage a big enough message so that he'll show up himself. Nizumi replied, smirking underneath his mask. I don't think anyone can ignore that. Jiraiya had to admit that, if anything, his beloved student's child was imaginative. Even he, the great Toad Sage, author of the greatest book series in the Elemental Nations, couldn't come up with the idea Nizumi had. It may have partly been because he didn't have the power to pull it off without his godson, but that was a moot point. Iguru was definitely going to show up in Shio, and once he did, he would die shortly after. I agree. Mei spoke up at her side of the table. If this doesn't cause him to show up then I don't know what will. She finished, giving Nizumi a small smile she thought only he saw, but having Nico and Karasu already knowing what to look for, it was clear as day to them. So when does this little play of yours begin? The Gama Senan asked, folding his arms in front of his chest. Because I have things that I need to do. He added, giving Nizumi a look only he would understand. My presence is needed elsewhere. The blonde nodded, receiving the message with ease. We should be ready to strike tomorrow, if all goes as planned. Nico replied. She was eager to get back to Kanoha, she missed her lover. I'm guessing we'll be out of Mizu no Kuni in a couple of days. Izumi knew what Nico was feeling, and the woman knew he did too. She knew he didn't try and snoop on her emotions, he was just born able to feel others around him. It was still somewhat embarrassing though. He knew how much she craved to be with Hayate. While she wasn't trying to hide their relationship, it was still awkward for her that someone knew her private feelings. If anyone, though, she was glad that it was the young blonde because he never used it against her or teased her about it. He let her feel the way she wanted and never brought it up, which she was eternally grateful for. Once this little factory is destroyed I can leave, right? Jiraiya asked with his gaze set on Izumi. If the boy hadn't told Nico that they had a very close teacher-student relationship, then she would have been bothered by how much he directed his questions to her kohai. Yugura should be dead after that, so I won't need to be here anymore, right? Izumi could tell that whatever it was that his sensei needed to attend to was something very important. He knew his fellow Senen was a pervert, always peeping on women for his newest porn novel, but he also knew that the man was a master spy, providing information for Kanoha on a regular basis. In short, he was a busy man, and the war in Mizu no Kuni, no matter how terrible it was, wasn't his problem. Izumi shot Nico a look that said sorry, which was strange that she understood it, considering they were both masked. Correct. 
One Sugura shows up, we can take it from there. The Yuzumaki said, reassuring his sensei that he was free to go after the raid. He was upset that the man had to go so soon, they hardly got to spend any time together anymore. They were both very busy, Nizumi with his Anbu missions and Jiraiya with his spy network. Okay then. The Sanin said with a smile. We're all good to go. He clapped his hands twice for good measure. One dead Mizukage, coming right up. He yelled a bit too cheery for Mei's liking. He was a bit too happy about ending the life of a Mizukage for her to be comfortable with. She would have said something about it, but then remembered what Naruto said, how they were both Senin. Mei knew that Jiraiya was powerful, the man was a living legend, but she hadn't known just how powerful. The images of Naruto taking out Black Harbor raced through her head, she never wanted to fight something like that. Even if he did say he was more potent than the older man, even half of the power she witnessed that day would be terrifying to go up against. She made the choice to just let the old man be, not wanting to risk it. She wasn't scared of Jiraiya, she was just logical. If she tried anything with him, no matter how close she was to Naruto, there wasn't a doubt in her mind that he would crush her to save him. It might hurt him to do so, but he would. The boy was a Konoha Anbu through and through. His people mattered the most, above all else. That was one of the reasons she liked him so much, despite his young age. We'll attack early tomorrow morning, right when they're loading the boats. When Izumi and Jureya-sama are done with the first wave, the resistance will come in for a second. Niko continued. My team will be set up around Shio to help the escape. Here, she looked at Nizumi. That's when your last part comes in, Kohai. Nizumi nodded. He knew what was going to happen, and he knew that Mei hated it with a passion. She knew how strong he was, and that he could take care of himself, but it would be almost like they were abandoning him, something she never did. The plan was simple. Do something that Yagura wouldn't be able to ignore destroy the base, hightail it out of there, and leave Nizumi behind. Once Kiri captured the boy, he'd let them take him to the hidden village, where he would do what he did best, eliminate them. All of them. Get some good sleep everyone. May ordered, giving the blonde another warm glance. You're going to need it. She finished, ending the meeting for the day. The two senin sat in the elder of the two's personal lodgings, speaking in private. They couldn't speak about certain things in front of the others, even the other members of Team Ro. Are you ready for the other reason you're here, Naruto? Jiraiya asked in a low and serious voice. This was something only he and the Hokage knew of. It was the most important secret in Konoha, even more so than the secret child of the Yandame. If the other nations realized what was happening, they would be furious. It would mean total war, with Konoha at the center, besieged by all other nations. I am. Naruto replied, once again in the presence of someone he could be himself with. I'm not worried at all, it should be as easy as last time. He reassured the Sanin. More importantly, when am I going to see you again? He asked with a frown on his face. You hardly ever come around Konoha anymore. He folded his arms across his chest. I miss sparring with you. Naruto hated how well Jiraiya could read him, the Sanin could tell what he was feeling almost as if he had the same abilities as him. To prove his thoughts, Jiraiya gave him a knowing smirk. Sorry about that, Gaki, but you know my work is important. He sighed. And you're not in Konoha all that much either. He added, causing his godson to chuckle. I guess that's true. Naruto agreed. Neither of us have enough free time. He added. He loved his job, it was the most important thing in the world to him, but he did wish that he had more time to spend with his precious people. You should quit the Anbu then. Jiraiya said sarcastically. Naruto narrowed his eyes and smirked. Or you should quit your spy network. He retorted. The room was silent for a moment before they both busted out in laughter. They each knew that they could never quit what they both loved doing, which was protecting and serving Konoha. After a few minutes of laughter, the Senin finally calmed it down just enough to talk to one another again. In all seriousness though, if you do encounter some kind of trouble, the Sanin was cut off by the blonde with a wave of his hand. Naruto could already tell what he was going to say. It warmed his heart that the man cared so much for him to actually worry about him, but it wasn't necessary. He could handle anything that came his way. He wasn't cocky or arrogant, just confident in his abilities. He stopped being challenged by Jiraiya a year ago. He was sure he'd be fine here. I'll be fine, sensei. He said again. I won't be alone. He touched his stomach and smirked. I'm never alone. He finished, causing Jiraiya to return the smirk. Minato knew what he was doing, sealing the Kaiubi inside Naruto was an extremely smart move. No one before Naruto was capable of harnessing the greatest of the Biju. Not even Kashina, with her special chakra and chakra chains, could control the chakra entity. And yet, her son could at such a young age. It was amazing. I guess you're right, kid. I never really thought about it that way. Here, Jiraiya rubbed his chin with his right hand. You know, that's really something you should be proud of. He smiled at his godson. I know I am. His smile grew when the boy's eyes widened. He knew the blonde always treasured the compliments he got from him more than others, for whatever reasons. 
probably because he always treated the Yuzumaki like an actual kid. After Naruto spent only a few seconds to recover from the kind words, he gave a heartwarming smile. Thank you, Jiraiya-sensei. He brought his right hand to the back of his neck. I really appreciate it coming from you. He added. Jiraiya nodded. Both Senen knew the other with great detail, even without the blonde special skills. They had a special relationship. Naruto could feel how the Sanin cared for him like family, which was odd for him at first, but he quickly enjoyed the warm familial feeling coming off of the man. Jiraiya himself had the, sometimes annoying, ability of reading him like a book, which, admittedly, brought a smile to his face. They were both Senin, capable of feats no other shinobi could accomplish, so they could both understand each other in a different way. Even if Naruto didn't know it yet, they really were like family. She could feel the sickening mark on her neck flaring with pain. Great, it was going to be one of those days. Midarashi Anko had been trying to have a nice and peaceful day at home when her curse mark started acting up. Her roommate, Yuhi Kuranai, was out on a mission with her not-so-secret secret boyfriend, Siratobi Asuma, which made the apartment all hers for the next couple days. She liked being alone sometimes, just to get away from it all for a while. Kuranai was one of her few friends in the village that she could trust with anything and everything. When she returned from that bastard Arachimaru's island where he tested her and then dumped her, she had been a little ostracized for her involvement with the Hebe trader. A few years had passed and she was reaccepted into the village after proving herself to be loyal. And now, she was just another Kinoichi of Kanoha. No one saw the snake when they saw her, and she liked it that way. After Arachimaru, she had another problem. She liked to dress a little more revealing than others, which she only did to better express herself. It wasn't like she was some slut who'd sleep with anyone interested. Somehow, though, that was exactly the reputation she had built up. Anko was by no means a virgin, but she'd only slept with a total of three men in her entire life, and each one she had tried her best to date. It wasn't her fault that the relationships never lasted very long, men just couldn't handle her. She was wild and liked to experiment when she did get a boyfriend, which she thought guys would like. She chalked it up to them just being pussies and held her head up high when they'd tell their friends how freaky she was in the sheets. That was a reason why Kuranai was one of the only people she could trust, the woman would always keep what she said a secret, even from Asuma, and never judge her for what she said. After the three guys didn't work out, the snake mistress wanted to see if a woman could keep up with her desires. That was a dead end as well. It seemed like there was no one in the village who could satisfy her needs and be with her in an actual relationship, which she wanted. She didn't want just casual sex, she wanted a man or a woman to come home to and rest in their arms or they in hers. Something, just someone that she could count on like Kuranai, but also have fun in bed with when it's that time. She didn't think that was too much to ask for. The day was a day of relaxation, a day to just push all of her worries and problems to the side, but that was now being ruined by the damn curse mark on her neck. It seemed that whatever she did, she was going to be miserable. She would always be stuck in this nightmare that was her life. She would always be alone, in pain and depressed. She was not one of those girly girls, but right now, she wished someone would come in and sweep her off her feet like a princess, just this once. She wanted a prince, a knight in shining armor to come get her, to come savor her. As she lay on the floor, clutching at her neck as the tears poured with the amounts of pain she was in, both physically and mentally, she whispered four words that no one would hear but the wind. Someone, please save me. Like always, she was left by herself, crying in agony, waiting until the pain stopped. It never really stopped. I've been thinking. Mei trailed off as she lay next to Naruto in her bed. They were in their innocent intimate position again. It was already time for them to get to sleep. They needed rest for tomorrow's op. Have you kissed a woman yet? The blonde could feel her excitement and hopefulness. I have not. He answered, a perfect poker face hiding his amusement. Why do you ask? He almost laughed. He already knew why, and the woman's excitement increased. She really liked him. Well, I know you don't want to have sex, but... She trailed off, blushing slightly. That was new. Whenever they were in bed, May had always been aggressive and not really shy at all. Now the woman was all kinds of embarrassed but still excited. Very excited. Um? He asked, trying to get her to say what it was that she wanted. He already knew, but it was funny to see how nervous she was. She really hoped he didn't decline this offer. And if it was for what Naruto thought it was, he was most likely going to say yes. He might as well have something to show for his time with the powerful Kinoichi. If you would like to kiss me. She said it as a whisper, and Naruto would have made her say it again, like he hadn't heard it, to play with her a bit, but didn't have the chance to. His lips met hers so quickly that neither of them had the chance to react. He didn't know how much his body really wanted the auburn-haired woman. He pulled back soon after, a sheepish look on his face. Uh. Sorry. He said. I don't know why I this time he was cut off when May smashed her lips to his, going in for seconds. They were so soft, he momentarily thought, like the rest of her. 
If all women were this soft then he couldn't age fast enough. He really wanted to be with one now. It was the woman's time to pull back, giving him a smile. Don't apologize, just keep kissing. She said somewhat breathlessly. He laughed. The woman was really excited. Oh well. Might as well have a little fun. Kissing wasn't something he was against. Piero and the Boer were currently on watch duty. The two Chunin hated to be assigned so early, but today was a big day. The shipment to Kiri was today, and nothing could go wrong. And with the demons of the resistance everyone was a little on edge. Do you think they'll come here? Jiru asked, fear evident in his voice. Jiru was the younger of the two, with short brown hair and the traditional Kiri Chunin uniform. The Boru had shoulder-length black hair and the same uniform as his younger comrade, except his grey flak was unzipped. The man's grin showcased his shark-like teeth Kiri was so famous for. Don't get paranoid on me now, kid. He scolded. Now's not the time to be shaking in your boots. He rolled his arm, trying to pop his shoulder. If they do show up, we'll be famous for killing Mizukijama's most hated enemies. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful idea? Naboru always was delusional. That does sound good. He said, tilting his head up to dream about all the women they'd get to sleep with if they were considered heroes. Jiru was also delusional. When his eyes met the sky though, they widened in horror. He dropped the kunai he had in his hand, and he slowly began to point at what he saw. Ten minutes before. The resistance and Team Ro made it to Shio five minutes prior. Mei and the rest of her people were speaking to Rohan. Nizumi and Jiraiya were a little ways away, with the wide-headed man in a lotus meditation stance and the blonde standing behind him, with his hand pressed against the older man's back. Nizumi had the ability to transfer chakra, even natural chakra, into another person. After spending so much time training with his godson, the boy had taught him a thing or two. With some effort, Jiraiya was able to reduce the time it took him to enter sage mode. He also no longer needed to rely on Fukasaku and Shima to assist him while in sage mode. When time was an issue and he needed to enter the enhanced state, Nizumi could funnel natural energy into him, so all the Sanin had to do was stop the intake when he felt it was balanced with his own physical and spiritual energies. It cut the older sage's time in half, making entering sage mode extremely easy. He still kept his toad-like features though, he was stuck with the imperfect version. It didn't take long for the two Senin to rejoin the small army in their respective sage modes. May almost balked they looked nothing alike. The only thing similar were their eyes, and even then it was minuscule. Both of their eyes were burning bright gold, but Jurea's pupils were a horizontal bar, and he had an orange pigmentation around his eyes. May now understood why the man was called the Toad Sage, he resembled one to an incredible degree now. We're ready. Nizumi said, nodding to Nico. We'll get into position. Nico replied. Give us two minutes before you start. Nizumi and Jurea nodded their heads. It was about to begin. My men are ready. May informed. We'll hit the base the moment your wave is complete. She finished, giving Nizumi a nod. She was still nervous and disliked the part of the plan that left her favorite blonde alone with the tyrannical murder. But it was a necessary tactic. No one besides him could handle taking on Kiri and the Mizukage at once, and he didn't want to risk losing one of his friends. It may not have been all that long since he came to Mizu no Kuni, but he already considered a lot of the resistance his friends. It was hard not to when you could understand everything they felt. Izumi returned the nod and was about to say something before they got the signal that Nico, Seru, and Karasu were in position to help pull off the escape. He sighed in annoyance but signaled back nonetheless. You ready, kid? Jiraiya asked. This op was his and Seru's idea, and it wouldn't work unless the blonde was spot on. He knew it was pointless to ask, his family was always ready to bring a little chaos. Or in the blonde's case, a lot of chaos, he never did anything without giving it his all, or most of it. Izumi was silent for a few seconds. In the next moment, he took his mask off, a vicious grin on face. Let's play, sensei. The Boru followed Jiru's hand into the air, trying to get a look at what terrified him. What he saw was. Like nothing he'd ever seen before. Senpo. Cho Adamarace and Tarangan, Sage Art. Massive Rasengan Barrage. Was all they heard, and the sun was blackened. The sight was enough to cause Jiru to wet himself. What the hell was going on? A hundred blonde boys, all looking alike, were falling from the sky like heaven's warriors, each with an extremely large blue spiraling sphere in hand. Naboru was somewhat of a censor, so when he felt the whatever it was falling down upon him, he was able to appreciate the power that was going to definitely kill them. When they drove their spheres into the ground, which just so happened to be right above the weapons factory, it felt like Armageddon was unleashed. The damage done was enough to completely rip the earth apart, exposing the large building beneath. Naruto laughed. It was a deep, vicious thing, and allowed his partner to do his part. Senpo. Cho Adama Rasengan, Sage Art. Super Giant Rasengan. The Sanin shouted, driving his own large sphere into the exposed building, destroying everything under it. 
Naruto could hear the screams form within, and it excited him. He hadn't played for days, and this was the first time he'd ever played with his fellow senin. It was fun, like they were a tag team, slaughtering their prey with effortless skill. He heard Mei's battle cry, signaling the resistance to move in. He smirked, time to show the woman he made out with last night why he called himself a monster. Hirama, you ready to join the fun yet? He thought through his link with the mighty Kaiubi. He couldn't see the giant fox, but he knew there was an equally vicious grin on his face as well. He had his answer. Mei was cutting down the men and women in her path with practiced skill, trying to get to Naruto. He had said she was in for a big surprise during the fight after their activities the previous night. She didn't know what else he could do to surprise her at this point, but she was really eager to see it. What else was he capable of? She had to know, she was fascinated by him. That's when she saw it. A giant red beam shot up into the sky, originating from the blonde. There was an actual pressure being forced on the shinobi in the area. The air was suddenly thick and several degrees warmer. Everything was silent until the bloodthirsty roar rang out in the rubble. A version 2 Jinchuriki was what emerged from the red-black sphere that appeared after the beam had dissipated. The shockwave from that thing managed to throw many of the ninja away. The roar itself put many on their ass, and some even passed out from the incredible fear the killing intent was causing. Mei's heart had never beat so fast and loud in her life. In the ruins of the factory stood a miniature Kaiubi no Kitsune, in all of its version 2 glory. The wide eyes pierced into her soul, freezing her to the spot. That's when the demon did the unthinkable. It smiled at her, finishing off the unbelievable action with a playful wink. Had she seen that correctly? Did a demon just tease her? Naruto roared with laughter, which was incredibly terrifying for everyone around, it being so beast-like and deep. She had asked for it when she started the teasing. He was the heavyweight pranking champion after all. He couldn't forfeit his title just because he met a pretty girl. With a burst of speed so great that not a single person could track him, he was gone, letting Kurama take over for his turn. It was only fair that he could come out to play as well. Hold or ran through Seru when he felt the Kaiubi's presence join the fray. Hirasu was indifferent, having been up close to the ungodly powerful feeling of rage and hate. Nico sighed, shaking her head in exasperation. Did her Kohai really need to let that monster out? Wasn't the one underneath the mask more than enough? She knew he liked to be fair with his little friend. That would never get easier for her to say. It was an awe-inspiring shock that a child could harness such great power. But to call the strongest of the Bijuu his little friend was somewhat unnerving. He was speaking so casually about something that the entire world feared, like it was nothing more than the norm. It probably was the norm for him, which was why it was so unnerving. Another large spike of the Kaiubi's power could be felt. He really wasn't holding back all that much, was he? Nico sighed again. Her Kohai really needed to learn the meaning of restraint. Again, another huge spike was felt. What the hell was he doing over there? If Mei hadn't spent all of that intimate time with him, who she now knew was the Kaiubi's Jinchuriki, she would have been terrified to the point of retreat. What the boy was doing right now was slaughter. He was massacring the Kiri forces. There wasn't really any need for her or her men. Even Jiraiya had taken to watching from the sidelines, his face not expressing any emotions whatsoever. The Sandin had never seen the destruction his godson could cause, but he always knew it would be something on the scale of what he was watching happen to the Mizukage's men. If Yugura didn't show up with this, the man was either not right in the head or really didn't care what happened to his people. Yureya highly doubted he could dismiss this, even if he was one of the two. A Jinchuriki couldn't ignore another Jinchuriki, and one was right in the Mizukage's backyard. He had to come, and that would be his downfall. It was only a matter of time now. Another powerful beam of carnage shot from the version 2 Naruto, this time in a random area. He knew the young Anbu operative hadn't lost control, he just wanted to provoke Yugura into showing up as much as possible. Firing death rays off at random places was the closest thing the water shadow was getting to an invitation. After Mei recovered from her shock, she huffed. The cheeky brat was playing with her. He knew the plan didn't need the resistance at all, but he, for some reason, decided to lead a teasing crusade against her after the first time they'd slept together. After that, they had both been in a playful game of back and forth, trying to make the other blush or, like in this case, shock them. She hated to admit it, but he had won all of their future battles of wits with that one little wink. He really was the self-proclaimed prankster god he said he was. When the smoke settled and the last Kiri loyalist fell, Naruto released his version 2 transformation, still smirking at the world. He could feel how the others looked at him now. They were scared of him before, but now they were absolutely terrified of him. He didn't mind all that much. It was the Konoha-born people he didn't want to fear him. The resistance had nothing to fear from him, but he couldn't really blame them, he probably did look like a demon. Okay, I get it. He heard Mei's voice coming up from behind him. You win. She added, in a not-so-pleased tone. Naruto smirked again. He was very proud of his achievements. 
He then felt something that made him nervous. She wouldn't bust the both of them for the sake of her pride, would she? Harumi made brought her face to his in a passionate kiss, right in front of Jiraiya and the rest of the resistance. She would. Damn. He really got to her with that last gesture if she would do this in front of the most perverse man in the world. Let it be known that Terumi Mei was not a person to go down without taking her opponent with her. He could already feel the old sage rearing up. Great, this ought to be fun. Not now, Iro Senen. He said before the pervert could open his mouth to say something that would make everyone there uncomfortable. I can feel someone on their way here. He announced, his sage mode increasing his sensory range. They're powerful. He continued, slipping out of May's reverse hug. Incredibly powerful. He added, taking the mask off his belt. Gurea became serious. Good. This wasn't the time to mess around. He and the resistance needed to get out of there right away. Be careful, kid. Jiraiya said, turning his back to regroup with Rohan. I'll see you soon, I promise. He finished, taking off, not turning to face the closest thing he had to his son. Naruto knew though, Jiraiya loved him and hoped he'd be okay. It wasn't necessary, but it felt good nonetheless. He was about to walk into the ruined factory to wait for the Mizukage when he was stopped by a soft hand. You better come back alive, Naruto-kun. May whispered, embracing him again from behind. If you don't live to be old enough to have sex with me, I'll kill you. Naruto thought his sleep buddy's logic was flawed, but didn't speak his mind. Instead, he broke the warm embrace, walking forward. He stopped before he jumped in and slightly looked at her over his shoulder, putting his mask back on. When he was masked, he jumped into the rubble of the underground building, not caring what was coming for him. May would never forget what he did when he paused. The smile on his face actually managed to make it feel a lot colder than it was. He terrified her. And she loved it. Igura had disembarked from Kiri the second he felt a Jinchuriki's presence. So that was how they managed to bring so many of his bases down. He wondered for a moment why he hadn't been able to feel it before now, but decided to ponder it at another time. His enemy was practically begging to be caught, like they wanted him to come and collect their heads. That was fine with him. It was time he put the fear of the Mizukage in the resistance. He'd have fun with this one. He didn't care if they were children, if they were old enough to kill then they were old enough to die. That was the shinobi way. That was the Chijiri no Sado, village of the bloody mist, way. The way it was supposed to be. Chapter 6 The Fall of Yagura The death of a cage is always a major event. There hasn't been more than four in every nation since the birth of the hidden villages. The last to die was the Yandame Hokage. It's time to change that. Ending the life of a cage will be my crowning achievement. I can't help that I'm this excited, it's going to be a ride. It was time to cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. It was time for Yagura to meet a real monster. Back at the hidden resistance base, a nervous Mei was sitting in her room, alone. She had virtually left someone she had been close to behind, allowing her enemy to capture him. She had seen what Naruto was capable of, and yet she still worried about him. The blonde had been someone relatively new in her life, but he had already secured a place in it. It was strange. Why was she so drawn to the boy? It wasn't until their rather satisfying makeout session that she realized that she felt a little more than lust toward the young Anbu. It confused her considerably. Not only was he a lot younger than her, but he was from another village. Relationships between two people from different nations never really worked out very well. She knew as much, but her heart kept telling her that she wanted something more from him. Right now though, all she wished for was his survival. He may have been the most powerful shinobi she had ever seen, the stuff of legends even, but he was still just one person, against an entire village. The odds were not in his favor. She hated herself for retreating, she really wanted to be by his side right now. She may not be as strong as he was, but she was a cage-level Kanoichi to be sure, capable of going head-to-head -head with some of the world's greatest ninja. She knew that she could help him, even if just a little. Anything would be better than just sitting here, in a bed too big for just herself, and doing nothing while someone else was off fighting her battles for her. She wasn't horribly prideful, but she did have some, and letting another do her duty didn't really sit right with her. Her mind was made, she was going to go help Naruto. He didn't need to face this enemy alone. She made to get up when there was a knock on the door. She sighed in annoyance but compassed herself immediately after. She couldn't let this affect her judgment. You may enter. She called out to her slightly unwelcome guest. She thought it would either be Ao, coming to inform her about another trivial matter, or Seru. The man kept pestering her with date proposals. It was annoying. She didn't care one bit what the monkey masked man wanted. Naruto was the only one she was interested in. So she was surprised when Nico, the Kanoha Anbu captain, came through her door. Naruto had told her that he somewhat hinted to his captain that they were a little friendlier than most friends would be with each other, and apparently the woman wasn't too thrilled about it. May had thought that the cat might have a thing for her blonde, but he had quickly told her that she had someone back home and only worried about the age difference between them. 
She didn't really think that the conversation they were about to have would be a fun one. Mei san. Miko greeted. I would like to talk to you about something. She added as she walked into the room to stand in front of the leader of the resistance. What would you like to discuss, Miko san? She asked politely. It couldn't hurt to play nice, hopefully the woman would show her the same courtesy. I'll be blunt. It didn't look like they would be speaking politely. I don't like what you're doing with my kohai. She stated bluntly. The woman really didn't know all that much about subtlety. Mei chuckled. You don't even know what we are doing in here. She retorted. If we're doing anything at all. She added. And even if we were, it's none of your anything she was about to say was cut off by the purple-haired woman's dismissive hand. I don't care what you may or may not be doing in your free time. Nico stated. I still don't like it. He's far too young. May opened her mouth to defend herself, but was stopped by the Anba woman. Let me finish. May narrowed her eyes but held her tongue nonetheless. She might be special to Naruto, but this woman was one of his people, his family. He'd kill her without a second thought if she did anything to her. I'm not here to berate you for your wrongdoings. May raised an eyebrow. Nico then sighed. She obviously didn't like what she was about to say. I'm here to. She paused. She really didn't like what she was about to say. I'm here to put your mind at ease. May's eyes widened. The woman was actually trying to calm her. I don't understand. She said in confusion. I thought you didn't like me. It didn't make sense, the woman was trying to help her with her internal struggles. I may not approve of your relationship with my kohai, but I, too, care for someone very dearly. Nico admitted. I know what it's like to worry about them. May nodded slowly, not knowing what else she could do. It was a bit awkward to sit with Naruto senpai and talk about them like they were lovers, which they, unfortunately, were not. If my precious person was in Nizumi's position, I'd be worried sick. She continued when the auburn-haired woman stayed silent. With my kohai though, she gave a small whisper of a chuckle, you have nothing to worry about. Now Mei was thoroughly confused. What was the woman's angle? At the leader of the resistance's confused face, she elaborated. He's capable of much more than you've seen so far. Again, the woman was shocked. Any more powerful than what she'd already seen would be entering the realm of impossibility. Was Naruto even human still? She had her doubts. I appreciate your kind words, Nikosan. She finally spoke. You've made me feel a little better. I still think you shouldn't be in a relationship, whatever that relationship may be, with a 10-year-old. May's smile quickly vanished, replaced with a frown. He's mature for his age, Nikosan. She replied in a sickly sweet tone. Nico cocked her head to the side. He's still a child. Nico replied just as sweetly. May clicked her tongue. She wouldn't get anywhere with this woman. She was too set in the mindset that he was physically 10. His mentality however was much older than that of a 10-year-old boy. He was wise beyond his years and thought like an adult. To her, he was older than she was, in mind at least. She couldn't wait until he was older and more grown-up looking. She knew he would be a knockout and couldn't wait to witness what he would do in his life. He was going to change the world, one way or another. Well, if that is all you have to say, I'd like to be alone now. May stated, ignoring subtlety like her guest. Nico nodded and left the room, having said what she came to say. She really didn't like whatever was going on between the two, and she had finally said what was on her mind while reassuring the woman that she had nothing to worry about. She found herself smiling under her mask, she was hanging around Nizumi way too much lately. The reason she was smiling was because she thought that if anyone, May should worry about Igura. He was about to meet a monster. And then he would die. Chimura Danzo was the second in command of Kanahagakura no Sato. He was an old veteran and best friend and rival to Siratobi Hiruzen. This very man was in the Hokage's office for his weekly private meeting. They discussed many things in these meetings, from recent events to important foreign matters. At this very meeting, Danzo was bringing up their little issue in Mizu no Kuni. We need to react to the Mizukage's blatant disrespect to Hai no Kuni. He repeated, his voice the only thing heard in the Hokage's office. If we let his transgressions against us go unpunished we will look weak in the eyes of our enemies. Here's inside. This was always how the man reacted. He thought there couldn't be peace among the hidden villages. In his eyes, Kanoha was the greater and all the other nations should bow their heads to them. It was hard to handle him and even harder not to have him around. If Saratobi was the light, then Danzo was the darkness and they needed to coexist in order for the village to survive. There were things that the Lord Third just couldn't do, necessary things to protect his people, which Danzo was more than willing to accomplish. It was all for the sake of the village and her people. It is being taken care of, my friend. Saratobi stated. Danzo looked at his longtime friend and raised an eyebrow. Oh. His voice was laced with curiosity. Who did you send, Hiruzen? He asked, wanting to know who the god of Shinobi sent to Mizu. He had thought that his Hokage had become too soft, unable to make the right decisions for Konoha. 
it was very rare for the aging man to send in a team to end such an important man's life without being forced by him and the village elders. I've sent my shadow to shine our light upon Kiri. Danzo understood the cryptic words. Word of a child with a power greater than the five cage serving under the Hokage in his personal Anbu unit, Ro, began to spread a year ago. It was just a rumor, but Danzo knew better. He and the elders were given confirmation that the boy actually existed, but his identity was still kept from them. They weren't happy about it either. Such a strong child should belong to all of Konoha, not tucked away in the soft man's pocket. Danzo had thought the boy's gifts would be wasted with his old friend. That's why it surprised him so much when he was told that the boy, whoever he may be, was in the field, taking the life of a man who needed to die for high, no kuni to prosper. I must say, I wasn't so sure you'd wield him properly. The warhawk said. It's good to see you're using your tools properly. A rare small smile ghosted his face. For Hirazan, it was the opposite. A frown appeared. Our shinobi are not tools, Danzo. His voice showed the power he was known for when he was younger. You do well to remember that. He finished, lighting the tobacco pipe he had taken from his desk with a small katen jutsu, or what he called a simple flick of his fingers. Ah, there's the professor I used to know. Danzo chuckled softly, which would have been incredibly creepy for someone who didn't know him as long as Hiruzen had. It would seem that your shadow has brought back the warrior in you. The Saratobi couldn't help but smile at those words. It was the truth. Naruto, or what he and Team Ro now referred to as his shadow, had brought back a piece of him he thought was long lost. When he began training the blonde with Kakashi and Jiraiya, his body felt old and weak. After the first two years however, his body felt like it was in his prime. When you train with someone like Naruto it's impossible not to get back in shape. I was shown that I'm far from the incompetent old man that so many see me as. Hiruzen said. He hadn't felt this good in years, and he no longer felt like he needed to rely on his teammates to help lead the village he was chosen to command. It is good to hear you say that. Danzo stood as he spoke. This village needs the man who was given the moniker God of Shinobi. With that said, the leader of the foundation left the Hokage's office, content on letting the Lord Third finish the job. If he could do what needed to be done then there was no need for him to get involved. Danzo needed to remember to properly thank this shadow of Hiruzen's, the boy had brought back his friend. Rattling chains was all that could be heard in the streets of Kurigakur. The Kiri people watched as the Yande Mizukage, in the company of two hunter nin teams, escorted what looked like a child in a Kanoha Anbu uniform. Rumors of the demons of the resistance were even heard by the civilians. It was kind of hard to keep something like that a secret for very long. Most of the inhabitants of the mist secretly hoped that the boy was not who they thought he was because they wanted to be freed from the psychotic cage just as much as the bloodline users. He was a terrible man who cared very little for his people, sacrificing his shinobi like they were little more than livestock. It was so sickening that most of the people who sided with him did so just to save their lives. There were a lot of loyal followers, though, and they were just as sick as their leader. The situation in the village was horrible, and news of the demons of the resistance gave the helpless people hope. Every few seconds a hunter nin would yank on the chains that secured the boy as their prisoner in an immature attempt to trip him as he walked. He never fell, but when he stumbled the headhunters would laugh. These men were obviously some of the Mizukage's loyalists, the disgusting filth of the world all of them. The boy showed no fear, but that might have been because he was wearing a mask. His steps were heavy, like he was someone walking towards his destiny. Most of the gathered people thought that he was destined to die very soon. If they only knew. The blonde boy kept his head high, not allowing himself to look weak. A lot of the Kirinin who stuck around for survival respected him for that. The devil only knew what their monster of a leader would do to him. Even the civilians knew of the man's harsh punishments. Public executions were a popular practice, there had been five this month alone. The barbaric events would be carried out in the children's park in the middle of the village. It was an idea that the people liked as much as the old academy graduation test. The man had a heart on for incredibly horrible ideas. The boy was covered in what appeared to be ink symbols, a lot of them, all looking alike. The shinobi knew that they were chakra suppression seals, special seals made to lock away a person's chakra. The amount of them said that either Yugura was being overly cautious or the blonde had incredible reserves. Both had an equal chance of being the reason coming from a man like the Mizukage. The man was so strange that not a single soul could guess what he was going to do next, he was all over the place when it came to the decisions he made. Some began to think that not even Yugura himself understood the reasoning behind some of his actions. The man was a certified sociopath. The thought that Kanoha had such a young child in the ranks of their Anbu was somewhat of a shock to the people of Kiri. The shinobi knew that the leaf produced more child prodigies than all of the other four combined. It was a known fact, Kanoha was on the top of the shinobi food chain, even after being attacked by the strongest of the Bijuu and losing their Hokage. 
the loss of the Yandame Hokage had the other nations hoping that they could take up the mantle of the strongest, but with the god of shinobi still breathing, it was impossible to match the first of the ninja villages. Kiri had only vaguely knew about the happenings of the outside world, being in a civil war, made it kind of hard to be up to date with foreign affairs. Even still, the death of the cage was always something that reached even the most secluded of places. The thing with Yagura was he didn't fear or respect the Lord Third Hokage, which was a fatal mistake. Every cage had at least a little fear and some respect for the man. He was the third human ever to hold the title of God of Shinobi, along with the Rakuto Senen and Lord First Hokage, Senju Hashirama. He had held the longest time as a cage in history, the only other man who was able to claim such achievements was the sandamed Tsuchikage, Anoki. For the Mizukage, who hadn't had much experience in anything but causing civil wars in his own nation, it was incredibly foolish on his part. Even in the presence of the cage and eight hunter Nin, the blonde boy stood out most prominently. He had an air about him that caused all eyes to watch him. He was chained thoroughly and had the most powerful shinobi in Kiri, escorting him to the hunter Nin headquarters to get information not only on the resistance, but Kanoha. That's why it confused the spectators, it felt like he was the one leading them to something. It was absurd, but that's the way he carried himself. All of this coming from a child made it even more disbelieving. Sometimes, the people of Kiri wondered how Yagura managed to become the man he was today. When he was elected to be the Mizukage, he was a kind person who cared very much about his nation. Now though, he was proving the people who thought a Jinchuriki shouldn't be in office correct. It was hard to not accept their words now, Yagura was the worst thing to happen to Mizu no Kuni. Ever. That wasn't saying that it was the Bijuu inside him causing all the trouble, but that's how a lot of people saw it. Something goes wrong with a Jinchuriki, blame the Bijuu. The boy was now almost out of sight for the citizens, but they could still tell that he was in their village. It was kind of scary that a boy could leave such a huge impression on people without saying a single word. He was no doubt one of the demons of the resistance. That was too bad, the people had hoped he would save them from Yagura's reign. Ah well, there was always the other one. A lot of people had thought the same thing. Hopefully he'll be the one. The Hunter Nin headquarters was a large underground fortress directly underneath the Mizukage's office. It served as both the interrogation center and the headhunter's base of operations. It served its purpose and nothing more. It was the picture of a perfect and strict militaristic building. Very fitting of Kurigakur, seeing as it was constantly involved in war be it with other nations or itself. Currently, a mouse-masked blonde boy was chained to a seat in the middle of a dark room in this building, his body covered in chakra-suppressing seals. Yagura, a man of small stature and messy light gray hair, don't forget his pink pupilless eyes and stitch-like scar running down from his left eye, was standing in front of this masked blonde boy. His childlike appearance did nothing to decrease his powerful cage presence. He had the eyes of a butcher, a monster, and the Mizukage didn't know, but the boy didn't like what his eyes were claiming to be. You know who I am, but I am afraid that I don't know a thing about you. Yagura coughed slightly. Besides the obvious Kanoha affiliation and Jinchuriki status. He added. Izumi was silent for a second before he spoke, his head never changing its position. I am God's shadow. He whispered softly, yet everyone present in the room heard it clearly. You've angered my master, so he sent a real monster to cleanse this land of your tainted soul. The words were obvious to the cage. There was only one man who never claimed to be a god, but was seen as one anyways. The Lord Third Hokage. Yagura was about to reply, but apparently the boy read his mind. You're looking at him. Yagura scoffed. You claim to be a monster while completely unable to move. The Sambis Jinchuriki shook his head in disappointment. Such big words for my prisoner. He added. The boy must be delusional, there wasn't a bigger monster than himself. That thought was the man's fourth mistake. At the boy's silence, Yagura began again. I still don't know your name, boy. His voice showed annoyance. The kid was wasting his time with these word games. Are you going to tell it to me or not? He asked with annoyance in his tone again. The man's feelings were very entertaining if nothing else for the boy. I will. He whispered again, and like the last time, the softness of it made it no less audible. Right before I kill you. He finished a moment later just to get on the man's nerves some more. He didn't like you girl already, but he had made it personal with that monster remark. He took his title very serious, and this man had, in his mind, challenged him. The Mizukage sighed. Since you obviously do not wish to share any information with us willingly, I have no choice but to have my men take it from you forcefully. He was sure that if the boy was threatened with torture that he'd break. Even if he was a Jinchuriki he was still a child, he had to be afraid of something. Or, so he thought. Oh, I'm willing to tell you everything you wish to know, actually. I'm just saving my name for the end. Nizumi replied in a relaxed voice. If Yugura wasn't so annoyed at the blonde then he would have noticed the strangeness of the boy's calm demeanor. He was a prisoner, in the heart of enemy territory, and in the presence of a cage. 
warning flags should have gone off at the beginning of the conversation. Apparently, the Uzumaki's plan to get under the man's skin was working beautifully. Igura raised an eyebrow at that. Anything? He asked, his interest once again piqued. This boy was a Konoha Anbu who had gained the trust of Turumi Mei and her resistance, he had to have, or she wouldn't have accepted his help. That meant that he had to know where his enemy was located and any future plans they may have. He was most definitely going to torture him for more information, but it helped if the person talked a little first. It was always helpful to know what to ask about. When the boy nodded, he continued. What is Turumi Mei's next plan? Couldn't hurt to ask and see if the boy was being truthful. She plans to come to Kiri. He answered quickly, causing Yagura to actually believe he was telling him the truth. What does she plan to do when she arrives? He asked immediately after, not wanting to waste his chance to learn what the woman was doing. He had only fraught the woman once and it ended in a draw. Someone with that kind of power was not someone the Mizukage could let live. Izumi cocked his head to the side. To become the Gadi Mizukage of course. He said genuinely. Someone has to put Mizu no Kuni back together after you're no longer in this world. He continued. You know, because I'm going to kill you and all. He added quickly. He wanted to chuckle so badly at this moment. The little man was really annoyed with him now. Enough of this. I'm done with your little games. Yugura spat. I'm done offering you a chance to escape torture. He turned to leave his torture specialists and the two hunter nin teams that came here with him alone with the child. Ah, but that was never a possibility, now was it, Yugura? The blonde said before he could leave. Remember, you were most definitely going to torture me. He added emphasis on the two words he knew the man had thought. The cage turned, his eyes narrowed. The boy had just, very subtly, hinted that he knew what he was thinking. It looks like I've got your attention now. Nizumi continued. Thankfully it would seem like even without him here to completely pull your strings like the puppet you are, you can still act like a real person. He added, confusing the man. Nothing could get past his sensory abilities. Nizumi could feel another presence manipulating the Mizukage. He couldn't feel the intruder exactly though, probably because the man wasn't anywhere near them. Mei had mentioned that she thought it might be possible for someone to be controlling Yagura. She thought it was too much of a personality change for the noble man with good intentions to become the thing he was now. More nonsense, boy. Yagura asked. I really haven't the time for this. If you have something to say, say it. The fact that the man was being manipulated didn't change what he was here to do. The Lord Third Hokage had ordered him to take the life of the Yande Mizukage, and he had a perfect complete admissions record. He would have to tell his leader his findings though. Someone capable of controlling the mind of a powerful cage who was also a Jinchuriki was a dangerous person. They needed to be prepared if the man decided he wanted to try Kanoha's cage out next. It helped that he could tell that the small man had retained most of his personality, even with the man's control. It meant he really had challenged his monster status. He would enjoy proving the man wrong. All right then, straight to business. Mizumi said. You've made four mistakes, Mizukage-san. Yugura ignored the way he was addressed. Right now he was more interested in what the boy thought he had done wrong. Oh? He asked. Please, enlighten me. He replied with mock curiosity. The man believed he was speaking with a regular child, even if he was a human sacrifice. You actually thought you captured me, making me your prisoner. He shook his head slightly. You were mistaken. You're trying to say you wanted to be captured. The cage asked in a condescending tone. Forgive me if I don't believe you, boy. Izumi was silent for a few seconds before he began. Then, you thought this number of seals could suppress my chakra. Those seals could hold me and half of my shinobi forces combined. Yugura retorted. Even if you do contain the Kaiubi, you do not have the ability to break free. After that, you said you were the better monster. This was said with a little anger, something his fellow Jinchuriki didn't miss. I don't care what you want to call yourself, kid. His tone now annoyed Nizumi. You're a prisoner. What you are no longer matters. The Yuzumaki could tell he still felt like he was the greater monster. Now I'm done speaking with you. He said, making his way out of the room. He made it halfway out the door when he heard the boy speak again. I still haven't told you your fourth and most foolish mistake. Yugura made his way back to the boy, wanting to hear his final words, slipping his mask off to look him in the face before he left. His eyes immediately widened when he saw the vicious smirk on the young face. That's when the seals decorating his body lit up, signaling their activation. The room shook and cracked under the pressure of the power the child was emitting, trying, and succeeding, to break from the suppression seals. One by one, the many tags burst, sending smoke into air in an impossible show of strength. The blonde's eyes were a molten gold, staring straight into the man's soul. Iguru was the Mizukage and the Jinchuriki of the Sambi. He wasn't scared easily. But when the boy next spoke, he was terrified. You fucked with Kanoha. 
In the blink of an eye, the now awake Naruto was in front of Yagura, sending him through multiple walls with a single natural energy enhanced punch. He made sure the blow wouldn't kill him, it wouldn't be fun if he died right away. He wanted to play. The second his fist met the man's face, three of the hunter nin were on him, their kunai in hand. Their hands were outstretched to slice through him when they heard him whisper God into existence. Ishiman. The golden form of the god of justice and war formed around their target, successfully blocking the blades just with his body. The thing was tangible. Wonderful. What the hell was this kid? Naruto didn't even turn to face the men behind him, he wasn't here to waste his time with these people. He'd get to them shortly. Instead, Bishaman turned, his entire body now facing the ten occupants of the room his master was previously imprisoned in. When the thing began to go through a series of hand seals, the men suddenly emitted the feeling of dread. Good. Naruto uttered the technique being used by the golden construct of natural energy. Kaden. Kakaku no Jutsu, Fire Release. Great Fireball Technique. When the golden god brought his right hand to his mouth, the room, along with the men inside, were incinerated into nothingness by impossibly huge white hot flames. He didn't know and really didn't care, but he had just produced the world's biggest fireball in history. He was a monster, he knew he was capable of feats no other could conceive of. Confidence, not arrogance. He could see the Mizukage stand from the rubble in the distance of the room he was slammed in. That meant the man wanted to play some more. Naruto was happy about his decision. Igura took the staff-like pole he had on his back into his hand, letting Naruto get a better look at the uneven hooks at the end and the green flower on the larger end. It was an odd weapon to use, but the blonde learned not to judge something on its appearance only. The Mizukage spun it in his hands for a moment before he took off in the direction of the person who had the audacity to attack him in his own village. The Mizukage's staff met Naruto's tanto in an impressive display of kinjutsu, even if he wasn't using a sword, the hooks at the ends of the pole were close enough. Yagura was getting angry. With every strike, the blonde was able to parry it with one-handed ease. He was even putting all of his strength in every swing. It meant the boy was much stronger, and that was impossible. He was a cage. He had more experience in combat than a child. Yet, he was being toyed with like he was the less experienced. It really annoyed Yugura. The two broke off from their brief weapons duel, jumping back to a safer distance. I don't know how you did it, but you are still my prisoner, even if you are not chained. Naruto responded with a crazed smile, and a blue sphere began to come into existence in his right hand, causing Yugura to widen his eyes. He could tell that thing was made of pure chakra, and it would either severely wound or kill him if it found its mark. So when the boy rushed at him, intending to slam the ball of energy into him, he brought his staff up, ready to counter the boy's jutsu. Rasengan. Naruto howled, driving the Lord Fourth's technique at the Mizukage. Igura smirked as he spoke. Suiten. Mizukagami no jutsu, water release. Water mirror technique. Out of the large flat circular pool of water came a perfect copy of Naruto, down to the Rasengan and everything. It shocked Naruto for all of two seconds before he dismissed it and decided to test what this copy of him was made of. When their Rasengans met, Naruto was impressed that they were on the same scale and effectively cancelled both jutsu. When the clash was over through, Yagura's copy of him dispersed into water. Your abilities are nothing to me, boy. The Mizukage sneered. There is nothing you can throw at me that I can't toss right back. He added, his tone claiming he was the superior. Naruto smiled and then waved, disappearing in a puff of smoke. Yagura's eyes widened. The one he had been facing was only a cage bunshin, shadow clone. Where was the real one then? He was informed of the boy's position when the back of his head was impacted by the blonde's foot. This kid was seriously fast, much faster than he was, or anyone he had ever met for that matter. He couldn't keep up with the fight as it was now. It didn't matter if he could cancel the Anbu's attacks if he couldn't react to them fast enough. He needed to change his tactics. He needed a game changer. He needed his biju. The wild grin on Naruto's face was absolutely sinister. He really liked playing with other biju. The red-black cloak that represented a tailed beast's chakra began to flood Yugura's body, showing the world his exceptional control over the Sambi. Naruto knew the real reason though. The same man controlling the Mizukage's actions had also enthralled the biju, making his cooperation with its host incredible. He had complete access to the giant turtle. The air was thick with the version 2's transformation complete. An actual weight was bearing down on all of Kiri. Wide eyes bore into gold ones through a vicious miasma of scarlet and black, searching for any kind of fear in the Kanohanin. He knew the boy was a Jinchuriki, but his control over the Biju should have struck fear into anyone. It made the water shadow nervous that the boy was so collected, even when staring what looked like a demon in the eyes. He decided to ignore his feelings and attack the boy with all of his might. The three-tailed version two form shot from his position at Naruto, pulling his arm back to strike with enough force to shatter entire buildings. This had killed every shinobi who tried to block, thinking they were physically stronger than he was with the Sanbi's chakra surrounding him and the demonic shroud. 
So imagine his surprise when the boy caught his enhanced punch with enough force that blew out the wall behind the blonde. Even more surprising was when he tried to retract his fist, he couldn't get out of the blonde's grip. The Sanbi's chakra didn't even burn him, which he guessed made sense since he, too, was a Jinchuriki. But the boy's physical strength, even with the Kaiubi helping him which he could tell was not happening at the moment, shouldn't have made it possible to hold him back with little effort. What are you? The deep and intimidating voice coming from the transformed Yugura asked in awe. This child couldn't be human, not with this kind of power. The smirk he received was unsettling. I'm a real monster. He said, before letting go of the man's fist and slamming a kick in his head, sending his fellow Jinchuriki sailing. Before he could impact with anything, Naruto was behind him and slammed another kick into his chin, sending Yagura into the ceiling this time, crashing his way to the surface. The sight of Kuridaku's Mizukage and his Bijuu cloak being thrown from his own office, forcefully was seen by many. The blonde boy who was thought to be the leader's prisoner came from the building next, the obvious assailant. It caused the people watching to hold their breath in anticipation. What was going on? Once the Bijuu enhanced Mizukage hit the ground, he took off for Naruto again, this time intent on hitting him with a Sangasho, coral palm, to slow his movement. Just like last time though, he wasn't fast enough and ended up receiving another powerful kick, sending him flying away from the village. This was Naruto's plan. He needed to be alone for his secondary task, and too many lives would be taken if they started their deathmatch in the heart of the village. He wanted Mei to have something to lead afterwards, and destroying Mizu no Kuni's hidden village and its people would be counterproductive. Igura roared in anger. The boy was playing with him and he was still dominating the fight completely. He wanted to change that. When Naruto saw the Mizukage begin his Bijuu mode transformation, he was ecstatic. He hadn't fought a Bijuu in years, and the last time he did, it was so much fun. The thought of taking a tailed beast on head to head was something most people would fear and try their best to avoid. Naruto was the farthest thing from normal though, and he loved the idea of doing the impossible. Everyone had a hobby, and that was his. The giant turtle Bijuu appeared on the outskirts of Kiri in all its glory. The shell of the beast was a dark grey, with spikes standing up all around its body, promising pain to all who got too close. Underneath the shell was a dark red or maroon color, as was the only eye he had opened the iris being a dark orange and the pupil the same maroon. Its three tails swayed back and forth in the air while he observed his newest opponent. Yugura was still in charge, his mind the dominant in the transformation, so he still possessed the rage he had toward the boy for making him look like he couldn't handle himself against a mere child. Without preamble, the form of the Sanbi shifted into that of a bowl-like shape, shooting itself at the blonde with incredible speed. In his head, Yugura had been absolutely livid. He was going to show the child what a real monster looked like. That was a big no-no. With a shout of effort, Naruto met the spinning form of the bald Sanbi with nothing but his own fist. For a second, the Mizukage had thought the boy was foolish to try and challenge the powerful attack from the gigantic being. He then realized that he was the fool. He never even had a chance. This wasn't even a real fight. You needed two for that, and Yugura was obviously the only one trying. With an impossible display of godlike strength, the Mizukage in his Bijuu mode was stopped in his tracks and then shot even further from Kiri than they already were. The blow was the most devastating thing he had ever felt, and he was cursing the gods that he was still conscious, because what came next was even worse. Igura had angered Naruto, actually angered him, and caused the blonde to forego his decision to hold back. He was full of natural energy, and Bijuu Chakra raced around his body in an excited manner. He had felt the man's mind, and what he heard caused him to snap. No. Now Naruto was going to show him what a monster could do. The Sanbi was laid on its back, still trying to recover from the powerful punch. With brute strength that would cause Tsunade to gulp, Naruto took hold of the Bijuu and threw him into the sky above. He was not finished. When Jiraiya had taught him the Rasengan, he had mentioned that it was incomplete. The Yandame apparently wanted to add a nature chakra to the technique, but died before he could. The Toad Sage had tried for many years to complete his student's prize jutsu, but was never able to. It was incredibly difficult. Naruto really loved his wind affinity. The screeching wind signaled the new variant of the Rasengan. Blades of wind rotated around a grinding ball of energy, screaming to be let loose. And let loose it was. Futon. Rasen Shuriken, wind release. Rasen Shuriken. The destructive spinning sphere was hurled into the beast's back, blasting it even higher in the sky. He was not finished. In the next blink, Naruto was above the tailed beast now, with two Rasen Shurikens this time, one in each hand. Futon. Tsuin Rasen Shuriken, wind release. Twin Rasen Shuriken. He shouted as he shot both of the powerful versions of the Rasengan he had created at the Bijuu, who was still being buffeted in his back by the first one. When the twin spheres met the Sanbi's body, he was crushed on both sides for a moment before the two overpowered the one, forcing the Bijuu back down to the ground with an earth-shattering crash. He was not finished. Ishiman. He shouted, the god coming into the world with his words. 
This time though, the god's body had something it never did before. Naruto willed himself to stay in the sky, golden wings now protruding from his powerful sage dust technique. Not wasting any time, Naruto continued his assault. Senpo. Kami no Migiti, sage art. The right hand of God. With all of the might he could muster, he dove from his spot in the sky like the warrior of God he was and slammed the powerful fist of Akami into the Sanbi, officially ending his wave of carnage upon the Mizukage. Now he was almost finished. Naruto landed on the ground next to the crater that Bijuu was smashed into, letting Bishaman take his leave, back to the heavens to sit amongst the gods again. Yagura began to revert back to his human shape, no longer capable of holding Bijuu mode. The Yuzumaki jumped into the crater to stand over the falling cage. He needed to tell the man one last thing before he allowed him to die. He crouched down so that he could speak these words into his opponent's ear. Take this with you into the pure world. He whispered. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto, and when I'm finished here, he waved one arm into the sky to elaborate, I can't wait to play over on that side. He finished. Igura's last thoughts before the blonde boy he now knew to be Naruto snapped his neck were of acceptance. He had met a real monster. The sound of the Yande Mizukage's neck snapping filled the crater, announcing, finally, the fall of Yagura. It was now time for Naruto to start his second task. After Naruto was completely finished with Yagura, he went straight to the resistance, eager to let them know that the war they had fought in for years was finally over. It didn't take him very long, and he was immediately assaulted with cheers from the people, nods of approval from his team, and a nice big kiss from Mei, which had Sarah gaping in shock. At first he was angry that Mei declined him so many times for a 10-year-old, but then he quickly reminded himself that his 10-year-old hero had scored with one of the hottest women he had ever seen. This kid was a god among men in the eyes of the Nara Anbu operative. It all happened very fast. One moment, they were celebrating the death of a madman, and the next, they were watching the people of Kiri greet Nizumi and Mei. Nizumi knew that the mass majority of Mizu no Kuni would accept Mei with open arms as their new Mizukage. The woman had led the resistance for years trying to free her country. She was seen as a hero and honestly the only person who was good enough for the job. Nizumi was fine with some praise, but when an entire village regards you as their liberator, it gets to be a little too overwhelming. The waves of thanks and gratitude he was feeling from the Kiri people almost caused him to flee. But in the end he stood his ground, not wanting to show any kind of weakness to the hidden village. He had to keep Kanoha's reputation intact. Mei had given off the feeling of immense gratitude and even disbelief. The crater they found the dead body of Yugura in was extreme in size, and she wasn't sure if she wanted to know what caused it. It scared her somewhat to know that Naruto could take a Biju down all by himself. But for some reason she didn't find herself thinking any differently about the blonde. He was someone she had come to trust completely in the small amount of time she knew him. Rohan knew their young comrade could do it, but gave off the feeling of pride. It wasn't every day a ten-year-old took down a cage who was a Jinchuriki to boot. Seru worshipped him even more than he used to, which was partly because of his win over Yugura and partly because of his win over Mei. Nizumi knew that he thought there was some kind of sexual conquest involved with their relationship, and he was going to try and convince the pervert that that was not the truth, even though he knew it would be futile. Garasu was proud of his friend, but kept silent, knowing that he could feel his feelings. Nico had thought the most about his actions. The captain was very pleased with the effectiveness of her Kohai's actions. He had eliminated his target and kept the village out of danger. There were no unwanted casualties whatsoever, which showed the resistance how good Kanoha was at what they did. That, however, was not the biggest emotion she felt. Nizumi was happy to know that Nico didn't just see him as a subordinate, but almost like a little brother. She was extremely grateful and relieved that he came back unhurt and safe. He had found someone he might be able to call family in the future. Having an older sister sounded like fun to him. As Nizumi walked side by side with Mei, he felt something he had never felt before. He had freed a country smothered in war from an oppressive leader, and that felt amazing. He was a monster to the enemy, but to the citizens he was a hero. He had unintentionally become his hero, the Lord Fourth Hokage. Again, time passed quickly, and Mei was already the Mizukage. It had only been two days and the people knew what they wanted. The woman would lead them into a peaceful era, which they deserved. It was the day when Mei would speak to Kurigakur. On top of the Mizukage building, Mei stood in her full cage robes, about to address her people. To her right was Nizumi and Karasu, the two who helped liberate the country the most. To her right was Ao, her right hand since the civil war started. Behind her were the village elders. Even they welcomed Mei as the new Mizukage. It seemed Yugura had little support in his crusade against bloodline users. Mei brought her hand into the air, silencing the crowd that showed up. Kiri, I am Turumi Mei, and I am your god in Mizukage. She announced. A wave of cheer and applause resounded throughout Kurigakur. Again, she silenced them with a hand. Our country has seen much sadness throughout this war, and I am overjoyed to say the war is no more. 
this time, when the cheer and applause came, it was much louder, and Izumi could feel the happiness from the entire village. May let the sounds quiet on their own. When they did, she continued. My resistance stood against Yugura and his barbaric teachings, so today, here and now, I promise you that all of Mizu no Kuni will see peace. I'm already sending peace treaties to other hidden villages, so we never have to see unnecessary war again. The village was silent, but Nizumi could feel the gratitude the villagers felt for Mei. She was their savior. Or, one of them. Now, I'd like to introduce two young men who helped free our nation. Mei said, getting all of the gathered people's utmost attention. These two are not even from our country, but they risk their lives to save us. She continued, a smile appearing on her face. Without them, this war would not have ended so soon. She brought her arm out in a welcoming position, telling Nizumi and Karasu to join her. I'd like to formally thank you, Karasu of Konoha. You have done my country an incredible service. I am in your debt. Jeers rang out through the village. This was one of the demons of the resistance, someone who everyone that disliked Yagura wanted to meet. Like his partner, it was easy to tell he was still very young as well, which made him even more popular. Karasu bowed his head to the Mizukage, showing Konoha's respect to the new hidden village they were going to be allied with. The next person I'd like to introduce is this young operative, Nizumi of Konoha. May said, pointing at the blonde Anbu. This boy brought us hope when we thought it was all but lost. The crowd remained silent through their new Mizukage's words. He single-handedly raised Black Harbor to the ground, freeing the innocent men and women that were wrongly imprisoned there. She smiled while she said these next words. And he ended the cruel reign of Yugura not three days ago, all for the sake of freeing our people. Konoha has shown that it is a village worth befriending. She put a hand on Nizumi's shoulder and smiled. Harigakura no Sado, I give you the bringer of hope. She finished, allowing what seemed like the entire country to cheer for their savior. And that's how the monster became the hero. Chapter 7 Unmasked The mask I wear on my face means a lot more than my codename and keeping my identity a secret. I am a monster, and it is important that I stay one. But there are times when I can't afford to be anything but a regular human. As Nizumi, with a mask on, I am capable of being that human, that person. The mask keeps the monster at bay. As Naruto, without the mask, I am a warrior of God, a monster who enjoys taking the lives of demons. What am I to do now? The mask is gone, taken from me by a wolf in sheep's clothing. The monster is all that remains now. And that frightens me. Saratobi Hirazin stood at the top of the Hokage Tower, letting the breeze wash over him in the dimming sunlight. It was nearing dinner time, he thought. It was a calm day in Kanoha, there were clouds above with the sunlight peeking just behind. It was quiet and peaceful, a rare thing these days. He was relaxing, waiting for the captain of Team Row to meet him, going through all the new things that had happened in the past four years. After they had returned to Kanoha, Rohan had gone through a lot. His shadow lost his best friend, the young Ichiha becoming a missing nin for the sake of his village, but only a handful knew of his task. His shadow had known, being there to witness both the meeting between the Hokage and the village elders with Itachi and the horrible massacre itself. The order to take the lives of his fellow clan members was not given by Hiruzen, but by his old friend, Danzo. That had caused the Hokage to strip the Warhawk of his title of second in command. He hadn't known, but he had become number one on Izumi's shit list. He had taken his friend away, and he would not go unpunished. But that would come later, and with the help of a certain Ichiha survivor. The Yuzumaki would give his friend's brother exactly what he wanted when the time came, and the Hokage knew it. It wouldn't happen until the young Ichiha was ready though. No one but Hiruzen knew that the blonde had spoken to Itachi before and then after the deed was done, and the promise he had sworn to his first friend. As long as he was breathing, Ichiha Sasuke would be safe. When the Kamikage said something, it would be done. That was another new thing, Kamikage, God's Shadow, had become Nizumi's official moniker. People who followed him, which was practically any Anbu or Jonin by this point who heard stories of his triumphs, knew of his other name, the Bringer of Hope, the hero of Mizu no Kuni. The young blonde had become the most famous shinobi in Hai no Kuni, and no one even knew who he was. After one of the lower-ranked Anbu teams heard the Hokage talk about his shadow, they had spread the word about the Kamikage actually existing. It became such a big spectacle that Hiruzen had to confirm that the operative Nizumi, Kanoha's Kamikage, was in fact real or risk a riot. It was absurd. Soon after the Ichiha massacre, Inu had left the Anbu court to become a full-fledged jonin, which was not his choice. Nizumi had been sad but had greater things to worry about, like leading Team Ro. Saratobi had named Nizumi the official successor of Inu as the captain of Rohan. He had many responsibilities, so he had little time to miss his senpai. After the confirmation of his existence, Nizumi was known not only as the youngest Anbu operative ever, but also the youngest captain ever. He was the new poster boy of Kanoha, except no one knew who he was or what he looked like. Somehow, word of him being blonde surfaced he suspected Saru was the traitor, and many people thought that meant he was a Yamanaka. 
but she wasn't, he was in Yuzumaki, and what he now knew, an amicus. Hiruzen and Jiraiya had told him of his heritage a week after he returned from Kiri, right after he mentioned he felt like the Lord Fourth when he set Mizu no Kuni free. The old teacher and student were a little nervous how he would react and were extremely relieved when he understood and felt nothing but happiness at the news. He had looked up to the man his whole life, to learn that he was his son was the best thing to ever happen to him. He was even excited to learn that his mother was the Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi before him. He had something in common with her as well. He had worn a smile under his mask the entire month after that, the Achiha massacre the only thing that would cause him to lose it. He was sad that all of the Achiha, his fellow Kanoha Shinobi, were gone, but he was more depressed about losing his best friend. When he was titled a traitor and missing Nin, Nizumi had almost killed Danzo early. The things he heard people say about Itachi made him furious, and when he became the captain of Team Ro, he had banned any bad words about the Achiha. During the time before the massacre, Nizumi had felt the disgruntled minds of the Achiha. They had felt ostracized by the rest of Kanoha, and they had finally had enough of it. The Hokage wanted to find a peaceful solution with the clan that co-founded the village, but after several reports from Itachi and Nizumi, he knew that Danzo and the elders were right extreme action was required. The Hokage had decided that Nizumi would carry out orders to only kill the Achiha who wanted the coup to proceed and spare the ones who were against it. Afterwards, the Hokage would work with Makoto and Itachi to fix the relationship between the clan and Kanoha. It would have worked too if Danzo hadn't acted on his own accord. Now, Itachi was a missing nin and the entire Achiha clan was gone. Nizumi had lost his first friend. With the loss of one friend, he had gained another who he was much closer to. Niko had stayed with Nizumi and Team Ro, and the two were like siblings now. Niko, who he now knew to be Izuki Yugao, was the only person alive who was brave enough to stand up against the Kamikage. She was just like an older sister, she was strict with him when the time called for it like with women and gentle with him when he needed it like with Itachi. She was his closest friend, even more so than Itachi was, and he loved her like she loved him. He had even met her boyfriend, Jeko Haid, who was a nice guy. He had a strange cough that he never seemed to get rid of though. It was weird for Nizumi to speak with someone outside of Anbu, but Hokage Jiji had allowed it, and Niko really liked spending what she called time with her boys now, so he had no choice. When Yugani said something, it was done. Hiruzen was happy that Nizumi had found someone he could depend on and talk about non-Anbu-related things, like his feelings, which he could not talk about to any man. Niko had kept all of his personal feelings a secret, like he did with hers. It was strange, a 15-year-old was best friends with a 22-year-old. Oh well, the boy was never ordinary in the first place. But Yuzumaki had kept his perfect completed missions record even still, after eight years of being in the Black Ops. It was amazing and never done before. Everyone had a few failed missions, it was close to impossible not to, but Nizumi had always said his hobby was making the impossible possible. The Sandame had always thought that his shadow was beyond powerful, but the things he was accomplishing nowadays was awe-inspiring. He had left every other shinobi in the realm of mortals and ascended to something different, something more. Even with all of the power brimming inside him, he still spoke of gaining more. The things he had hypothesized he could do with a little practice were godlike. It made Hiruzen and his student nervous that the blonde would turn out to be like Orochimaru, craving power and willing to do anything for it. They were relieved when Izumi had felt their nervous thoughts, explaining that he only wanted to gain more power to protect his nation, nothing more, and he'd never sink as low as the traitorous scum. The Hokage had his eyes on the Hokage monument, admiring the view. He really missed his teachers and wished that Minato could have seen what his child became, a true patriot. It was a shame that none of the previous Hokage could meet his shadow, they would have loved to meet such a powerful and loyal Kanohanin. He chuckled a bit. His shadow outshined him. That wasn't very shadow-like. It didn't matter though, the boy was definitely becoming Hokage soon, and when he did, he would change the village for the better. Even more, he would change the world. Hiruzen knew it, could feel it in his old bones. It was strange. His shadow was running a little late. That was not like him at all. As soon as he had thought that, the blonde-haired Nizumi flickered into existence behind him, kneeling and bowing his head to his leader, as was protocol for all Anbu. Nizumi, you're late. Hiruzen decided to tease him a bit. I was hoping Kakashi-kun wouldn't drop off on you. He pushed down the need to chuckle. It is a very bad habit. Like every other time when someone tried to tease him, the blonde saw it coming miles away with his abilities. I think you're a little early, Jiji. Nizumi replied, standing from his kneeling position. You may have forgotten the correct time you wanted to see me. He continued. Old age seems to be catching up to you. He finished with a satisfied smirk under his mask. He was top dog when it came to pranks. Careful Nizumi, you're awfully close to insubordination. Hiruzen joked back. He may not be the greatest, but he had learned a thing or two while playing these games with his surrogate grandson. 
Yes, Hokage-sama. The blonde intoned. He had been out of the village for a month with the last mission and hadn't seen his Jiji or Nichan the entire time. He missed them and was happy to be back for a while. He didn't know what was about to come though. The Lord Third cleared his throat before he spoke. I have called you here to give you your next orders, but before I do, have a look at this. Nizumi accepted the little black book his Jiji handed him, recognizing it as a bingo book. You weren't considered a dangerous shinobi unless you had a bounty on your head in one of these little books. Page 33. He added. Nizumi turned to the correct page and read. Name. Nizumi, Kamikage, Bringer of Hope, Leon Sight, Affiliation. Kanahagakur no Sato, Clan. Unknown, Family. Unknown, Age. Thought to be between the ages of 15 and 16. Height. 170.2 cm, Air color. Blonde, Rank. SS Class, Classification. Sage, Sensor, Jinchuriki, Kaiubi, no Kitsune, Notes. First shinobi to gain the SS class rank since Namika's Minato, the fourth Hokage. More data required. Recommendation for approach. N.A. Bounty. None has yet to be posted. If Nizumi wasn't so upset about someone having enough information on him to put him in the bingo book, he would have found his first entry into the big leagues and using. Apparently he was the bujiman. And the fact he had a flea on sight. Order attached to him outside of wartime confused him. This has too much information for it to be an outside source. Nizumi said a little bitterly. That meant they had someone inside Konoha who had high enough clearance to have all that knowledge, giving the other nations the confidential information. My thoughts exactly. Hiruzen replied. It was much too detailed not to originate from the inside. There was even a picture of him with his mask on of course, and it was the very same picture he had for his top secret profile. It was a traitor amongst his forces. I understand, Hokage-sama. Nizumi said, Hiruzen not even having to say what was on his mind. Take your mask off, Nizumi. The Lord Third ordered in a hard tone. The blonde complied immediately. He knew this was necessary. His identity was compromised, even if it was only Konoha who knew it. The village knew that the child Yuzumaki Naruto was the Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi, and if they had a mole, it wouldn't take very long for other nations to know as well. Suritobi took the Anbu mask. As of this moment, you are no longer a member of the Anbu. The blonde nodded. Yuzumaki Naruto, you are now an official Jonin of Konoha. Report to my office first thing in the morning. Naruto nodded and then frowned in thought. Hokage-sama, what about my living arrangements? It saddened Naruto that he had to leave the Black Op so suddenly, but he could think about that later. Right now he had more important things to get done, like finding a place to live. He felt her before his Jiji said anything. I'm sure you'll figure it out. The God of Shinobi said with a smirk. I'll see you tomorrow, Naruto-kun. He finished and then shunshined, body flickered, away, done with what he needed to do. Yu Gao was in her civilian clothes, denoting her off-duty status. Ni-chan. Naruto greeted his sister figure. It's good to see you. He said happily, giving the moonflower a smile he reserved for her. He could act his age a little when in her presence, and now that he was no longer an operative, he could act any way he wanted. All Jonin were a little strange, each having something that helped them cope with the job, so he thought he might as well act a little more himself, and he'd fit right in. I heard you were looking for a place to stay. Yu Gao said with a smile of her own. She hugged him before saying, hey Kun said you can stay at our place. Anbu were supposed to live only in the Black Ops HQ, but Yugao stayed in her boyfriend's apartment when she was off duty and finally moved all of her personal things there. It was now Hei in Yugao's apartment and apparently Naruto was going to live there now too. He didn't mind it though. He loved Yugao and he had become good friends with Hei. Sounds good. Naruto said as he hugged his Nichan back. She was one of the only people he could just be himself with. She knew all of his secrets and feelings, and he trusted her with his whole being. I need to get my things from HQ. He said. All of his stuff, what little he had, was still in the Black Ops building. Yugao shook her head. Already done, little brother. She said while leading him off somewhere. All of your personal belongings are at our place. She smiled. I had Seru help me. Naruto sighed in exasperation. Yugao had made Seru her personal slave when he lost a bet the two had made a year ago. The monkey face Nara should have learned that there was nothing Naruto couldn't do. For someone like him, training the daimyo's wife's demon cat Tora was a walk in the park. That damn hellcat didn't stand a chance against the kamikage. Of course you did. Naruto laughed. By the way. He started, looking around him in confusion. Where are we going? First, we're going home so you can change your clothes. There was her motherly feelings again. Yugao and Naruto had a brother-sister relationship, but there were times when Naruto thought Yugao felt more like a mother than anything. When she was like that, Naruto had no chance in winning an argument with a woman. Right now was one of those times. Then we're going to have some lunch with some of my friends. I can finally introduce you to everyone. 
she finished with a smile. Naruto smiled at his best friend. Sounds fun. He said. He didn't really care what they were doing, as long as he could spend some time with his sister, then he was fine. It would be weird to do it in public though. He didn't have too much experience with this kind of thing. He really hoped her friends didn't dislike him. Not many adults liked hanging around with people his age, so he was nervous. It was ridiculous, he had completed more s rank missions than all of the past Hokage combined, and yet he was afraid of what a couple of women thought about him. It wasn't what they thought personally, he just hoped that his sister's friends didn't mind being around him. He decided to suck it up and just be himself. There was nothing the Kamikage couldn't do. Inside the restaurant Shishaya, Inuzuka Hana, Yuhi Kurunai, and Midarashi Anko sat at a single table waiting for Yuzuki Yugao. The Anbu woman was off duty for a few days, so they had planned to have lunch today. Their purple-haired friend had said she had someone to introduce to them, something about them finally meeting her little brother, which was weird because they thought she had no family left. Hana had already started eating her meal, not wanting to wait for Yugao. People who had met Hana thought that she was the opposite of her clan's wild reputation, but when you got to know her the woman was exactly like her scary mother. The Chunin had been a little upset with herself. Yugao was an Anbu agent, Anko had been promoted to Jonin two years ago, after her curse mark was removed, and Kurunai had just recently got her Jonin rank as well. Hana had gone straight into the veterinarian business right after she acquired her Chunin status and hadn't taken on any high-risk missions that would warrant a promotion. She loved her job, she really did, but when all of her friends were higher rank than her it was kind of annoying. Where is she? Anko asked, getting a little impatient. They had been there for a good half an hour. It was very unlike Yugao to be late. I don't know. Just order already, she won't be upset. Hana replied. Don't talk with your mouth full, Hana-chan. Kurunai scolded. You act just like your dog sometimes, I swear. She added, getting a chuckle from Anko. Hana growled at her friend and frowned. She opened her mouth to defend herself, but was cut off by their late friend. Sorry we're late guys. They heard Yuga say from behind them. When they turned around to greet the purple-haired woman they frowned. Where's this so-called brother of yours, little miss late? Anko asked. When they got a look at the woman, she was alone. We thought you were going to introduce us to some cute little kid. So, where is he? Yuga chuckled. Anko was always a little impatient. He's outside. Yuga began. He ran into someone he knew before we came in. He'll be here in a second. She said while taking a seat next to Hana. So how's everyone been? Kurunai was the first to speak. I've been chosen to lead a genin team when the next batch graduates. The young woman had a happy smirk on her face. She had taken the jonin exam in the first place to become a jonin sensei. She had wanted to pass on what her father and sensei had taught her when she was a genin. It had been her dream since she was a kid. When will that be? Yugao asked with genuine curiosity. She knew her red-eyed friend wanted to be a jonin sensei more than anything and was happy that she was finally about to accomplish her life's dream. They graduate in two days and then our teams are assigned to us the day after. Kurunai answered. We get to know who's assigned to us tomorrow so we can prepare the final genin tests. She added. After the genin graduation test at the academy, the jonin sensei of every squad would test the effectiveness of the team. If the sensei thought that the team wouldn't work well together, then the genin would be sent back to the academy and placed into different teams. That was the usual way to do things at least, unless you were a certain silver-haired shinobi. His methods were a bit harsher, but he was one of the greatest ninja under the Lord Third, so he could get away with more than most. That's wonderful Kurunai, I'm glad you finally reached your dream. Yuga congratulated the new jonin. A lot of people had doubted that the Kanoichi could become a jonin because she was a jinjutsu specialist. While they were important to the village, when it came to shinobi battles they weren't the first people to be picked, unless they were a chia. But the woman had proved them wrong and became an exceptionally powerful Jinjutsu mistress of Kanoha. Thank you. Kurunai replied with a smile. She was in such a good mood that nothing could bring her down. Not only was she about to start her dream career, but she could do it side by side with her boyfriend. What about you Anko? Has the Hokage decided to assign a few kitties to you? Yugao asked. Anko had been a jonin for two years, and she had yet to be asked to be a jonin sensei. Not every jonin became a sensei, but Anko was an extremely talented young woman who had many specialized jutsu that would benefit the village if she shared them. Anko scowled. No. Was all she said. Hana decided to elaborate. Hokage-sama still thinks giving Anko-chan a genin team would be disastrous. This time it was Anko who growled at the big mouthed Inuzuka. When Anko had made jonin she had asked if she was going to teach genin. When the Hokage all but laughed at her and thoroughly dismissed her genuine question she was more than a little bitter. Sure, she might be a little unconventional, but she didn't think that made her an unqualified sensei. Before Anko had the chance to defend herself, they were greeted by a young male voice. Sorry about that. 
the boy said. It's been a long time since I've seen Yusagi. It's okay. Yuga waved at the blonde that came up to their table. Sit down, Naruto-kun. I want to introduce you to everyone. Naruto nodded and sat with a smile. Naruto, this is Yuhi Kurenai, Inuzuka Hana, and Midarashi Anko. The moonflower pointed to each of the Kanoichi as she spoke. Girls, this is my little brother, Yuzumaki Naruto. For a good minute the three women stared at the blonde with wide eyes. Word that the Kamikage, the bringer of hope, was the village pariah, Yuzumaki Naruto, had already cycled. For the three women, no, for the entire county, God's Shadow was the biggest celebrity to have come from Hai no Kuni. He was even more famous than the daimyo, who told the Hokage what to do when he wanted Kanahagakur no Sato belonged to him after all. It shocked them into silence when he just sat with them like it was the most ordinary thing in the world. Anko was the first to recover. Oi, oi. You knew him the whole time, she yelled. Anko was pissed. Flashback, what do you mean specialist? We're the specialists. Midarashi Anko yelled indignantly at the man who took her under his wing when she joined the T&I division. Marino Ibiki sighed. His apprentice could be so childish sometimes. The prisoner is too high profile for us to use our methods. We can't hurt him, Hokage-sama's orders. He answered. Then why not have Inoichi mind walk his ass? That way we don't have to rely on an outsider. If we let him take our catch we look incompetent. The snake mistress tried to reason. She didn't like the idea of needing someone else's help to obtain information. They were the best at what they did after all. No one could get information as efficient as they could. We have orders, Anko. Just let it go, they'll be here any minute now. Anko huffed but did as she was told. She was so upset because it was her direct involvement that helped capture the Iwin in, and now she was being told that she wasn't allowed to touch him. It was vexatious. The man was a golem captain of a Wagaker and was thought to be responsible for the deaths of three Kanohachunin. It was unfortunately common for this kind of thing to happen during peacetime. Even though there was a treaty between two nations, one or both would always try to attain information on the other. When an operative was caught however, it was custom to send them back to their village of origin, a little roughed up, but alive nonetheless. This particular Iwa Golem captain thought that there would be no consequences in killing Kanohan in when they were caught spying on their neighbors, which was not the case at all. He was about to see the flaw in his foolishness. No one took the lives of the god of Shinobi's men for no reason and got away with it. After Anko went silent it didn't take long for the Hokage to show up in the company of only three Anbu. The sight of the Anbu present stilled her tongue. She had planned on complaining to the Lord Third until she saw who was accompanying him. She had noticed Yugao, already knowing that Nico was one of her best friends. She even knew Seru, the second Anbu to walk into their interrogation room. The obvious Nara had been close with Nico since they became teammates and Anko had seen him on more than a few occasions. What surprised her to her very core was the smallest of the Anbu, trailing directly behind and to the right of the Hokage. The hair matched his description and the mouse mask was a dead giveaway. She was in the presence of the Kamikage, the bringer of hope. Ever since the announcement that the powerful boy was actually real, everyone, including Anko, had wanted to meet him. He was the most famous or infamous, depending how you looked at it Shinobi Hai no Kuni had produced. Ever. The fact that someone as young as the Lord Third Hokage's shadow had become a member of the man's personal Anbu before even becoming an actual ninja was awe-inspiring. He was everyone's hero, even if they didn't know that the boy was a monster. Ibiki immediately bowed his head in respect to his leader, Anko following soon after she recovered from the shock of actually seeing the greatest prodigy Kanoha, hell, the entire elemental nations had ever produced. The Iwa Golem captain, unharmed and awaiting your interrogation, as ordered, Hokage-sama. The scarred man said plainly. He made no mistake, he was in the presence of gods among men. He did what he was told and only spoke when it was necessary. He had no fear towards the powerful warriors, he just gave them the respect they deserved. The both of them, the Lord Third and Kamikage, had done more for the village than any other shinobi, which was ridiculous, considering that the bringer of hope was thought to be only 13. The Hokage nodded, always appreciative of how professional Ibiki was on the job. He gave his shadow a glance over his shoulder, receiving a slight nod that was missed by everyone besides Anko, who was watching the young blonde Anbu operative like a hawk. Here is in began. Did you kill three of my chunin? The bold brawny man said nothing, but with the Kamikage present, he didn't need to. Yes. Garazin continued. Did I would approve of the methods you used against my shinobi? Again, nothing but silence was given to the Hokage. No. Garazin carried on. Did you know that they were not spying on your village? Yes. Feeling the small bursts of chakra that only he and his shadow could decipher, he asked one last question. Why did you do it? Anko had heard the stories like everyone else. The bringer of hope, a child of Kanoha who was the Hokage's personal angel of death, he would smite Kanoha's enemies, raise their strongholds to the ground, and did it with a smile on his face, all for the sake of his village. 
people had said that he wasn't human, a bringer of carnage, not hope, but the woman had never paid much attention to them. After word reached Hai no Kuni of his actions in Mizu no Kuni, he was seen as both death incarnate and a savior. The snake mistress had no idea what she was witnessing at the moment. The Hokage would ask a question, receive no answer, and then move on to the next. That's why, when Nizumi had felt the man's reply and acted rather violently, she was confused. It was fun. The man thought it was fun to watch the life lead the blonde's comrades. They were fresh chunin, they didn't stand a chance against someone like him. That caused him to let himself become the monster he was. In the blink of an eye, Nizumi had taken his tanto into his hand and drove it into the Iwanin's neck, lowering his head so he could make sure that the dying man could see his gold eyes stare at him through his eye slits. For a moment, he just held the man's gaze, not flinching in the slightest when he coughed blood onto his white masked face. Both Anko and Ibiki were thoroughly confused and terrified at the blonde's next words. You're right. He said casually. It is fun. When he finished his words, he pulled his blade from the man's throat, swiped it in the air once to rid it of the blood staining it, and then sheathed it. The Hokage or the other Anbu made no move to berate him for his actions or show any sign that they disliked what he did at all. For a moment, Anko just stood there, a little shocked at the boy's complete lack in regard of taking a life so brutally. Everyone knew that he hadn't died right away, he was stabbed just so that he suffered through it for a few seconds. He had just killed an unarmed and helpless prisoner with an ease that brought chills to the Kanoichi's back. They had no way of knowing that that was the whole point. The three Chunin the man had killed were helpless against him, unable to stand a chance. They lost their lives just as helpless as he. An eye for an eye was not always the best policy, but it seemed to be appropriate in this particular situation. Usually, Anbu were supposed to kill themselves upon capture, but thanks to Anko's quick thinking they had subdued the man perfectly. He was unconscious and had two chakra suppression seals on him before he even knew that he was being attacked. In her mind, she had a hand in ending the man's life so horribly. That was not the end of her first encounter with a true monster. What came next would change her life forever. The Nizumi masked boy turned to the special Jonin, looking her over. She involuntarily gulped in fear that she had somehow offended him in some way. She didn't think he would hurt a fellow loyal Kanohan in, but she remembered that a few people still didn't trust her for being a traitor's student and was praying that he was not one of them. Is this the Kanoichi you spoke of, Nico? He asked, getting an affirmative from his purple-haired teammate. Yes sir. She's the one with the curse mark. Nizumi was not pleased that one of his comrades was forced to live in pain and constant reminder of her previous sensei's sins. When Nico had explained the snake woman's problem, he had been more than willing to see if he could help. When it came to seals, like a curse mark, Nizumi was an amazing person to know. He was by no means a fuinjutsu specialist, but he had the capability of removing them. It was actually quite simple for the blonde. With his ability to transfer chakra, he had the opposite of the ability as well. That was something the Yuzumaki had learned early in his shinobi career, with every one of his talents, there was a positive and negative way of using it. Not negative as in it harmed him in some way, but as in an opposite or inverted way of using it. Seals were powered by the user's chakra. If you took that chakra away, the seal would no longer be able to stabilize itself. It took someone with both incredible precision and the actual ability to extract the chakra for this method to work, and fortunately for Anko, Nizumi had both. Midrashi Anko. The Hokage began. Kneel before your leader. He demanded. Anko was a little surprised but complied nonetheless. The Hokage had spoken, and she could do nothing but obey. She felt it before she heard it. Her tan trench coat was pulled to the side by small hands, followed by the mesh armor around her shoulder. She flinched at the blonde straightforwardness. She had no idea what he was doing, but decided to trust her fellow shinobi and Hokage. Izumi gave a genuine small smile under his mask. He could help this girl. The boy laid his right hand on the woman's shoulder, right above the bane of her existence. He looked to his leader for permission, never doing anything without it. Receiving a nod from the aging man, he began the process of changing someone's life. It was time to free her from the traitorous bastard for good. He shut his eyes in concentration, feeling for the exact amount of foreign influence he needed to extract from the girl. If he pulled recklessly he could harm the Kanoichi, which was something he did not want to do. He focused his breathing, sending minuscule bursts of his own chakra into her to act like radar. While this method could be used for the extraction of chakra, it also had another purpose. He could feel the emotions of everyone around him already, but like this he could feel the single person entirely. Their likes, dislikes, wants, needs, everything. He had only done this with the Hokage, the man wanting him to be able to understand the way he lead the village. Now, with Anko, he had felt something that he had long since lost the need to feel. There, Nizumi had found the foreign pieces that needed to be eliminated. Taking his hand from the woman's neck, he ripped the disgusting chakra from her. 
with his hand, a substance that looked similar to his sage dust, only it was a sinister purple instead of majestic gold, came with it. Even under her mask, Nizumi could feel Nico's eyes widen, as well as Sarah's. For the Hokage, the opposite was happening. The Lord Third narrowed his eyes, already noticing the shape the repugnant chakra was taking. Orochimaru. The transparent, sickly Orochimaru was now being held by the neck with the Kamikage's hand. Nizumi had guessed that the thing was a piece of the man's soul, secured in the curse mark in the case of his death. All it would take was for one of his followers to resurrect the man from the seal. By the look of the thing, Orochimaru was still, unfortunately, alive. The ghostly form of Orochimaru could do nothing but groan out unintelligently within the firm grasp of the bringer of hope. Nizumi brought the soul shard to eye level before pumping the thing full of his own natural energy. The sinister purple was being swallowed up by noble gold at an astonishing rate. The groans became screams of agony, announcing its end. With one last wave of pure natural energy, the piece of Orochimaru's soul that was held within Anko for safekeeping was destroyed, shattering like glass. With a display of light signaled the end to the Kinoichi's suffering. The curse mark was gone. The extraction was painful and exhausting for Anko, and as a result she was close to losing consciousness. Before she could leave though, Nizumi had one last thing to do. He bent down so that he could speak, and only the woman would hear him. That's when he whispered something he used to wish someone, anyone, would tell him. There, he began, I've saved you. And with that, Anko lost consciousness, taking with her the words she'd been waiting to hear for years. She had met her knight in shining armor. Then flashback, after Anko had her curse mark removed she had begged and pleaded to meet Nizumi again. Both the Hokage and Yugao had refused to say anything though. The Hokage straight out told her that it wasn't going to happen. Nizumi was a secret operative and hadn't the time to waste with any more girls. It was apparently a problem with the blonde Anbu agent, the female species seemed to be attracted to him like bees to honey. Yugao had said that she didn't really know her superior all that much, stating that Rohan was a big team and she was usually in charge of an entire sub-cell herself. She also said that her captain didn't need another older woman to throw herself at him. Anko didn't know what they had thought she was going to do to the kid. It wasn't like she had decided to fuck his brains out or anything, she just wanted to properly thank him for what he had done for her. He had set her free and brought her hope and happiness. So when Yugao came in with her very hero, saying that he was her little brother, she was a little ticked off. I thought you said you two weren't close. She yelled, getting weird looks from the other customers. I had to say that, Anko-chan. Yugao said calmly. Hokage-sama ordered me to. You could have hinted at me or something. Anko shouted. I thought we were friends. Yugao's eyes widened a little after that was said. She knew that her friend really wanted to meet her kid brother, but she honestly didn't think that it was this important to her. She was actually really upset with her. Before Yugao could say anything else, Anko grabbed Naruto by the wrist and dragged him out of Shishaya's, a surprised look on his face. Come on, we need to talk. She yelled as she pulled him away from the others. Naruto sighed. This was going to be a little awkward and he just got back from a long and taxing mission. All he wanted to do was sit down and share a meal with his Nichan. But with all of the emotions he could feel coming from the Kanoichi, he knew that wasn't going to be happening anytime soon. Chapter 8 Jonin Test The people of my village have only ever heard of the bringer of hope being some kind of valiant hero who does the right thing in every situation. They couldn't be more wrong. I'm a monster, a soldier of a god. The peace and justice I fight for are all for the sake of my commander. I am the sword of god and the shield of heaven. I only do what is expected from me. That was how it used to be, at least. Now, I am a part of the whole. I have no mask to aid me, to distinguish me from the others. What you see is what you get. My fellow shinobi will never accept me as one of them unless they are shown what I am capable of firsthand. It's going to be something they never forget. This, I promise to you. Somehow, for reasons unknown to her, Anko had taken Naruto to her shared apartment with Kurenai. She didn't know why they ended up here. She had wanted to speak to the boy in private and she guessed her subconscious mind thought that that place was her room. She was still upset with Yugao for keeping her away from him but decided to think about that later after she spoke with the person responsible for her freedom. Now, in her room with the bringer of hope, she was uncharacteristically nervous. Anko was usually a brash and brave woman, unaffected by what people thought of her in their presence at least, and couldn't understand why the blonde made her feel so shy. It could be because of his legendary hero status among most of the world, but that thought hadn't crossed her mind yet. She felt like a peasant staring in awe at a giant. So here they were, the snake mistress and Kamikage, alone, in her room. Alone. By Midarashi Anko. She blurted out suddenly. Then she face-palmed. He already knew who she was. But you already knew that. She said somewhat sheepishly. So your name is Yuzumaki Naruto, right? She repeated the name that Yugao had introduced him as. God, why was she being so shy? This was not like her at all. She hated feeling this way. 
Naruto tried to give her a reassuring smile. Yes, Anko-san. It was a little weird being in the woman's bedroom alone with her. He could feel her nervousness and her embarrassment. She had closed the door when she walked in on habit and was regretting it now. She didn't want him to think she brought him here to sleep with him. Dust Anko is fine. She informed him. She was never big with honorifics and the sword. I, uh, brought you here too, she started speaking softer and softer, thank you, for what you did. She finished in a very hushed tone. It was hard for Anko to thank anyone, even her superiors. She wasn't a very emotional or clingy girl, so thank yous and apologies were very rare from the Kinoichi. Naruto, however, seemed to be the exception. And he was. The blonde had taken away the thing that she looked at first thing in the morning and last thing at night. The curse mark was exactly that, her curse. It disgusted her every time she looked at it and only checked all the time to see if it miraculously disappeared. It never did. Not until she met the Kamikage, that is. With one encounter with the famed shinobi, he had changed her life for the better. He was like no one she had ever met before, and she had only met him once. It's not a problem, Anko he stopped himself from adding the sense suffix to her name like she asked. If it's for my fellow Kanohanin, I'd do anything to help. His smile was absolutely beautiful. Anko was a little taken aback by the way the blonde was talking. What she had witnessed two years ago was a stark contrast to the cheery boy standing in her room. The boy was amazing and incredibly terrifying when he wanted to be, so to see him act so friendly was a little strange for her. Well, whatever the case may be, thank you. She replied. You have no idea how much it means to me. She added. Naruto smirked. He knew exactly how she felt, just as much as she did. He had sensed with her all those years ago, so he knew the women better than any of her longtime friends did. He wasn't going to tell her that though. Most people found his ability to perfectly understand them somewhat creepy. They felt like he was invading their personal privacy, which, in a sense, he was. He never used their feelings against them though, and never brought them up. Ever. Still, even some of the people on his team found it a little weird, and at times, annoying. They could never get anything past him. You're welcome. He finally said. He didn't really see it as something he needed to be thanked for though. It was a simple procedure. Yeah, he might be the only person alive who could do it with such ease, but it was still simple nonetheless, to him at least. But for the Kinoichi's sake, he accepted the compliment. He knew how hard it was for the woman to thank people, and it showed how much it meant to her when she did. Is that the only thing you needed, Anko? He asked. They were still just standing in her room. Anko bit her lip and thought. She did want to ask him something else, but didn't know if it was alright or not. After all, he was an Anbu agent at the time, so it might be confidential, but she wanted to know anyways. She needed to know why he did it. When we first met, why did you kill that Iwa Gollum the way you did? To her, the Kamikage was a hero, a man or boy who helped the weak and protected his village. Someone like that wouldn't have killed a man so brutally. Naruto sighed. He knew this was going to come up. All I can tell you is that the man was guilty, and I only showed him the same courtesy he showed our men. He knew that when he decided to let himself be a monster, people would be wary of him, in one way or another. He had hoped that Anko wouldn't ask him about the I was scum, but he knew her. She was a curious woman. How do you know he was guilty though? She asked suddenly. All she had seen was the Hokage ask questions and received no answers. There was no way he was able to get the answers just from being near the man, right? If not, then he had killed a man in the worst way there was. Even Ibiki had boundaries, and killing an unarmed and completely subdued man was something no one should be willing to do. They would do it if their Hokage ordered them to, but their leader never gave orders like that, not to them at least. I'm a censor, I know things. He could tell Anko didn't appreciate the half-truth of his reply. He was a censor, and he did know things about people because of it, but he didn't go into detail about it, which is what the woman wanted. I just don't know why someone like you, a hero, would do that to someone. She said. It really didn't make sense to her. He was the person to set an entire country free from its oppressor and had, supposedly, asked for nothing but a healthy alliance between the two nations in return. Naruto gave the woman a sad smile, which shocked her a little. He then turned to the door and opened it. Before he walked out, he told her the most truthful thing he'd ever say to her. I've never claimed to be a hero. As he was walking out she caught the last part of his sentence. What I am. Is a monster. And with that, Naruto left the woman alone with her thoughts. And they were many. After his little chat with Anko, which he was a little confused with because they really didn't need to be in her bedroom for it, Naruto decided to make his way back to his new home. He had recently discovered something about his sage dust technique that, if he was able to harness it properly, would put him into a place in which the eye could not see. He was already years ahead of other shinobi when it came to destructive power, but with what he thought his newfound abilities might do when he ascertained them would send him even further. He needed power, not want, so that he could protect his people. The downside about it though was how difficult it was. 
He was able to learn everything he picked up with such ease and speed that he was a little unprepared to deal with the annoyance of patient learning. Even he couldn't understand what he was trying to accomplish, and that was infuriating. When he arrived, he went straight to his room, already aware that he was the only person in the apartment. He had briefly wondered if Yugao was still at the restaurant with the others and if she would be upset if he didn't return. She most likely wouldn't be. It was the being alone with Anko part that might make her angry. They hadn't done anything, but Naruto could feel Yugao's mind. She had thought that that was exactly what was going to happen when they left. Honestly, did his Nichan think he was some kind of man whore? He had only been close with one woman his entire life, and she just happened to be older than him. Sure, there were other girls after May that fancied him as more than a friend, but he had never been close with any of them. His sister was a little overprotective when it came to females, and she really didn't have a need to be. He had turned down sex from a beautiful and powerful cage for crying out loud, he thought she'd understand that he wasn't only interested in casual and meaningless pleasure. He decided to forget about his Nichan's mission to preserve his virginity and bring his mind back to where it was supposed to be. His sage dust techniques were devastating when used offensively, which was why he liked them so much. But lately, he thought it was possible to do more than just kill with them. It was only speculation, but he had learned that he was capable of anything when he put his mind to it. And there was his conclusion that with every one of his unique gifts, there was a different way of using them. He knew he was missing something every time he used his Senen abilities, and he had recently decided that it was time to look into it. Usually, he would be more than excited to develop new forms of Senjutsu, but with the difficulty in which it was to even contemplate what he thought may be possible. It was less than appealing. It was like the word you can't remember that's on the tip of your tongue, except in his case the word didn't exist yet, so his frustration was understandable. He had even resorted to asking his inner demon for a few pointers. That had turned out to be a waste of time. Even the great and powerful Kaiubi no Kitsune was totally lost when it came to his complex and ridiculously exclusive innate talents. The powerful fox had lived for thousands of years, and he had never heard of anyone, not even the Rakuto Senen himself, who could manipulate natural energy with the same skill as the young Uzumaki. In theory, it should be impossible to add form to the world's chakra, it being the world's chakra and all. It was almost as absurd as adding form to another person's chakra while it was still inside them, which was as crazy as it sounded. Natural energy was exactly the same thing. People could take their opponent's chakra to use for themselves, but never add shape to it before even extracting it. It was not physically or theoretically possible, yet the ex Anbu operative was doing just that. The little brat was doing the impossible again, which irritated and pleased the powerful chakra entity. The others didn't even bother to try and help him. Without some kind of guide it was close to impossible to do what he was attempting, but that's what would make it all the more sweeter when he accomplished it. At the moment though, it was the most annoying thing he had ever gone through. The best way he could describe what he thought about it was that he saw his sage dust techniques as a number line. When he called fourth Bishaman, for example, he would go from zero to positive six. The positive side represented the destructive prowess. The negative side however, was what he was trying to figure out. He had no idea how to go from zero to a negative number because he still didn't fully understand what the positive side represented. He had just been using the easier side the whole time because it was exactly that easy. If he wasn't so annoyed he would have seen the irony in it. He could understand others and their techniques with almost scary clarity, but when it came to his, he was confused beyond words. So here he was, sitting in a lotus position on the floor in the middle of his room, hoping that he'd strike a thought of brilliance that would solve his little problem. This was honestly the only method he had left, having tried everything else he could think of. It seemed that unlocking a new and potentially godly form of Sinjutsu wasn't as easy as learning elemental ninjutsu. Who would have known? He had thought that if he sat and poured every ounce of his concentration in it, he'd eventually figure the secret behind natural energy that he had yet to discover. It would be incredibly difficult, but he was determined to acquire it. It was important to him, even more so now that he was no longer in the Anbu. Becoming a Jonin meant that he would have to step up his game if he wanted to keep everyone safe. Other shinobi weren't all like Anbu agents. They didn't automatically know what to do in any and all situations. Jonin were a little easier to deal with because if they had gained the rank, then they did know what to do in most situations and could, for the most part, take care of themselves. It was the Jonin and Chunin that Naruto was worried about. Now that he was a regular Jonin well, not exactly regular he'd have to lead teams of the lower rank ninja of the village. That meant that he was responsible for teaching them the right way of doing something and keeping them alive. He had lead multiple Anbu into suicide missions and came out unscathed, but that was with extremely well-trained men and women, not green shinobi. He considered Chunin green as well, the rank given to those who had little more experience than the low-ranking genin. It was harsh, but the truth nonetheless. In all honesty, Naruto was nervous. 
He had never lost a teammate besides Itachi, who was taken from him, not lost and didn't ever wish to. With non-Anbu Shinobi, it would increase the likeliness of that fear. Finally, something the godchild was afraid of. Sighing in annoyance, he stood from his position on the floor, unable again to accomplish anything. He really disliked not being able to do something he wanted. Was this how everyone else felt? That thought actually brought a smile to his face. He had found something that made him normal irritation due to his inability to complete a task. He was finally like regular people. Flawed. He stretched his back, receiving a grateful pop in return, and headed for the kitchen. He had been meditating for a good hour, and he still hadn't eaten anything. When he got to the living room he felt a presence at the door. He hadn't thanked Hate for allowing him to live with the two of them for the time being yet. When the brown-haired Takibetsu Jonin entered his apartment, he was greeted by his newest house guest. Hate san Naruto greeted politely. He had always showed the man respect for being so good to his sister. When he had first met the man he had checked him thoroughly for any questionable intentions. When he found nothing but genuine love for the Kanoichi, he was more than willing to give him a chance. Yuga really loved him as well, so he owed it to her to try and forge a friendship with her lover, which he had. Naruto and Hate were as close as a little brother could be with his older sister's boyfriend. Ah, Naruto-san, you're already back from your mission. Hate asked. He had thought it would be a few more days until he got to see the blonde again. I guess that means you know what Hokage-sama has ordered then. He said somewhat cautiously. He didn't want to accidentally tell the boy something that he didn't know yet, but him being in his apartment meant that he most likely knew already. Yeah. I got back a few hours ago. The blonde replied. Hokage Jiji told me right when I returned. Let it be known that Saratobi Hiruzen was not a procrastinator. Hei gave Naruto a small smile, followed by a cough as he joined him in the kitchen. I saw your entry in the bingo book. The things his girlfriend surrogate little brother accomplished always amazed the ever-coughing shinobi. That was an awful lot of information, don't you think? He asked. Naruto clenched his fists. Yeah, too much. He replied. He knew that Hate was an intelligent man, so for him to think something was up wasn't much of a surprise to him. Does the Hokage think it was a traitor? He asked curiously, followed by another short cough. Naruto knew that he could speak with Hate a little more openly than others. He was a good and loyal Kanohanin and had the trust of his most precious person. It must be. The Yuzumaki informed. Most of that information was classified as Hokage eyes only. The other half required a high level of clearance to attain. If it wasn't a traitor, then someone out there is a better spy than Jiraiya sensei. Hey, chuckled at that statement. There was no one better at what Jiraiya did except maybe Naruto himself. That had left only one conclusion. So yes, we have a traitor amongst us. Naruto was angry for being betrayed by a fellow Konohanin, but most of all he was hurt. He had spent the bulk of his young life fighting for his people. For one of them to do something like this brought pain to his heart. His people were his everything. Without them, he would be lost. Hey, sighed. He noticed his soon-to-be brother-in-law's hurt and angry expression. It was not often that someone was able to see the real Naruto. He was usually a wise and powerful shinobi, but if you were someone he considered close, then you were privileged with getting to see underneath his monster persona. Hey, it took a second to feel honored that the Kamikage was comfortable enough with him to show him his other side. Enough with this traitor talk. The brown-haired man declared. Are you hungry? Naruto appreciated the change in topic and opened his mouth to speak, but was cut off by the sound of his stomach growling. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck and looked sheepish. Yeah, I guess I am. The two shinobi were quiet for a moment before they burst into laughter. Even in difficult times, one could always find an escape and a friend. When Yugao got home that night, she was welcomed with the sight of her two favorite men eating dinner together, talking with one another like they were great friends, just the way she liked it. She decided she could wait and interrogate Naruto about what happened after he left Shishaya's with Anko later. Now was the time to relax and forget about all of their worries. Naruto was tired. After their family-like meal together, Yugao had taken Naruto into his room and proceeded to question him on his day's events after leaving with Anko. He had been a little annoyed but complied nonetheless. His Nichan was someone important to him, so if he had to deal with her overbearing protection of his innocence, which was the most absurd thing he had ever heard come from her mouth, seeing as it was too late in most meanings of the word then he would. He was still very much a virgin, but innocent was the last thing he'd call himself. It had taken him an entire half hour of explaining his slightly awkward conversation with the snake mistress, and then another two hours convincing the woman that he had in no way, shape or form, had any kind of intimate relations with her friend. He honestly began to think that it would be better if he actually did take up some of the women's offers to mess around with them if Yuga wouldn't believe him when he actually did nothing. It wouldn't be as annoying and he would at least get something out of it instead of suffering through the extended interrogations for doing nothing wrong. It wouldn't be wrong in the first place, but that was a moot point apparently. 
He had woken up after getting only a few hours of sleep and immediately dressed himself in his new Jonin gear. Gone was his Anbu uniform, and in its place was a standard Kanoha Jonin flak jacket over a long sleeved black shirt, the right sleeve being completely burnt orange. He wore black shinobi pants and sandals with a black cloth Kanoha hit I-8. He was never able to wear his forehead protector much when he was a member of the zoo which he had stopped calling the core years ago, and he was excited to start. Representing his village felt good. He was by no means awake, but at least it wasn't all bad. He had made it to the Hokage Tower and started to make his way up the stairs to his Jiji's office. He was aware of all the surprised looks he had gotten while he walked from his home to the leader's place of command. Even the people in the tower looked at him strangely, which was weird for him, since they acted like this was the first time he had entered the building, which is Naruto, it was. He could feel their minds clearly, apparently word of Uzumaki Naruto being Nizumi the Kamikage had spread faster than he thought it would. It just reminded him of how annoyed he was at being betrayed. Naruto reached for the door but paused before he entered. He could feel the minds of the people inside. Hiruzen was annoyed and a little upset. The majority of the others in the Hokage's office were not happy. Most of them had feelings of disgust. And some were even angry at Hiruzen himself. Naruto didn't like that at all. His Jiji was to be respected at all times, failure to show that respect automatically made the sinner an enemy of the bringer of hope. He steeled himself and opened the door, causing all eyes to gravitate to him. If he was a lesser man he would have been incredibly nervous. He just so happened to be the most powerful shinobi in Kanoha though, and right now he had the feeling that he needed to show it. The blonde walked right past the irritated crowd and stood to the right of Hiruzen, where he deserved to be. Okage-sama. He greeted formally, deciding to show the others how one should properly treat the god of shinobi. He wanted the world to know that his Jiji was still a powerful cage, and having the famous bringer of hope bow to him was a great way to show it. He never really enjoyed using his popularity all that much, but for his Hokage, he would do anything. It was never a task too difficult for him. When the Lord Third spoke, his words were absolute. Naruto-kun. Hiruzen began, making sure to express his thankfulness at the obvious show of loyalty and respect through his feelings. Just the person we were talking about. It was painfully clear that he was the discussion in the now very cramped room. He just didn't know what it was they were speaking about. I see. Naruto replied. And what would that be about? He asked. He had a feeling that this might happen, just not so soon. The minds of the ninja present told him all he needed to know. The Hokage lit his tobacco pipe before he answered. The accumulated jonin do not believe you to be former Anbu operative Nizumi and have expressed their feelings of you being incompetent. Naruto could feel his surrogate grandfather's amusement. Apparently the aged warrior felt it was just as funny as he did. Ah, I see. The blonde replied. Why is that? He directed his question to the shinobi instead of his leader. The random jonin he knew to be named Kazuo was the first to express his concerns in a completely appropriate and adult-like manner. Because there's no way a brat like you could be the bringer of hope, that's why, demon boy. Like he said, completely professional. The man was extremely lucky that he was a loyal Kanohanin, because if he wasn't, he would no longer take breath from this world. It was strange because most of the shinobi force knew that he was not the Kaiubi and didn't want to purposely treat him like garbage. To be among so many who felt he was nothing but a puppet for a supposed demon was a little disheartening. 1. I am the Jinchuriki of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, which is in my bingo book entry. Naruto began. 2. I match the description of Nizumi perfectly. This really was a waste of his time. 3. Demon is not a suitable word to describe me, the correct term you're looking for is monster. He disliked ignorant people with all of his being. 4. Had a Kakashi, a respected Jonin who's about to enter the room, can vouch that I am in fact who I say I am. Everyone decided to turn to the door, and sure enough, the aforementioned silver-haired man walked through, late as usual, little orange book in hand. As he entered the room, he stopped before he made it to his favored spot to look at everyone staring at him. Yo. He greeted coolly. It irritated most present that he barely lifted his eyes from his smut long enough to say the single word hello. The man was shameless. Attic. Kazuo shouted, getting the attention of the famed Sharingan no Kakashi. Is this Yuzumaki Naruto really the bringer of hope? He asked. It was clear that the man was not a fan of the blondes. Kurama most likely killed someone close to him 12 years ago. Still, the man was an idiot for blaming it on him. Kakashi gave the man an eye smile only he was capable of giving. Yup. Naruto-kun is Nizumi Kohai. Would you even have to ask? It was kind of pointless after all. The Hokage had said as much, that should have been enough. Do you doubt the Lord Hokage, Kazuo-san? He asked in a polite but somehow threatening way. Kakashi was right behind Naruto in being the most loyal shinobi in the village. I know, of course not. He tried to say quickly. It's just really hard to believe. Perhaps a demonstration is required. Hiruzen suggested. 
Naruto smirked. This sounded like fun. What did you have in mind, Hokage-sama? The Uzumaki asked. He had hoped that his Jiji would give him the chance to prove himself in front of everyone. Without something mind-blowing to showcase his abilities, he would never be accepted as a Jonin of Konoha, Kamikage or not. His leader's mind pleased the boy. That would definitely suffice. The duel. Hiruzen began. Five of my most powerful Jonin against you. The incredulous looks on their faces was very amusing. Their thoughts were equally as funny. They thought that was unfair. Ah no, Hokage-sama. A Kanoichi named Mitsu asked for permission to speak. Hiruzen gave it to her. That sounds a little unfair. Oh, the benefits of being underestimated. At least the woman wasn't some obnoxious ignorant fool with a Kaiubi vendetta. I'm glad you brought that up, Mitsu-chan. The Sandame took another drag from his pipe. It would indeed be unfair. Here, he gave a smirk that made Naruto proud to be under his command. So, I have decided that Naruto-kun will take them on all at once, their disbelief was palpable, blindfolded. What the hell was the Hokage thinking? And with both hands tied behind his back. He continued. That should make it a little fairer don't you think, Naruto-kun? As you wish, Hokage-sama. He replied. Without all of the handicaps it would indeed be unfair. For the five jonin. You can't be serious, Hokage-sama. Kazuo yelled, earning a death glare from Naruto. I am, and that is the end of it. He announced in his powerful Hokage voice. Naruto was always telling him that he needed to use it more so he could show the people who doubted his ability to lead that he was still the man who had protected Konoha for many, many years. The duel will begin in an hour at the stadium. But that said, the Hokage dismissed everyone, including Naruto, to get ready for Yuzumaki Naruto's debut into the Jonin ranks. Ada Kakashi, Midarashi Anko, Mido Gai, Saratobi Asuma, and Yuhi Kurenai stood side by side in Kanoha Stadium, waiting for their opponent to arrive. They had all been summoned to the Hokage's office an hour ago. Hiruzen had explained to them what they were chosen to do, and most of them were a little less than eager to follow orders. Kakashi knew better than anyone how powerful Naruto was, and he wasn't going to underestimate him like he knew, at the very least, one of his comrades was going to do. Anko had never seen the boy in action, but she knew of his accomplishments. The only person strong enough to be the Hokage out of the five of them was Kakashi, and by the way he held himself, it looked like he was preparing to fight the fourth shinobi world war, not alone 15-year-old. She wasn't going to hold back if he wasn't. I was pumped and ready for anything. He doubted that one boy, even the bringer of hope, could defeat all five of them, but decided to test the boy's flames of youth. Asuma was a little irritated. He really didn't want to have to fight the Kamikage. Not because he was scared, but because he had better things to do. He and Kurenai had planned to spend the day together, and now that was ruined because his father. Kurenai was a little nervous. Naruto was one of the things Yugao talked about at Shishaya's after Anko had spirited him away. The Anbu woman confirmed that everything they'd ever heard about the Kamikage was true. He did have a power that surpassed even the five cage. Now she had to fight him, and if she was totally honest, she had little desire to. So what are the handicaps Hokage-sama mentioned? Anko asked. The Lord Third had told Kakashi to explain the rules when they arrived at the stadium. They all applied in Arudo-kun. He revealed, somewhat shocking Guy and Asuma. The first is that we will be taking him on together, all at once. The look Guy gave him was priceless. Does he truly want us to kill the boy the Blue Beast of Kanoha asked. Even one at a time was far-fetched. He wants us to have a chance. He replied. The seriousness in his voice unnerved the Tejutsu specialist. The second handicap is that he'll be blindfolded. Okay, that's just ridiculous. Asuma said. What the hell is my dad thinking? He knew his father was a wise man, even if he would never say it out loud, so he couldn't understand why he would do something so foolish. I've had a hand in training Naruto-kun. Kakashi began. So trust me when I say we need all the help the Lord Third is giving us. It was true. Kakashi was Naruto's first sensei when he joined the Anbu all those years ago. When he was Inu, he had witnessed a child do things no man should be able to accomplish, and he did it with ease. So Kakashi knew that, better than anyone else, they would most likely lose this fight. It was simple logic, really. Five high-ranking jonin versus one godlike monster. The monster would win every time. Naruto would win every time. It was something the perverted scarecrow was proud of his kohai for. He never gave up and he never lost. Ever. He was Konoha's ace and would one day change his lady for the better once he came to command her. And the third handicap? Kurenai asked, somewhat hesitantly. She could only imagine the ridiculousness of the next one. What, was he going to fight them with his hands tied behind his back? Both of his hands will be tied behind his back. Kakashi informed them. Kurenai wasn't the only one to pause for a moment to process the information they were just given. Was Haddock being serious? 
taking on five powerful jonin while blindfolded was already suicide, but doing it without his arms just spelled disaster. The Hokage must really be on a good one if he was okay with these conditions. Kakashi was the only one to know that it was the Hokage who made them. Anko was internally torn. She had always wanted to see the bringer of hope in action, and she was about to get the chance to see it right now. However, being one of the people to fight him was a little terrifying. It obviously wasn't going to end in any deaths, but even knowing that she was still a little scared. Before anyone could say anything about what Kakashi had revealed, the blonde they were supposed to fight shunshined, body flickered into the stadium, his blindfold on and arms tied behind him. How he even managed to make his way to them like that surprised them. The Hokage soon followed, appearing in the cages box with Nico and Seru. It was time to address the people. Jonin and Anbu of Konoha, I welcome you to the Jonin test of one Uzumaki Naruto, the bringer of hope, and my shadow. It was still silent, but Naruto was able to feel all of the excitement in the air. The test is simple, he must fight five Jonin at once while blindfolded and without the use of his arms. At this, the Jonin gathered broke into chatter amongst one another. Here is in continued. If Uzumaki Naruto wins, he will be an official Jonin of Kanahagakur no Sado. If he loses, he will be made a Jonin. The Hokage took his seat. You may begin. Azuo took this time to put the blonde down. Everyone that has shown up has come to watch real Jonin fight. He started. But it doesn't look like anyone showed up to support you. The man had no idea who he was talking to. It was time to show him who he was. My supporters are just a little more secretive, is all. Naruto said with a smirk on his face. He felt the man's confusion, so he decided to show him instead of explaining it. Comrades. He shouted. Make yourselves known. With that one order, the hundreds of Anbu who had spread throughout the stadium exited the shadows, covering most of the giant arena's inside walls. Kazuo's eyes widened and the shock he felt was easy to spot. Wah what the hell the jonin stuttered out. There was more Anbu present at this moment than anyone had ever seen congregate in one spot ever. Naruto stared right into Kazuo's eyes from beneath a blindfold as he next spoke. Anbu, who are you here to see? There was a moment of silence before the entirety of the gathered zoo, including Niko and Seru, answered as one. Izumi Taicho. The stadium echoed with the voices of the Black Ops. Who am I? The blonde asked, never taking his covered eyes off the rude and soon to be embarrassed Jonin. Izumi Taicho. Once again, all of the Anbu spoke as a single unit. Naruto gave a monster smile. Who's going to win? Izumi Taicho. This was shouted louder than the first two. When Kakashi raised his hit IA to reveal his Sharingan, Gai, Asuma, Anko, and Kurinai developed ready stances. Naruto almost jumped for joy, it was time to step out of the shadows. Let's get wild. Anzo had heard about the duel between Yuzumaki Naruto, the Kamikage, against five Jonin who were powerful in their own right. Be it Tajutsu, Ninjutsu, Jinjutsu, or a mixture of all three, each of the Jonin the boy was about to fight were considered specialists. He had arrived minutes before it started, taking a seat in the cage box with his old friend and leader. Willingly putting himself so close to Naruto was a mistake. The Yuzumaki could now feel the man's mind. He had found his traitor. It momentarily angered him that he couldn't do anything about it yet, since he had already decided to have Sasuke help destroy the man who took someone, or in Sasuke's case everyone, away from them. Anzo really made a terrible call going against the Hokage with the Ichiha affair. He and Naruto were a lot alike, they could have benefited from each other. That was impossible now though. He had already incurred the wrath of God and his warrior angel. Naruto shook the thoughts of the crippled man from his mind, it was time to show Kanoha there was a new top dog amongst the Jonin. Akashi wasted no time in going for the kill shot. The moment the Hokage had told them to start, he had went through the required hand seals to create his one original technique. The sound of thousands of chirping birds rang out in the stadium. I had been disappointed in his longtime rival when he saw the assassination technique come to life. This was a duel against a fellow Kanoha shinobi and a child at that. For Kakashi to be willing to use that much force caused the green-clad jonin to pause. His first mistake. Naruto smirked. It was time to show his temporary enemies it was bad for their health to hold back. With speed that put Guy to shame, Naruto's foot dug into the spandex-wearing man's stomach, blasting him into the arena wall. One. Before he had even dropped to the ground, Kakashi had raced after his kohai, aiming his powerful technique at his head. He was met by nothing but air. A scream from Kakashi's right caused him to turn his head, getting a glimpse at Kurinai receiving a knee to the side. The woman had tried to cast at least three sound-induced jinjutsu, but for reasons unknown to her, the boy seemed to be immune. The crashing sound signaled the loss of Kurinai from the battle. Do. Alright, soldier boy, let's see you dodge this. Anko yelled, already foregoing her nervousness for the thrill of a good fight. She brought her right arm up, calling forth one of her special skillsets. Senajashu, hidden shadow snake hands. From her coat shot the snake she got her moniker from. 
the hissing creatures raced at the blonde with commendable speeds. It might have actually worked too if he wasn't one of the fastest shinobi in the elemental nations. He hadn't tested his speed against the infamously fast rakage, but he was almost certain that the bulky man could not match his pace. Vanishing from sight, Anko heard Asuma yell, above you. The boy's leg was positioned to slam a powerful axe kick into the snake user, but had to abandon that tactic when his Jiji son shot a fireball at him. Katen. Gakaku no Jutsu, fire release. Great fireball technique. Asuma yelled before he sent the powerful Jutsu at his opponent. He was really close in taking out Anko there, and they apparently needed all the manpower they had left. The kid was blindfolded and practically harmless, what the hell was happening here? The moment the flame stopped leaving his mouth, Naruto was out of sight again. All he heard was Anko shouting, behind you. Before being slammed into a wall, courtesy of Naruto's foot. 3. Suddenly, the ground lit up in flames when Kakashi called his next jutsu forth. Katen. Hibashiri, fire release. Running fire. Fire encircled the boy, trapping him within its confines. Anko took the opportunity to throw three kunai down on the boy, each having ninja wire attached to them. Snake, dragon, rabbit, tiger, Hain. Ryuka no jutsu, fire release. Dragon fire technique. The ninja wire was alit with chakra laced fire, shooting at the blonde inside the circle of flame. That's when Kakashi remembered his Kohai's incredible control over a particular jutsu. Wait. It's a cage bunshin. He yelled, but the smirk on Naruto's face declared it was too late. The ex Anbu mouthed boom before the explosive clone detonated, pushing Anko and Kakashi backwards. It didn't do anything but bruise the two Jonin, but it still hurt. What the hell do you mean? His hands are tied behind his back, he can't create Bunshin. Anko yelled accusingly. Naruto has ridiculously advanced control over Bunshin. Kakashi admitted. He no longer requires hand seals, he just wills them into existence. The very thought made Anko's head spin. To be able to use any technique without the help of hand seals was unheard of, unless they didn't require any in the first place. They helped mold the physical and spiritual energies from within, bringing the jutsu to life in the world. In the small moment it took her to think about Naruto's prowess, the boy himself had shunshined, body flickered behind her, kicking her in the back just hard enough to incapacitate her and not do any serious damage. 4. Before he could focus his attention on his former sensei, Naruto had to bend backwards, missing the dynamic entry aimed at his head by centimeters. Mido Guy was almost as powerful as Kakashi, it would take more than a single kick to take him out of the game. Naruto had hoped for that to be true. How can he see our moves, Kakashi? Guy asked, fully serious now that it was only him and his rival left. The unnerving thing about it all was the fact that the boy hadn't even broken a sweat. He's the greatest sensor ever born. Kakashi answered quickly from his position. Even without his eyes, he sees more than we do. Gureya had said that one's threat perception increased once in sage mode, but what his godson was doing, once again, took it into a whole other league. He was capable of seeing the world without the need of sight, and had even said he could see better that way. What should we do? He was now willing to up his game. Bring everything you've got down on him. The copy nin replied. We won't even come close to killing him, but we might be able to lose with some dignity. Shinobi 101. If you're going down, take as many bastards as you can with you. I nodded. If Kakashi was positive that they wouldn't hurt him, then there was no need to hold back. Naruto felt several increases in his senpai's rival, announcing that he was opening the eight gates within him. Mido Guy was extremely unconventional and could come off as somewhat slow in the head, but he wasn't given the title of Jonin for his upbeat attitude and everything youthful. He and Hiruzen knew that Guy was the greatest jutsu master in the nation. The Hokage had compared him to only one other person, the Reikage. Kumo's leader used chakra flow to create an intojutsu, so he was considered more powerful. Heyman. Kai, gate of opening. Naruto always found it interesting when someone opened the inner gates. He could feel the person's chakra flood their tenketsu, no longer being held back by the human body's limiters. Hyman. Kai, gate of healing. Ah, the man might just be smarter than he looks. Seiman. Kai, gate of life. Naruto was getting excited now. Shoman. Kai, gate of pain. With that last limiter opened, the green spandex clad man was officially a few shades redder than any normal person should be, not that Naruto could actually see it, and his presence was the second largest on the field now. So you opened a few of the Hachiman, eight gates, have you? Guy was silent, just waiting for the perfect opportunity to begin his assault. Let's play then. What are you waiting for? Naruto knew exactly what he was waiting for. Kakashi may have suppressed his chakra to the absolute minuscule amount it could go, but nothing was ever too small for him not to notice. Guy shot off from his spot in the field with speeds most people couldn't keep up with, intent on driving a powerful fist into the boy's head. His fist got so close he felt the blonde's breath. When he thought he had him, Naruto jumped into the air, allowing Kakashi to drive his rakiri at him. 
Guy had planned on it missing and was positioned so that he could jump at the boy to meet his rival for a combination attack. Naruto was impressed, their teamwork was amazing. When no words needed to be spoken, that meant the team was truly powerful. There were a few ways how he could handle this seemingly inescapable position, but decided to give one of his newer, more amusing skills a go. He had been given a high Uga who didn't have a stick up her ass for Team Ro a year ago, and after they became friends, Yuma had taught him the high Uga way of projecting chakra from various places. After a few hours messing around with the idea, he had come up with one of the coolest things he'd ever created. An enhanced fist from Guy and a lightning cutter from Kakashi were seconds away from impaling the boy when he opened his mouth. Kakashi's Sharingan picked up the small details the rest of the world overlooked and was able to see his Kohai's tongue touching the roof of his mouth. Great, he was going to take the win and their dignity from them with this one. Naruto clicked his tongue, the pent-up natural energy he forced there exploding, causing a powerful blast that sent the two jonin flying into the walls of the stadium, officially ending the duel. 5. Naruto had, for the past three years, been creating strange and new ways to use his powers. Many shinobi were forced to retire when they lost a limb, and the blonde wanted to have a backup plan, just in case he was crippled. Now, three years later, Naruto could kill a man in so many unique and unheard of ways that it was almost freaky. The blast of natural energy from his tongue just now was on a scaled down level. Used at full strength, it had the ability to both repel attacks and cripple multiple targets, indefinitely. It was his answer to the high Uga main branches Haki Shokaten, a trigram's palms revolving heaven. Yuma was impressed when he showed her the technique, and a little envious that he was able to create a better version of the high Uga self-proclaimed ultimate defense in only a few hours when it took her three months to learn the original. The Jonin who had showed up to watch stayed silent, unable to understand what they had just seen. The Yuzumaki had taken out five of Konoha's most famous Jonin, and he did it severely handicapped. The legend of the Kamikage was no longer just a myth. It was a little scary that he was just as the story said, invincible, or so it seemed. The Anbu stayed silent as well, but not because they were shocked, but because they knew the outcome before the test even started. Anbu had undying loyalty and respect for their former captain, and even though he was no longer with the Corps, he'd always be able to command them, just like with Inu Taicho. They were the greatest Anbu operatives ever, and they would be shown the proper respect by all Anbu, future and past. Once an Anbu, always an Anbu, and Naruto could feel this in them. The entire Black Ops division was forever and always his family. His bindings were cast aside and the blindfold taken off. He took in a deep breath before he began. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto. The men and women paid close attention. I've been called the bringer of hope, the kamikage, a hero, here he smirked, a monster. Some of the shinobi gave a dry chuckle at that one. But there is no reason to treat me like a demon. I have full control of my biju, it is no longer a threat to Konoha. I know many of you lost loved ones to the Kaiubi, but instead of trying to take your emotional anguish out on me, you all should be helping me use the creature to help Kanoha. He knew that the Biju were misunderstood and because of that were imprisoned, but he needed to play off the emotions of the crowd. Revealing he had made the Kaiubi no Kitsune his friend would be counterproductive. I serve the Hokage. I've defended our village from the shadows for eight years. The blonde continued. I would happily die for our home, as I know all of you would. He could feel the people begin to accept his words. I will be the first to admit that I am a monster. He brought his arms in the air to emphasize his surroundings. But I am Kanoha's monster. The people actually like that idea. I am a warrior of our god and I protect our village, our heaven, with all the strength I have. He smirked again. And I'm incredibly strong, so for as long as I still breathe, Kanoha will never fall. His fellow shinobi cheered loudly, the boy's words striking a chord with them. They had initially been reluctant about accepting the village pariah into their ranks, but after seeing a small glimpse of his ability, coupled with his genuine want to protect Kanoha and her people, most of them were more than satisfied with the idea. The personal monster to let loose on any enemy that was foolish enough to attack sounded spectacular. The boy was a patriot, just like everyone else. I stand before you all today, giving you my word. Naruto began. I will be your monster. That had done it. He was now officially a part of the Jonin ranks. Risking a glance at Kazuo, he was thrilled that the man sighed in defeat, smirked, and then nodded his approval. Naruto had convinced him that he, at the very least, deserved a chance. The Lord Third smiled, his Hokage hat tipped so that his face was hidden from view. He knew his shadow could do it. He had earned his Jonin status. Chapter 9 Assignments I have no idea how to teach Jonin. And I have no idea how to lead Chunin. Even working with Jonin is foreign to me. I think that's why the Lord Hokage gave me this assignment. It's time to keep my perfect completion record and make a few friends along the way. I really hope I can wake up soon, too. It's getting harder and harder to suppress the monster. 
And when he comes out, it better be an enemy that's in front of me, or God help the poor soul unfortunate enough to be in my sights. I still have time, I just don't know how much. The Jonin test had worked spectacularly. Naruto had gained the respect from the Jonin of Konoha and kept the already present bond with the Anbu. He still needed to prove himself, but he had at least got a chance to do so. He had their respect, now he had to keep it. After the duel was over, Hiruzen and his shadow had retreated back to the Hokage office. Well done, Naruto-kun. Hiruzen complimented the blonde. The Lord Third knew the outcome before the test even began, and he expected nothing less from his top shinobi, but it never hurt to compliment someone who was like family. It was a small, almost unimpressive victory considering who he was, but Hiruzen wanted Naruto to know that he cared about him more than a tool. He was not like his cold-hearted rival, he loved all of Konoha's citizens, shinobi included. Speaking of the old warhawk. Jiji, I've uncovered them all. Naruto said suddenly, causing the Hokage to become serious and narrow his eyes. He stayed silent, already knowing that Naruto knew to continue. It was Shimura Danzo. He revealed, causing his grandfatherly figure to sigh. Of course it was. Hiruzen trailed off. If the old Saratobi was honest, he kind of figured as much. His old rival was granted access, among others, to Naruto's Anbu profile when it became publicly known that the Kamikage existed. The village elders didn't pull stunts like leaking information, so Hiruzen had crossed his former teammates off the list. Nara Shikaku, Kanoha's Jonin commander and head of the Nara clan, was too smart to ever cross the god of Shinobi, so he too was off the list. The Kashi always had access to anything he wanted about Naruto, unless it was classified as Hokage's eyes only, but he was practically the boy's older brother, so he was never even on the list. Yugao was in the same boat with Kakashi. She'd never purposefully sabotage his Anbu career. Her lover, Hade, would have been discovered before the incident even happened if he was the mole, being around the Uzumaki so much. Ayuga Hiyashi knew Naruto was the bringer of hope, but he respected the boy more than any other ninja in the village for what he had done for his daughter, so Hiruzen highly doubted that it was the Hyuga clan head. All of Rohan was exempt as well. If there was someone in his own team that was capable of doing this to him, they would have been sniffed out before they had the chance. But if they were a part of Team Ro and they did try and sabotage his career, Hiruzen just might have promoted the operative. It would take balls of steel to defy their captain. That only really left Danzo. The Foundation's leader was the only man alive who knew enough about Hiruzen's shadow to know that he was the most deadly shinobi alive and still act against him. The thing that ticked the aged Hokage off the most was that the man probably thought that he was doing him a favor. Anzo had, on many occasions, expressed his thoughts on how fear gained respect. If the other villages feared Konoha, they'd be forced to obey. He had successfully created Konoha's own little bujimin to scare the nations into obedience by leaking the information on Naruto. It was a tactic all of the villages used, but he had acted on his own again, and intentionally or unintentionally it didn't really matter ruin Naruto's life in one way or another. Again. The man just kept digging a bigger grave all the time. Do you wish to take action? Hiruzen continued, somewhat hesitantly. He knew of Naruto's desire to have Sasuke help him take the old man's life and didn't really have anything against it, but couldn't tell if the blonde could take any more of Danzo's radical moves. No. Naruto replied quickly. Sasuke deserves to help with that scum's end. Naruto smirked, dying at the hands of an Achiha. such poetic justice was appealing to the Jinchuriki. I can wait for as long as it takes. He continued. This actually works out to my advantage. He chuckled. Hiruzen raised an eyebrow. Oh. Please, do tell. This ought to be good. Anzo just gave me a legitimate excuse to help Sasuke become strong enough to kill him faster. He chuckled again. He's helping me kill him. The irony was almost too much to handle. I guess you have a point. The Sandame replied. He didn't necessarily disapprove of Naruto's decision to kill his old rival, but that didn't mean he had to enjoy it as much as the boy did. He never judged his shadow, but he didn't always share his interests. It was hard to understand the way a monster fought, after all. If it was anyone else who actually smiled at the thought of killing another Konohanin, Hiruzen would have them evaluated and then thrown into prison. Naruto, however, was the one exception. He wore the title of monster proudly on his chest, never hiding what he was. There were no secrets between the two, either. Hiruzen knew everything the blonde thought and felt. The Lord Third was so confident in the boy that he was already selected to become the acting Hokage if anything ever happened to him. And the fact that his shadow never did anything without the Hokage's permission was also a factor. If Hiruzen told him no, he would not act against his leader. He had absolute control over the Jinchuriki, and it made the Yuzumaki respect him even more that he wasn't treated like a slave. He actually had a say in what he did or didn't do. So, what now, Jiji? Naruto asked, eager to know what he was going to be assigned to as a Jonin. Do I get to let Jenin, Chunin, or Jonin now? 
He had absolutely no idea what he was going to do outside of Anbu, but he decided that he might as well give it a shot and be as optimistic about it as possible. Garrison smirked, bringing his pipe up to his mouth. Oh, I have the perfect assignments for you, Naruto-kun. Naruto narrowed his eyes. His Jiji had a distinctive mischievous feeling about him, and the blonde didn't like it one bit. Which is? He asked after the old man didn't reply. You will be given your assignments tomorrow, Jonin Yuzumaki. Now leave my office, I have paperwork to get to. Naruto growled at his commander, half playfully, half annoyed, but did as he was told. The Saratobi was up to something, and Naruto was not looking forward to the answer he would be receiving tomorrow. He could only hope it wasn't totally horrible. Garizin chuckled to himself quietly when he knew Naruto was a decent distance away. His assignment wasn't actually all that bad, but he had wanted the boy to think it would be. Let it be known that Saratobi Hiruzen could still pull one over on the bringer of hope. Naruto was a bit annoyed with his Hokage's sudden tight-lipped attitude. The aged warrior was the only person alive who could keep anything away from him. It only applied to matters that were of minuscule importance, so he never got too worked up about it, but it still got on his nerves a little. When he left the Hokage's office, Naruto had taken up to walking around Kanoha's Tea Avenue. While in the Anbu he had little time to appreciate a lot of the village because of his busy schedule. Now, finally with some downtime, which he considered the Jonin rank as, he was able to check out some of the shops in his home. He had already been to Ichiraku Raymond, the greatest restaurant known to man in his opinion, before he joined the Black Ops, and it was still his favorite, but he wanted to try something different. He had at least been to Shishaya's and knew of the kind of food they sold there. He had never seen such large plates in his life. The blonde really wanted to go there again and actually eat this time. He'd make Yuga treat him there next time he did something worth a meal. He was currently heading to a place called Amaguriyama, a sweet shop in the heart of the tea avenue. He was told by Yuma and Yasagi that they sold Kanoha's best curry zenzai. He had never tried chestnuts and a sweet bean paste soup made from crushed red beans before, but he was eager to try it out. Most children loved sweets and the like, but with his mature mind and knowledge of healthy eating, he had skipped the entire candy phase and went right into the eating for a better self phase. Both Kakashi and Yuga were always telling him that he needed to act more his age and try out new younger people things. What's more young teen than buying sweets? Amaguriyama was close, and the smells throughout the tea avenue were amazing. Nothing smelled bad or bitter, nothing smelled like blood or death, and it was wonderful to get away from it all, he realized. From this day forth, whenever he thought about peaceful times, he would remember this enticing aroma. This is what peace smelt like, if anything. Before he reached the sweet shop however, he felt them. They were calling out to him, asking for him to come. He smiled. He had hoped he could give them a proper goodbye. They all deserved one. With an unseen gesture, Naruto had told them where to meet him. Anbu code was one of the most useful things he had ever learned, right up there with his and his Hokage's secret chakra burst code. No one had even noticed when he shunshined, body flickered, in the middle of the street, fading from the tea avenue like he was never there. It used to surprise his team, his ability to fade away so inconspicuously, but after working with him for so long, they had just chalked it up to something else the boy wonder could do. It only took Naruto five minutes to arrive in training ground 44, his former Anbu team hot on his heels. The Forest of Death was a regular meeting place for Team Ro, it being so secluded from the village made it the perfect place for privacy and secrecy, both very important factors in the life of an Anbu. He settled on the forest floor so that his entire team could look at him. He could feel their minds, most of them were not pleased. Niko, Seru, Yuma, Risu, Ushi, Akami, and Rain suddenly appeared on the branches above him. Niko and Seru had already come to terms with their captain's retirement, not exactly loving the idea, but accepting it nonetheless. He knew the two operatives, especially Niko, wanted nothing more than for him to stay, but respected the decision of their captain and Hokage. When it came to the Anbu Black Ops, emotions were never something expressed all that much. This meant that the blonde had to do all of the talking, i.e. the mushy mush. Niko, I appreciate your acceptance, and I know that you will be a great captain. Niko's heart skipped a beat, making Naruto smile which is why I've recommended you as my successor. He finished happily. His sister was giving off waves of gratitude and respect. Most of the time, when Anbu captains retire, they only announce their successor to the Hokage, letting it be a surprise to their squad. However, in Rohan, Naruto wasn't the only different one. It had been made clear early on in Naruto's command that the entire team hated surprises, so the young Jinchuriki never held his tongue when it came to big, non-classified information. You'll do me proud, I know it. He added before moving on. Seru. Naruto began. You big pervert. He heard the Nara sigh. I think I might even miss you. He chuckled, the only person to laugh at his joke. He had laughed with his team before, but Naruto was a strict captain. When they wore the mask, they were Anbu, nothing more, nothing less. Anbu did not laugh. 
The blonde, however, was no longer in the core, and his mask was no longer a part of him, so he was free to laugh as much as he wanted. Keep supporting your captain with brilliant strategies and never change. He gave a warm smile. You wouldn't be the same if you didn't hit on every woman you come in contact with. Naruto could have sworn he heard Nico snort. And listen to Nico. She may be a bit bossy, he could feel his Nichan's eyes narrow behind her mask, but she'll keep you alive. He looked at the rest of the Anbu. She'll keep you all alive. Yuma, I'll never forget your kindness. He started. Or your willingness to teach me some of the Hyuga's techniques. He really loved his new arsenal of tricks, and it wouldn't have been possible without the horse masked operative. The promise I made to you still counts. He added, reassuring the woman that he would do what he had sworn. The Hyuga main and branch families would be united as one when he became the Hokage, he'd make sure of that. Once he was done, the entire clan would be freed from their cages, no more imprisoned second-class clansmen. He felt the Hyuga woman's mind, she believed anything and everything that came out of his mouth. He next turned to Risu, the only other blonde on the team. The young woman was his Jinjutsu specialist, and a Yamanaka to boot. Risu? He almost huffed. Try and cool it with all the fooling around with men. He really didn't like how dirty the woman's mind could be. When he had joined Rohan he was almost victim to the man-eater until Yugao scared her something fierce. That was one of the times he was glad to have such an annoyingly overprotective sister. There's someone out there who is just waiting to tame you, I'm sure of it. The woman purred underneath her mask at Naruto suggestively before Nico cleared her throat, causing the blonde squirrel mask operative to stand down. Until that man braves that suicide mission though, Nico will be able to keep you in check. He almost felt bad for the woman, her emotions were that of depression. Now she'd never get laid. Naruto had a strange relationship with Ushi. The ox mask operative was a giant of a man, and bald, very bald. The Hokage had placed him on Naruto's team to see if the blonde could handle the handful that was Ushi. He had been placed on six different teams before he was given to Rohan, and it wasn't because he was so amazing and everyone wanted to share. He only listened to people who were physically stronger than him, and even just by looking at the size of his muscles, one could tell that his brute strength was beyond the human norm. It was a good thing that Naruto was ten times stronger than any shinobi in Konoha when he wasn't trying, or he might have had trouble as well. Ushi, Niko is in charge from this point on until you are told otherwise by the Hokage, is that clear? He commanded. The berserker grunted in affirmation, causing Niko to let out a quiet sigh in relief. She hadn't a clue what she would have done with the tank if she was left to give him orders by herself. Apparently her little brother felt her nervousness and, like always, came to the rescue. The Kami was always a relaxed calm person, so when he only showed mild irritation at his captain's forced retirement, Naruto knew that it was his way of stating that he was thoroughly pissed. The Kami, you do the title proud, my friend. The Kami was a man of great honor and loyalty, so for his captain to compare him to that of the Honorable Wolf, he was grateful beyond words. He was lucky that his now former leader didn't need such annoying things as words. Keep my sister safe. He added, knowing full well that after him, the wolf masked man was the strongest of the team. He was the oldest as well, and a skilled swordsman that made Hayate and Nico a little jealous. Akami nodded, taking his words like he would any other order the young shinobi would give him, like he was still his captain. The last person Naruto confronted was Rain. The lion masked man was the most awkward person the Yuzumaki had ever met. He couldn't talk to women at all, unless it was Nico, Risu, or Yuma, and only because Naruto had beaten it into him to communicate with them. It was sad at first to the men of the team he couldn't flirt with a wonderful female species until it became blatantly obvious that the brown-haired man was only interested in other men. Naruto didn't judge, but made it clear where his and the other men's interests were. I hope working under a woman will help you get over your fear of females. He said with a genuine smile. It was a pleasure working with you. He closed his eyes. He could feel his team's hearts. It was a pleasure working with all of you. He finally said, opening his eyes to a sight he always loved looking at. The assembled seven Anbu had their right fist on their hearts, and when he opened his eyes, they brought their fist to the sky, Team Rose personal salute. It conveyed everything their words could not. We will always respect you, Captain. Naruto let a small, genuine smile cross his face before he too brought his fist to his heart before touching the sky with it. As I will respect all of you. He whispered. He knew they heard him, and he knew they didn't care if he practically read their minds. He was the bringer of hope, the Kamikage, he was Nazumi Taicho, and he was the only person alive who they trusted fully with their minds. He had their undying loyalty. And they had his. Naruto cleared his throat. Now. He began in his Anbu voice. Leave. He smirked. Go and protect your village. The seven Anbu stood up straight with a stomp of their feet before simultaneously shouting, Yes sir. And like that, the members of Anbu Unit Rohan disappeared, gone to complete the orders of their captain. He'd always be their leader.
Naruto had gone back to Amaguriyama to try out the curry zenzai and was pleasantly surprised that he actually enjoyed it. He never really ate sweets, but he would definitely come back to try other foods. It was a little awkward for him to walk the streets of Kanoha without his mask. It felt like he was three years old again, just waiting for someone to approach him. No one ever did, but that was beside the point. He was torn again. On one hand, he was happy to be amongst his people, his village, but on the other, he was nervous around them. He did not wish to be rejected, and he most certainly would not allow anyone to beat him again. He was too far past that to continue. If they had a problem, they'd have to take it up with the Hokage. After Amaguriyama, Naruto had gone home to try and figure out what he was missing with his sage dust, but after two hours of fruitless meditation, he had given up and went to bed early. He had nothing else to do, and he was eager to learn the details of his newest assignment. The next day saw him with a few familiar faces in the Hokage's office. Hiruzen had summoned them here for some unknown reason, and Naruto could almost taste the awkwardness in the room. He had hoped that the jonin he fought weren't bitter about their loss, but it seemed like that would be the case. Now that you're all here, the Lord Third began, I can debrief you on what I am assigning to jonin Yuzumaki Naruto. Said Blonde raised an eyebrow. He could faintly feel his Jiji's playfulness towards him, and he had the odd sensation that he had been played somehow. Lord Hokage, why do we have to be present for Naruto-san's assignment? Asked an irritated Asuma. Once again, he was pulled away from time with Kurenai because of his father. Because his assignment involves the four of you. The older Siratobi replied. As you all know, there will be new genin teams formed, and the four of you already know who will be assigned to you. Seeing the understanding nods from his shinobi, Hiruzen continued. All of you have led or have been in teams with genin, chunin, and jonin before. You know how to work with lower rank ninja and how you're supposed to guide them. The Hokage turned to Naruto. Naruto-kun, however, has been in the Anbu Black Ops since he was four and has absolutely no experience with lower rank shinobi. Naruto nodded. So I've decided to attach him to you four. He will rotate between your teams and learn how to properly work with Genin, Chunin, and Jonin. Everyone besides Naruto and Kakashi were surprised. The boy had destroyed them in the duel yesterday, and now the Hokage was saying that he needed to learn from them. All four Jonin turned to the blonde when he cleared his throat. I look forward to learning many great things from all of my senpais. He said politely and gave them all a respectful bow. The Kashi was the first to reply. I can't wait to work with you again, Kohai. He said with an eye smile. Just like old times. He finished, rubbing the top of Naruto's head, gaining a small laugh and smile from his little brother. Yes, senpai. Naruto said. I can't wait. He was genuinely happy to once again be under the copy nin. He may not be as strong as him, but Kakashi still had full authority over him. Hada Kakashi was the Kamikage's captain, and he always would be. The lazy pervert had a godlike 15-year-old at his beck and call. Ikura and I began. I look forward to it as well, Naruto-san. It took her a moment to process that she was going to help train the bringer of hope, but she finally snapped out of her daze and spoke up. She received a smile and a nod from the boy, which strengthened Yugao's claims that her brother was a very humble and kind boy when he wanted to be. Respectful to his subordinates and terrifying to his enemies. It really hurt the Jinjutsu mistress's head when she thought about how complex the boy was. Asuma sighed, but finally relented. I don't know what I could possibly give you. The younger Siratobi began. But I'll try my best to help as well. Naruto could tell that even though he was a little bothered by it, he was truly going to do his best for a fellow Kanohanin. That alone earned him the respect of the Kamikage. Thank you, Asuma-san. Was all that Naruto said to the chain-smoking Jonin. Yash. Yelled the green-clad ninja with a bowl cut. I will help brighten your flames of youth, Naruto-san. Naruto smiled at Guy's antics. He would have a fun time with the Tajutsu specialist that he was absolutely certain. I can't wait, Gai-san. Naruto said with equal gusto. Kakashi shook his head and leaned in real close to his rival. If you put any kind of spandex on my kohai, I'll accident you. The silver-haired man said deathly serious. Understood. He asked, daring the man to say anything but what he wanted to hear. I gulped. I promise, no spandex. Kakashi didn't move a muscle for a good 10 seconds for good measure. After the 10 seconds were over, he gave the man an eye smile like he hadn't just threatened him and nodded. Glad to hear it. He said before pulling away from his friend of many years. Hiruzen chuckled. Why were all of his jonin so strange? Was he like that too when he was young? No, I was normal, I'm normal. He thought to himself smugly. He raised his head to speak with his shinobi. Now that you all know, you are dismissed. He stated as he picked up his pen to get started on his mountain of paperwork. One by one, the jonin walked out of the Hokage's office. When they were down the stairs, the four older shinobi turned to face their newest jonin in arms. How's lunch with your new subordinate sound, Kohai? Kakashi asked, reaching into his back waist pouch to pull out his porn. 
Guy's buying. He added quickly. Guy held his fist to the air. Am the gods for making you so cool and hip, Kakashi. The blue beast roared. Apparently, Kakashi had won their last little competition, and that meant that guy had to pay for the lunch. Naruto shrugged. Sounds good. I was just going to go home and train for the rest of the day, but lunch sounds fine. He smiled when he felt his senpai's mind. Ichirakus it is. The copy nin stated, getting a smile from not only the blonde, but Kurinai as well. Not many people knew that the Jinjutsu specialist liked Ichirakus Raymond as much as he did, but like everyone else, she couldn't hide it from Naruto. He smirked. Yeah, he'd get along just fine with these people. Week 1 Mido Guy. It was the day of the Genin team announcement, and all of the young, freshly minted shinobi were excited to meet their Jonin sensei. Most of the year's academy graduates were from the clans of Konoha, and most of them were the heirs and heiresses of said clans. It looked like a good crop this year, and Naruto was almost as excited as the Genin. Since he could remember, he loved to learn new things. His innate ability to feel every living thing around him made him an extremely curious person, so when he had the chance to learn something new, he always jumped for it. Being attached to four different jonin to observe their teaching methods would most definitely teach him new and different things. What those things were, he had no idea, and he really didn't care. As long as it helped him and his crucible to gain the strength to keep his village safe, he'd learn them. The rotation schedule was decided when they had lunch at Ichirakus. Since Kakashi, Asuma, and Kurinai would be receiving new teams, they needed to have a few private sessions before they could introduce Naruto into the mix, and having the bringer of hope around to observe their genin test would make the green genin so nervous they wouldn't have a fair chance to prove themselves. So, Guy had volunteered to take the first shift. Since he had been with his team for an entire year already, the transition would be smoother. After Guy, he'd move on to Asuma, and then to Kakashi, and Kurinai would be the last. He'd only spend two weeks with each jonin, but that was more than enough for Naruto. He could have observed them for only a day and be able to replace them, and no one would even know, but he wasn't going to argue with spending more time with them. They were starting to become his friends, and Naruto wanted everyone in Konoha to see him like that, friendly. He was a monster, but meant no harm to his birthplace whatsoever. Naruto really wanted to watch the genin meet their new instructors, but he had somewhere else to be. Training Ground 9 was Team Guy's regular meeting place. It had many trees, which helped every member of the team out in one way or another. When Naruto had arrived he was aware that he was the last one to show up. He knew for a fact he was on time, so he chalked it up to the rest of them being early. He would soon find out that his guess was true. I caught Naruto's arrival in the corner of his eye and ordered everyone to stop whatever they were doing. The three genin assembled around their sensei just in time to see Naruto heading right for them. Who's that, sensei? A girl with her hair up and two buns asked. The spy. A boy with long black hair asked in an accusing voice. Naruto gave Guy a face that said help me out here and was relieved when he was saved. No, Niji-kun Guy began, he is a friend of mine. He brought his thumb up to point at the blonde who had arrived. This, my youthful students, is Yuzumaki Naruto. He said in a grandiose voice. The three genin looked at him like he was wearing a green, skin-tight spandex suit. Clearly confused at the over-the-top introduction. I shook his head. Ah, you wouldn't know him by his real name yet, would you? He asked rhetorically. I apologize. He started again. This shinobi is the bringer of hope. Kanoha's Kamikage. Guy shouted as he fist pumped into the heavens. For what felt like an eternity, Lee, Tenten, and Niji just stood there, frozen in shock and awe, before Tenten shook from her surprised state of mind and entered one of non-belief. Sure, Guy sensei. The aspiring weapon specialist said in a sarcastic tone. And I'm Tsunade Haim of the Sanin. Naruto smiled and reached out his hand to shake the Kinoichis. Your sensei is not lying, Kinoichi-san. He began. I was given the moniker bringer of hope by Mizu no Kuni. He stated. And Kamikage just kind of snuck up on me. Lord Hokage refers to me as his shadow, and one of his monikers is the god of shinobi, so the other Anbu put two and two together, and, well, you know the rest. He said with a genuine smile. He knew the girl still didn't believe him, but he was going to try and make a good impression nonetheless. I sensei, is he really the Kamikage? The guy lookalike asked in excitement. Naruto now knew why his captain threatened the jonin if green spandex came anywhere near him. Apparently, the man liked to have minimis. Yes, Lee Kun. Guy replied with just as much excitement. He is. The obvious Hayuga stepped closer to the blonde. Yuzumaki-san, was it? He asked, getting a nod from Naruto. It is an honor to meet you. He reached out and grabbed the hand offered to Tenten. I am Hayuga Niji. He finished as he shook the legend's hand firmly. Nice to meet you too, Niji-san. He replied. And you can call me Naruto, if you want. He added, wanting to establish a less formal bond between a possible future teammate. The green beast of Kanoha was the next to speak. Yosh. 
I'm Rock Lee, and I'm going to be the best Jujutsu specialist the world has ever seen. He yelled with confidence. Naruto could feel the boy's determination and smiled. He was going to complete his goal or die trying. The will of fire burns strong within you, Lee san He replied. I'm honored that I can witness your rise to the top. Naruto was a little thrown off when the green-clad boy took out a little pad and pencil from seemingly nowhere and began to write enthusiastically, but once he felt that it was normal behavior from the others, he shrugged it off. Wait. The Kanoichi said hesitantly. You're actually the bringer of hope. She asked. Naruto nodded and offered her his hand again. Yeah, but the name's Naruto. It's nice to meet you. He kept his happy smile the entire time he spoke, causing the girl to blush a little. Whether it was because she thought he was cute or because of his legendary hero status, no one but Naruto and her would ever know. Her mind was easy to read. It was both. She shyly shook his hand and nodded. Oh okay, Naruto-san. Her voice was lower and more subdued. I'm Tenten. She finished, letting go of his hand. Naruto-san here will be attached to Team Guy for a couple of weeks. Guy announced, getting his three students to widen their eyes in shock. He will be observing our regular training routines and how I lead so that he can start leading his own genin soon. After he finished, he struck a nice guy pose, which confused Naruto greatly. This man was different, that's for sure, but Naruto liked different, it kept things interesting. Why does he have to watch you to know how to lead a team, sensei? Tenten asked. Wasn't the Kamikage an Anbu captain? Naruto decided to answer this one. I've only lead trained and experienced Anbu operatives, Tenten san He explained. I haven't the slightest clue how to properly lead and guide lower rank shinobi. If I was given a genin team, I wouldn't know how to teach them. If I had a chunin cell to lead, I would expect too much from them. Even if I had to lead a jonin cell, it would be difficult for me. Anbu are specialized for high-risk missions and because of that, know the proper protocol for anything that may or may not happen if I'm busy with something. Most jonin are specialized in one or two categories and don't know everything I and the rest of the Anbu do. That's why Lord Hokage has asked some of the jonin to teach me how I'm supposed to deal with it all. After the detailed explanation, he received nods from all of the genin. He knew that they now fully understood. Well, what are we waiting for? Guy boomed. We're in the springtime of our youth. No time like the present. Naruto smiled at his enthusiasm and even laughed when it was mirrored by Lee. He was going to have fun with these people. Week 2 Mido Guy. During the first week of observing Guy and his team, Naruto became aware of many things. The first thing he realized was that teaching Genin took a whole lot of time. Unlike him, the low-ranking shinobi's learning curve was irritatingly slow. Even the simplest of things took the Genin of Team Guy an entire day or two to learn. It was eye-opening, he really was an incredibly fast learner. The second thing he learned was that Rock Lee was probably one of the most inspirational shinobi he knew. The Genin was always training in Tejutsu, but Naruto had just thought that it was a phase. When he actually felt the boy's chakra system, he had been shocked at how underdeveloped it was. He was told by Guy that Lee aspired to be a Tejutsu master because it was the only shinobi Artie could use. Naruto had sparred with the Green Beast a few times already, and to be told that it was all brute strength and playing Tejutsu was awe-inspiring. Lee was one of the hardest working shinobi Naruto had met, and he had only just started his shinobi career a year ago. The boy had the potential to become legendary, and Naruto was going to make sure he was there to see it. Denton was actually a lot better with shuriken jutsu than Naruto thought she'd be. The young Kanoichi used a clever tactic that involved basic fuinjutsu to launch the weapons at her targets. It didn't look like it would be very effective at first glance, but the stubborn genin made it work. Her accuracy was impressive as well, which should have been extremely difficult. Apparently, whenever she couldn't hit her target she'd just bombard it with everything she had. It was overkill, but effective overkill. He hadn't spent much time with Niji, the Hayuga prodigy was always either training by himself or with his cousin. Naruto didn't know which cousin he meant, what with the Hayuga clan having so many relatives. For all Naruto knew he could have 10, maybe even 20 cousins. He didn't give it too much thought though. His assignment was to observe the proper way to lead lower rank shinobi, and he had done that. During the second week, Naruto had even joined Rock Lee in his morning workouts, which anyone other than Naruto would call extreme. The things he did with the aspiring Tejutsu specialist were, for lack of a better word, crazy. Even with the blonde Zanbu trained body, his muscles ached a little after every session. He had even taken to wearing the same weights Lee had around his legs. They were incredibly useful, and Naruto had gotten used to them after the first day. When he took them off, he'd be even faster than he already was which pleased the Uzumaki to no end. He had the yellow flash as a father, he needed every bit of help he could get when it came to speed. The entire second week was beneficial to him in many ways. He had gained the wisdom of a teacher who thought that hard work and discipline made greatness, and if his team was anything to go by, Naruto had to agree. 
guy's students were top-rate genin, borderline chunin, and it had a lot to do with their sensei. Naruto honestly learned more than how to lead genin during his time attached to team guy, though. He had increased his strength, stamina, and speed in just two weeks with Guy and his apprentice. Even after he rotated to Asuma, he most likely would keep showing up to their morning training sessions whenever he could. He had made bonds outside of the Anbu, and he held them just as close to his heart as the others. Hinoha was slowly accepting him, and he loved her even more for it. Chapter 10 Promises My Nindo, my ninja way, is to never go back on my word. When I make a promise, I keep it, no matter how difficult the task. I feel like everyone, even monsters, need to live by a code. A code made by oneself, a way of life to follow above all else like a Nindo. We shinobi have to sacrifice what we believe for the sake of our people, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't believe in something in the first place. After all, it's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. And even monsters can love. I would know, because I have loved. The training with Mido Guy had passed by quickly, and Naruto had learned so much from the man. He was almost positive that he worked his genin harder than anyone else, but it had made the three shinobi better. The blonde was taught that patience was a key factor when teaching genin. They did not learn as fast as he did, so they warranted more attention, more guidance. Discipline, patience, and a whole lot of hours were required in training the lower rank ninja, and Naruto was sure that he'd learn something new and different from his next senpai. Sirotobi Asuma was the Lord Third Hokage's son, and, as expected, was a skilled shinobi. He had made Jonin fairly early in his career, and was even inducted into the Twelve Guardians, where he protected the Fire Daimyo with the other top-notch shinobi in Hai no Kuni. Naruto knew that his Jiji and Asuma didn't really get along all that well, and that having someone the man considers a grandson attached to him and his team would annoy him a little. The Yuzumaki was just glad that he was actually going to try his best to help him in his quest to becoming a better teacher. Naruto was touched that everyone from Team Guy were upset from him having to leave so soon, even Niji. He had offered a lot of pointers to the entire team, even helping Guy with whatever he could. Lee had benefited the most from the whole thing. He finally had someone who was capable of handling his never-stop personality. With Niji, he would hold back, not wanting to reveal all of his secrets to his rival. With Naruto, he had the perfect training partner. There was no holding back, and Lee was able to test his more lethal moves. Anton had used him as a target dummy for the two weeks they knew each other. She had claimed that he was fast enough that he wouldn't or shouldn't get hurt and that it would help her reaction time. The blonde had seriously questioned her logic but played his role nonetheless. If it helped his fellow Kanohan in better protect the village, he'd let her stick him a few times, if that's what she needed. The last two days, Niji had really taken to Naruto and even though it took him so long to warm up to him, he was glad the boy opened up. Sparring with a Hayuga genius was always fun and that's exactly what Niji was, a genius. The young Hayuga had mastered many of the main house's techniques of his clan, even though he was a branch member, Naruto having been told that bit of personal information by Guy. When he saw the genin launch the crippling Haki Rakujian show, 8 trigram 64 palms, at him during one of their private spars, he was actually surprised. The maneuver was an extremely advanced one, and the Hayuga prodigy did it flawlessly. When Naruto had flared his chakra to the point of visibly being encased in it and reopening his tenketsu, Niji was shocked into silence. He had just stood there, taken the deadly blows, and looked like nothing had happened afterwards. It kind of scared the genin, but he quickly reassured himself that the Kamikage was as loyal as Shinobi get, and after getting to know him, realized he was kind when he wanted to be. Naruto had made it perfectly clear that he was no poster child for kindness or the like, and that he was Konoha's monster, her demon slayer, her sword and shield. He didn't want people to get the wrong idea about him just because he was being friendly with them. The day before his rotation, Guy had approached Naruto, asking if they could speak in private. Naruto was a little hesitant at first, but agreed shortly after, already trusting the man after spending two weeks with him. What is it you'd like to talk about, Guy-san? The blonde asked politely. He could feel the man's mind, but it was rude to end a conversation that was serious in nature, just because you already knew what was going to be said. Naruto-san, Guy began, in the two weeks you've been assigned to me, I've probably learned more from you than you have from me. The tone and the way the Tejutsu specialist spoke to him was something the blonde had never witnessed before. Gone was the goofy, eccentric handsome devil, and in his place stood a serious shinobi of Konoha. I know that the assignment was to better your teaching skills, but if I didn't know better, I'd think the Lord Hokage sent you here for different reasons. Let it be known the Mido guy was not the complete idiot everyone thought him to be. Naruto gave a small chuckle. Then it's a good thing you know better. He replied, leaning against the tree he was closest to. Guy had brought him into the forests of training ground 9, so said trees were in great numbers. But let's say you didn't know better, what would you think the Lord Hokage's true intentions were, attaching me to the genin teams I mean. He really wanted to see how perceptive his fellow Jonin was. 
I'd say he's trying to get you access to a certain someone without letting other certain someones know about it. Guy smirked. And the rest of the Genin squads are just a cover so that the third party doesn't see what's truly going on. That's when Naruto knew that Mido guy was brilliant. Not only was he far more perceptive than most trained Anbu, but he hid it behind a wall of, well, green spandex. The real mystery though is why it's such a big secret. If Naruto didn't know the man so thoroughly, he would have taken him into the Hokage where he would face whatever their leader commanded. He did know the man, however, and knew where his loyalties were. I was very close with Kakashi, the two were best friends after all, and that meant that the spandex-clad man knew more than most. He knew that Itachi was a member of Team Ro alongside Naruto and most likely knew that they were at the very least close. It was common sense that the two youngest members would become friends quickly, being so outnumbered by older, more experienced adults. So, Guy knew that losing him would have been hard for the boy, no matter who he was. He was still human, despite popular belief, and the loss of someone close to you hurts. When he began to think about the odd assignment, he realized that it was strange. Given his close history with Kakashi, all the Lord Third had to do was assign him to that team, and that team only. He'd learn everything he would need with just him. That meant that there was a reason he couldn't just be given to Kakashi, or at least it was what Guy had concluded. Naruto just smiled. The man was a jonin after all. Hiruzen knew that it would have caused trouble if he gave Naruto to Kakashi's team, knowing that Danzo would become suspicious. Naruto knew the truth, and Danzo knew he did. He also knew that Naruto and Itachi were close, meaning that he was less than pleased with the outcome of the Ichiha massacre. If he was suddenly spending all of his time with Itachi's little brother, it would have at least caused Danzo to be cautious. The old warhawk didn't survive this long because he was extremely powerful he was strong, just not the stuff of legends. He was the most secretive paranoid, underhanded man the Hokage knew. If he caught even a scent of Naruto's plans for him that involved Sasuke, he'd strike at Naruto before the blonde had a chance to. Something like that would force Naruto's hand and he would have to kill the root leader. The Uzumaki would not allow him to act on his own with radical action anymore, he could only take so much. Well, that is possible. Naruto said, surprising Guy. It's a shame you'll never know. Guy caught the Yule instead of Wii, insinuating that he already knew the real reasoning. Naruto felt the man's mood darken a little at that, so he decided to make it perfectly clear to the Jonin. Guy-san, whatever the case may be, I have truly enjoyed studying under you. His smile was genuine. Not only have you taught me new things, but I've made bonds with people near my own age. That's more than I've accomplished in years done in just two weeks. He took in a deep breath. As long as I take breath in this world, your students will be safe, this I promise you. I will protect them with my life, like I will protect you, because no matter what else happens, I love my village and her people. His smile turned a little dark. I'm a monster, Gai-san. You'll soon see what I'm capable of. And when you do, you'll know that I can keep my promise to you. He looked right into Guy's eyes, blue meeting brown and said, and I never go back on my word, that's my nindo, my ninja way. I had originally asked to speak with Naruto to see if his thoughts about the real reason he was attached to so many genin teams were true, and then to warn him to never use his students for his own purposes again, no matter how small or innocent it was. But after speaking with him, after hearing what he had to say, for some reason, Guy had lost all hostility towards him. So this is the real bringer of hope, huh? Guy thought as he looked at the team in front of him. Not ten seconds later he went straight back to his exuberant self and fist pumped into the air. Yosh. Our flames of youth still burn brightly together then, Naruto-kun. Naruto didn't miss the change from the more formal scent to the personal kun. It was Guy's way of saying that he believed him and they were no longer just comrades, but friends as well. Now, before you leave us, we should find Lee Kun and run fifty laps around the entire village, on our hands. The blonde smiled. He had found another person he could count on. He had made another friend. The Lady Fifth Mizukage sighed. She was currently facing a foe that every cage had to face, no matter which village they were from. Paperwork. The thrice damned blight against all things holy was really starting to get on the beautiful auburn haired woman's nerves. She never knew that being Mizukage meant that she had to sit in a stuffy office for hours upon hours every day, going through annoyingly large amounts of paper that only seemed to increase with each passing moment. May had a lot on her mind lately. The source of her mind's restlessness. One Yuzumaki Naruto, the boy who she had, unknowingly, come to care for far more than she should have. When he was in Mizu no Kuni, he was only 10 and had managed to do multiple things that were considered close to impossible. He had practically won the civil war by himself shortly after joining her and the other insurgents. He had raised an impregnable prison to the ground with ease, freeing all those held captive. He had let himself be taken to the heart of enemy territory and single-handedly brought down a cage-level Jinchuriki without even damaging the hidden village they had started their death match in. He had freed the entire country and only asked that they became allied with his home. 
and the most impossible thing he had done while joining the resistance, he had stolen the heart of Turumi Mei. It started out as just curiosity. He had shown incredible strength when he tore into Black Harbor, and if there was something she respected most in people, it was their strength. It was what attracted her, and the blonde Anbu operative had power in bulk. She wasn't an arrogant person, but even she knew that she was extremely beautiful, so when the boy had declined her offer of a little touchy-feely time, she was a little surprised, and if she were honest, he only interested her more. After he had explained to her his reasons, she had understood and moved on to finding other ways to get close to him. When he accepted her offer to lock lips, she was strangely excited. He was incredibly young a legal adult, yes, but still young, so she didn't understand her eagerness to be more than friends. After everything he had done for her and her people, she had developed even stronger feelings for him, and when he left, she was more disappointed than she thought she'd be. She had become the leader of her nation, and he was the right hand of the leader of his, and not to mention the huge age difference. They could never work, and yet, Mei couldn't stop thinking about him. He was the most famous person in Mizu no Kuni, the bringer of hope, their savior. Even if she wanted to forget about him, her country wouldn't let her. His name was whispered all throughout the village, the island, the country. There were plays about his heroic deeds, there were books about his courageous work in water country, and there were songs sung to the heavens about his godlike gifts. He was what every man aspired to be, and what every woman aspired to be with. Soon after he left, the stories of the Kamikage had made it to Mizu. Suffice to say that he became even more popular, and it was harder for Mei to forget about him. He was special, he was different, and he was out of her reach. Mei sighed again and dropped her pen, taking a break. She reached into her top desk drawer and pulled out a small black book. It was the bingo book Naruto was in, and it held a piece of paper that she didn't absolutely want to burn. Before he left, Naruto wrote her a letter and put it on her bedside table for her to read it when he was gone. She read it every day, like she was right now. Mei, these past weeks were fun for me. I've enjoyed spending what little time we've spent together. To be honest with you, I don't have many people I can be close with. It's almost sad, really. I can count the people I can trust with my heart on one hand. When I came to Mizu, I hadn't planned that I would meet someone like you. I was pleasantly surprised that I did. I know I'm young, and I know that it's ridiculous, but I feel more for you than any other person I've ever met. Trust me when I say that I understand love, I've felt the people around me fall in and out of it plenty of times. It's just the first time I think that I've felt it for myself, through my own eyes instead of another's. I kind of wish I was older and that you were born in Kanoha, with me. I know that we probably will never be together, but I just want you to know that, if it's okay with you, the very next time I see you, we'll continue what you started the night we first shared a bed together. Even now, writing it down, I can feel you blushing. Good. I hope every time you read this that it makes you blush so you can remember me. Please. Please don't forget me, May. I want a place in your heart forever, even if you find someone else, even if you move on. That's all I ask for, a place to call my own. You will always be in my heart and mind, Mei Chan, and if your country needs me again, say the word, and I'll have my god send his angels to rescue you. I know women like you, powerful women, don't like to be treated like a princess, but that's just too bad. You're my princess. With love, Uzumaki Naruto, your warrior angel. The kid was good, a little too good, at a few things. Firstly, he could make her blush, four years later, without even being there. Every time she read the letter, it made her blush when he secretly promised to continue their sensual encounter. If anyone else had read the letter they wouldn't understand his meaning or maybe they would, but it was worded vaguely enough that she could deny it, and she was grateful for that. Ao was always going through her things, and if he had seen a letter from someone as young as Naruto talk to her so casually about sex, he'd lecture her about the inappropriate age difference, which would lead her to believing he was calling her old, and then she would have to threaten his life again. She'd rather not have to do that, because it happened all the time already, and she didn't want it to happen when she thought about her angel. She had a lot of suitors, and when she said a lot, she meant a lot. But none of them could make her blush like Naruto could. None of them could make her feel like Naruto made her feel. Secondly, he was able to make her feel like she was the most important woman in the world. The way he spoke, the way he wrote, he was able to speak to her heart and mind like no other was capable of. He had a troubled past, that much she was certain, and the fact that he wasn't a complete psychopath was a miracle. He had asked, specifically for her, to save a place for him to call his own. She was important enough for him to open up to her, and brave enough to ask for her heart, or at least a small part of it. They had only spent no longer than two weeks together, yet they already felt so close to one another. She hadn't realized how much she actually cared for him until he was gone for a while, but when she did, she hated it. To have these feelings for someone so young that a lot of people would look down on her for wasn't something she would call fun. To have these feelings for someone from another hidden village would cause people to question her ability to do whatever it took to protect her people, and that wasn't something she wanted to experience. 
but most of all, to have these feelings for someone who was always so far away from her hurt her every time she thought about him. Thirdly, if anyone else called her their princess, she'd melt their faces off with her Jotun. How he was able to actually have her enjoy being called his anything was no small feat. She was a very strong and independent woman, so things that made her sound weak or reliant were things she despised. When he said it though, it gave her this warm tingly feeling in her stomach. It was absurd, but like everything else about Naruto, it was true. A knock on her door caused her to retreat from her mind. She quickly put the letter back into Naruto's bingo book entry page and put them both back into her drawer. She took a deep breath to calm her emotions, reverting back to her Mizukajmintsid, and said, come in. Ao, who had taken the role of her assistant, walked through the doors, a stack of papers in his hands. She internally groaned, it looked like she'd never get out of her office. Izukajama, the ex-hunter Nin began, Kanoha has sent us a formal invitation to the upcoming Chunin exams. May's heart stopped, but her mind went into overdrive. She would be in Kanoha. She would be in Kanoha for a decent amount of time. She would be in Kanoha with him. She briefly wondered if he was old enough now. May had an absolutely hungry smirk on her face. He did say the very next time. Week 1 Siratobi Asuma. Naruto's eyes were narrowed, his mind focused. He was in the most difficult battle of his life at this very moment. His opponent was better than him. He was trying, giving it his all, but he just couldn't get the upper hand. He was going to lose, he knew that now. He was giving off the feeling of victory. The fact that he had pushed his opponent this hard made it less bitter. This person had the mind of a god, and Naruto had kept up for this long. It was just too difficult, he didn't stand a chance. You lose, Naruto. Said Blonde side in defeat. Damn, that was the most intense shogi match I've ever played. Nara Shikamaru said, falling backward so that his back was on the patio. You're the greatest shogi player I've ever played against, besides my old man. Naruto laughed. Thanks. I never thought that you'd be so good. You have a serious knack for strategy. Naruto was currently at the Nara clan compound, having come home with Shikamaru after he observed Team 10 complete a mission. He had already been with them for a week now, and he had become incredibly close with the lazy genin. Shikamaru's intellect was second to none in his generation. Being able to talk to someone around his age that was able to keep up with him in a stimulating conversation was something that hadn't happened since Itachi left. If the kid wasn't so lazy, he'd say the friendship was perfect, but, like everything and everyone, nothing was perfect. He kind of guessed that it was for the better though, having someone who enjoyed just lying with you and watching the clouds float by was sometimes just what a person needed. And if Choji always brought snacks, Naruto could seriously get used to it. It was such a new and exciting experience to hang out with other kids, doing nothing but talking, and sometimes not even that. He loved hanging out with his Ni-chan, she was his best friend after all, but it was different when they were near his age, and boys. Sometimes you just couldn't talk about things with girls, and Naruto had plenty he wanted to say about the fairer sex. Unfortunately, none of the boys he'd met were into girls all that much yet, for one reason or another. Niji and Rock Lee were so obsessed with training they couldn't bother with the opposite gender. Choji just hadn't hit that point in his life, and Shikamaru thought that they were just too troublesome and couldn't be bothered with the hassle. I and Asuma were out of the question, so that put him right back into his predicament. He had no one to talk to about his feeling towards women. Yugao would overreact and he'd end up in trouble for no apparent reason, so he was just out of luck. It's just a game. Shikamaru waved off. It doesn't account for stress and other variables that come with live combat. And it gets easier the more you play it. I kind of thought so. Naruto said. That was a fun first time though. He added, accepting a glass of tea Shikamaru handed him. The young Nara shook his head. You really are a monster, Naruto. He continued. If that was your first game, I don't want to see you when you actually know all of the rules. He chuckled. When he asked Naruto if he wanted to play, the blonde had asked for a five-minute crash course on the game and then gave him one of his hardest matches he'd ever played. The blonde was born with a mind equal to his, and that was scary if all of the rumors of his godlike power were true. The mind of a god, the power of a god, and the will of a god was the greatest triple threat the young genin had ever heard of. Naruto actually smiled at being called a monster. And don't you forget it. He said playfully. When Asuma introduced him to Team 10, Shikamaru believed he was the bringer of hope right away. When asked why he was so accepting later on, he answered with, the way you walk and talk, the way you hold yourself, and the way your eyes are so aware of your surroundings was a dead giveaway. Naruto was impressed with his answer and had concluded that they were somewhat alike. Naruto could guess the intentions of an individual just by feeling them, and Shikamaru could guess an individual's intentions just by calculating it visually. He had found another monster, just a slightly different kind. Doji had believed him the moment Shikamaru did. It was apparent that his team thought highly of his powers of deduction and trusted him to know what he was talking about. 
Choji was so gentle and kind that it made Naruto question if he was fit for the shinobi life or not. After spending a few days with him though, he realized that the boy was determined to protect his friends and that deep down, a slumbering Cho was waiting to spread its wings. Ino was. Friendly. He wondered if all Yamanaka were so. Friendly. If she grew up to be anything like Risu, he'd have to have a serious talk with the clan head when he became Hokage. She was easy to be around though, and he could feel the real her. Underneath the obvious fangirl was someone who cared about her friends and family and would protect them with her life if she needed to. And that was good enough for Naruto. Seriously though, man, you don't need to wait for my dad to get back, you're welcome to come in whenever you want to. The Narajenin said again, trying to convince his new friend. When they had arrived, Naruto had asked if Shikaku was home. When Shikamaru's mother, Yoshino, said that he was out with Inoichi and Choza and wouldn't be home for at least another hour, he had asked if they could stay outside until he returned. Nara Shikaku was the Jonin commander and an extremely respected shinobi. Naruto had only spoken to the man a handful of times, but he too was one of the people who respected him. If the man wasn't home, then he wouldn't enter until he returned. The greatest mind since the Lord Second Hokage deserved at least that. Shikamaru had thought it was stupid, but Naruto wouldn't budge. That's when they decided to play shogi. It's important to me, Shikamaru. Naruto replied. Your father is a great man and he deserves to be able to decide if he wants to allow me into his home or not. Naruto knew that Shikaku didn't see him as some comrade killing demon, but it was a sign of respect that he would give the Nara clan head. If he didn't want a monster in his house, then Naruto would honor his wishes. Whatever. Shikamaru sighed. He took a drink of his tea before he continued. What else do you want to do? He asked, looking at the sky above. Naruto smiled and turned to the street. It looks like we have company. He said, watching the blonde ponytail swing back and forth as it made its way to them. Even though Ino was prone to obsessive behavior, she was still a Konohanin, and Naruto wanted to get along with as many as his people as possible. Yamanaka Ino appeared at the front gate of Shikamaru's home. Hoi, Shika. She called out behind the gate. Let me in. I'm bored and Sasuke-kun won't talk to me. The mention of Ichiha Sasuke got Naruto's attention. Shikamaru sighed but got up and let his blonde teammate in. When they walked to the patio, Ino was surprised to see Naruto sitting there and Naruto-kun. What are you doing here? She asked somewhat shyly. The young Yamanaka had already added the kun suffix to his name, the girl already that comfortable with him after only one week. Naruto smiled at her. Shikamaru invited me over. He shrugged. I had nothing better to do, so I accepted. He really didn't either. After his time with Team Guy and then the week with Team Ten, he still was no closer to finding what his sage dust was missing and it annoyed him something fierce. My Nichan is on a mission and my Aniki is busy with his team, so I might as well hang out with you guys for a little while. He had taken up calling Kakashi Aniki in front of friends, the silver-haired man being the closest thing to an older brother he would ever have. Aid had gotten closer to him during his three weeks of living in his apartment, but it would kind of be strange to call his sister's lover his brother. So he just stayed Aid. Oh, she said, okay then. What are you guys doing? I'm bored, she stated again. Naruto smirked. So, who's this, Sasuke-kun? He decided to pretend that he didn't know who the Achiha was so that he could start a fresh bond with Sasuke when they first met. Ino sighed dreamily. He's only the cutest boy in the whole world. Naruto finally understood why he had thought that she was a fangirl when they first met. He's so cool and mysterious, she continued, her eyes still shut, and one day, he's going to realize that I'm the one for him. Naruto could see Shikamaru shake his head from his cloud-watching position. Then, forehead will know her place. She suddenly shouted, her eyes opening, only to narrow and squeezed her hand into a fist. Apparently forehead was another girl that ached for Sasuke's affection. Naruto was already proud of his future student, only just a genin and already a lady killer. Well, good luck with it then, I guess. Naruto said. He was about to say something else until he noticed who was arriving. Naruto stood to his feet and walked over to the man he was waiting for. Nara Shikaku walked through the gate to his house, a lazy look on his face. When he saw the bringer of hope, Naruto wasn't surprised that all he received was a raised eyebrow. But he couldn't fool the blonde, even without his empathy, he could read the man just from his eyes. They were the eyes of a tactician, and they were calculating every possibility for the reason the Hokage's famed shadow was in his compound, hanging around his son and his friend's daughter. Naruto brought his head down slightly, the closest thing to a bow anyone but his god would receive from him. Shikaku-san, Shikamaru has invited me into your home. He began, Shikaku not showing the slightest of emotion on the outside. Is it okay for me to be here? He asked, never taking his eyes away from the Nara. Shikaku just stood there for a moment, not saying a word, and then put his hands in his pockets and walked forwards. Sure, why not? He said, acknowledging the other two present with a nod of his head, before he entered his home through the main door. 
Naruto smiled, having felt Shikaku's message clearly. It wasn't a surprise that he knew the chakra burst code he and his Jiji used. The man was a genius after all, and something as simple as decoding a secret language was child's play for him. You're always welcome among the Nara. It would seem that Shikaku respected Naruto as much as Naruto respected him. When the Yuzumaki rejoined the Yamanaka and young Nara, Ino giggled. You actually waited for Shikaku-san to get home? She asked, confused why he would do something like that. Naruto gave her a small smile. You'll get it sooner or later. He said cryptically, before following Shikamaru into his house, Ino following close behind. Week 2 Sirotobi Asuma. Naruto was walking home, a satisfied look on his face. He had just had a fantastic meal with Team 10, celebrating a wonderful two weeks together. When Naruto joined Team 10 to observe Asuma's teaching methods, he was a little hesitant at first. Asuma wasn't the biggest fan of his, so it was really anyone's guess how productive his two weeks with the man would be. Fortunately, Asuma knew how to look past his personal feelings and do the job he was assigned to do, like all shinobi should. It had been an awkward first couple of days, but after Naruto started to join the genin for the exercises and even help out with their training, Asuma had made the blonde feel more comfortable. Like with Guy, Naruto had learned more than just teaching genin. He had spent two weeks with a genius and had sharpened his mind because of it. He understood how the Nara genin looked at the world and took what he could from it. He was already an intelligent person, and spending his years with Seru had made him a pretty good strategist, but Shikamaru was definitely in a league not many people could claim to be in. The speed of his thought processing was off the charts, faster than anyone the Yuzumaki had ever met before. When he made a plan, there was never just one, but hundreds of them. He would have counter moves for counter moves and was always prepared for anything. As for teaching Genin, like he predicted, he learned a different way of doing it. With Guy, he learned that hard work and determination made greatness, and it did, but that wasn't the only way to achieve it. Asuma had taught him that sometimes, you needed to work to an individual's strengths. Not everyone learned the same way, and it was okay to give the people who needed it more attention on occasion. He also learned that being a little gentle didn't mean that a person couldn't live as a shinobi. Choji was not a violent person and didn't like to fight at all if he could help it, but after the little talk he had with the Akamichi, he knew he had what it took. Flashback, Naruto had asked to speak with Choji alone after the training session they had that day. When Naruto brought him to the top of the Hokage Monument, Choji was a little confused. Um, Naruto-san. Choji started slowly. I don't think we're allowed up here. Naruto could feel the Akamichi's nervousness. Naruto was standing on the head of the Lord Fourth, his father, facing the village he protected with his life. It's fine, Choji. Naruto began. We won't get into any trouble, I promise. Naruto had the second highest clearance in the village, if anyone even tried to tell him to get down, he'd laugh in their face. So what do you want to talk about? The genin asked, eating another chip from the bag in his hands. I wanted to tell you a story. Naruto said softly. Choji didn't understand, so Naruto elaborated. I want you to listen to this story, and then I want you to seriously think about what I've said afterwards. Choji still didn't understand, but nodded his head anyways. Sure, Naruto-san. Choji replied politely. Naruto began. This is the story of a monster. He took a deep breath. When he was still just a child, his people beat him. They scorned and shunned him for something he never did. He lived his life stuck in a nightmare, and no matter what he did, he couldn't wake up. He could feel Choji's heart. The genin really was too gentle. He lived like this for the first six years of his life, all alone, and stuck in his constant bad dream. Most would think that he would hate these people for what they did to him, but then most people would be wrong. It was quite the opposite actually, because the monster had one thing no one else had. Doji was very interested in this story. Empathy, the ability to feel the emotions of those around you, this monster had the gift of empathy. It said that, once you completely understand someone, you can't help but love them, and this monster had fallen in love with the very people who hurt him, because he could feel their pain. They wept every time they saw him, and even though it wasn't his fault, they treated him like it was. So he decided to never resist them when they wanted to project their anger on him, because he knew that he was the only person who could take it. Naruto didn't know if the boy was going to tear up or not, but it looked like he would any moment now. It all changed though when he chose to become what everyone called him. Naruto gave the village a small smile. He chose to be a monster, to take another's life. This person was a foul tainted demon who was taking what did not belong to him. A little girl with a heart as pure and gentle as yours. He was going to sentence this child to a life of servitude. He chose to save the innocent and slay the demon. His smile darkened. With the demon's death, the monster had felt awake. He was free from his nightmare and had finally understood what he was born to do. He finally turned his gaze from the view of the village to look right into Choji's eyes. The monster was born to protect heaven. He was charged by God to keep the shadows of hell from the light of heaven and that meant that he had to kill even more. 
Naruto took in another deep breath. It's hard for those who can feel compassion even for their enemies to take a life. Now, Choji understood. But for the sake of peace, we shinobi have to sacrifice what we believe to be right or wrong, so that the civilians, the lifeblood of our home, can afford to keep the pureness of their hearts. Choji was seriously considering his words, and that was enough for Naruto. Choji, Naruto said softly, there is nothing wrong with being gentle or kind, he put his hand on the Akimichi's shoulder, but you need to know that this life is one full of bloodshed and loss. Choji feared that even the Kamikage was going to tell him that he couldn't make it as a ninja, like everyone else. Naruto smiled, not the small or the dark one he'd already given him, but a bright genuine one. And having someone like you by my side during these dark filled times will be the best thing for our village. Choji's eyes widened. The bringer of hope had just, subtly, approved of his gentle nature. Why you mean it? He asked in shock. I never go back on my word, Choji. And you have my word, you will be a fine shinobi one day. The genin did tear up here. No one but his father and mother had believed in him, not even his sensei thought he'd make it to Chunin. Asuma never said it out loud, but Choji could see it in his eyes, they looked like everyone else's. Choji just nodded, keeping his head down, so that Naruto couldn't see his tears. It's okay to cry when you're happy. The Yuzumaki suddenly said. It's when you cry out of fear when you become incompetent. He pushed the genin's head up. Keep your head up high, Choji. You're a Kanoha shinobi now, be proud of it. Choji kept his head towards the sky, bound to never lower it again. Naruto smiled and nodded his head. He had started the process, now it was up to the Cho to spread its wings. Naruto started to walk towards the edge of the monument, but before he could do anything, Choji stopped to ask him one last question. Wait, Naruto. The blonde looked at him from over his shoulder. Yeah. The monster, in your story. Who was it? The wild look Naruto gave him caused the Akimichi to gulp. Yours truly. Naruto said before jumping off the giant cliff. Choji's eyes widened both at the statement and at the jump. When he finally gathered enough of his rational thoughts, he sprung to the edge, looking for the legendary shinobi. When he peered over, there wasn't a sign of the kamikage at all, like he hadn't been there in the first place. Naruto had shunshined, body flickered, to the trees behind the genin to see what his reaction would be. When all he saw was burning determination, he smirked. Kanoha had just gained a soon-to-be powerful Akimichi. And Naruto had gained another bond. And flashback, every time he remembered the look in Choji's eyes, he couldn't help but smile. It always made him feel good to help a comrade wake from their slumber. During his recap of his talk with the genin, Naruto had made it to his apartment right on time to see Yugao and Hayate walk in, giving off the emotions of strong sexual desires. The blonde chuckled, and when the door closed behind the horny couple, Naruto made his way for the roof, giving the lovers their alone time. Most brothers would find it gross that their sister was about to have intercourse, but it only made Naruto happy. Not in a creepy, perverted way, it just reminded him that they loved each other and that she could still be with her loved one. Many people had lost or, like in Naruto's case, couldn't be with the person they wanted to be with, and the fact that Yugao and Hei could still hold each other, could still express their love for each other, made him want to protect their bond even more. When they made love, Naruto could feel the strength of their bond, and it never ceased to amaze him how strong it was. They were truly soulmates, meant to be with each other for all eternity, in this life, and the next. True love. The roof wasn't comfortable, but he was used to lying on cold, hard surfaces, so it didn't bother him too much. He was on his back, his head resting in his arms that were above him, and he just watched the clouds, enjoying Shikamaru's hobby. It was late afternoon, and Naruto knew that he'd be up on the roof for a while, so when sleep tugged at his mind, he didn't resist it. A nap sounded perfect. Naruto's eyes opened before she even made the jump up to the roof where he was napping. The sky was dark, and the air was cooler than when it was before he closed his eyes. When Yugao landed next to him, he sat up, rubbing the soreness from his neck. Thank you. She said calmly. Naruto understood what she meant. For waiting for us to finish. Most people would at least be a little embarrassed in her situation, but after spending years together, she got used to her Itado knowing everything that went down around her, even when she had sex with her boyfriend, and understood that it wasn't like he was peeping on them or anything. Her brother was a very mature person, and sex became a popular subject between the two, either Yugao explaining that just because it was legal for him to have it didn't mean that he should, or her thanking him for allowing her to have it with Hayate, even when they were on the job and covering for her. It didn't happen all the time, but when it did, she was extremely grateful. M.M. Naruto hummed his response. It wasn't a big deal for either of them. Are you hungry? Hayate's making dinner. The special Jonin was an amazing cook, and because of that, made most of the meals they ate. Yeah. Naruto responded again. Yuga looked at him with worry in her eyes. Is something wrong? She asked, never liking it when he wasn't his usual self. No, nothing's wrong. Naruto whispered as he made his way to the apartment. Just a bad dream, is all. He finished as jumped off the roof.
You gao sighed. Bad dream, i.e. a dream about Turumi Mei. Whenever Naruto dreamt about the Mizukage, it was never a good thing, because it reminded him that they were always so far apart. They were from different countries, different worlds, and so far apart in age. It saddened him that fate had made it as hard for them as it could. Even so, the woman wouldn't leave his thoughts in peace. Yu Gao dropped from the roof as well and entered her shared home. She had at first disapproved of the relationship between the two, but now, after such a long time, he still felt for the woman. That had to mean something. That had to mean that he actually cared for her. She just wondered if the woman still cared for him. As Naruto found a seat at the dinner table, he couldn't help but remember his promise to his first love. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video.